Hola Jorge, ¿me escuchas, Jorge? ¿Estará el Rafa en la oficina? Probando audio sala Previch. Te escucho dos? fuerte y claro, Jorge. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias.
Marco, Marcos.
Good morning. We're going to get started. Please take your seats. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the organizers, I wish to welcome you to the third edition of the International Forum on Migration Statistics. For those who may not know me, I am John Wilmoth, Director of the Population Division of the United Nations in New York. As most of you are aware, the forum has been a joint creation of three institutions, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, the International Organization for Migration, or IOM, and the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, or UNDESA. Within UNDESA, uh, both the Population Division and the Statistics Division have been supporting the forum. The three organizers have taken turns in leading the preparation of this event. The first edition of the forum was held in Paris in January 2018 under the leadership of OECD. The organization of the second forum held in Cairo in January of 2020 was led by IOM. And now for this third edition of the forum, UNDESA has taken the lead, working closely with our partners in IOM and OECD. On behalf of the organizers, I wish to sincerely thank our host institution, the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, or UNECLAC, which has kindly welcomed our community and provided this lovely space for our meeting. To open the forum, we will hear first from our host, represented by Mr. Simone Cecchini, Chief of Celade, the Population Division of UNECLAC. Mr. Cecchini, you now have the floor. Thank you, John. Uh, Ms. Sandra Quijada, Director of the National Statistical Institute of Chile. Mr. Antonio Vitorino, Director General of the IOM. Mr. Sefanta, Director of the Employment, Labor and Social Affairs Directorate of the OECD. Ladies, gentlemen, on behalf of the Executive Secretary of the ECLAC, uh, it is an honor to welcome you all as host of the third International Forum on Migration Statistics, whose organization has been led by the United Nations Department of, for Economic and Social Affairs, DESA, through the Population and Statistics Division, in partnership with the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, OECD, and the International Organization for Migration, IOM. This international forum brings together producers and... Le forum international réunit des producteurs et statistical offices, other government agencies, international organizations, academia, civil society, and the private sector from different corners of the world. It provides a unique opportunity to discuss ways to improve the collection, analysis, and use of migration data, to fill existing migration data gaps, and ultimately to inform better policy making. Many of these issues are common across countries, regions, and institutions, but at the same time, each context is unique, so we're certain that the exchange uh, of practices and innovations on migration data will prove useful to all. International migration is growing around the world with important economic, social, cultural, and political impacts on countries of origin, transit, and destination. Migration is driven by various factors, including the search for better work opportunities, family reunification, disasters, or crises in countries of origin. Uh, increasing international migration in particular is linked to growing inequalities in economic opportunities, as well as economic, environmental, and humanitarian crises. According to the uh, United Nations estimates uh, of the international migrant population, 281 million people resided outside of their countries of origin in 2020, representing 3.6% of the global population. This is the highest figure ever recorded compared to uh, 173 million international migrants in 2000, 2.8% of the world's population. In 2020, Europe had the highest level of intra-regional migration in the world, but Latin America and the Caribbean 
has experienced the highest relative growth between 2000 and 2020, 72%. While the United States remains the main destination for migrants from Latin America and the Caribbean, several countries in South America, including Chile, have also attracted many migrants from the region. A source of concern uh, about migration in Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as in other regions of the world, is the vulnerability and the lack of effective protection in the journeys of migrants, some of whom are subject to extortion or other kinds of abuse by traffickers and criminal organizations. In our region, migratory flows of unaccompanied children and adolescents have become more common, as well as caravan of migrants traveling long distances to their final destination. Furthermore, we continue to be concerned about instances of discrimination, racism, and xenophobia, about migrants' women's vulnerability to different kinds of violence. At the global scale, the, global, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought about great disruption of migratory flows, and more recently, the war between the Russian Federation and Ukraine has caused the largest refugee emergency since World War II. To better understand and monitor these developments related to migration and mobility more generally, we should strive to improve migration data. Data allows us to show, for instance, the discrimination that migrant persons often face in the labor market or in access to social services, as well as the positive contributions that migrants make to sustainable development in economic, social, and demographic terms. The goal of IFMS 2023 is indeed to better inform policymaking and contribute to making public discourse and policymaking on migration more informed and evidence-based. Together with this, we need to promote the human rights of migrants and the development perspective of uh, migration, which we have doing for many years uh, from the ECLA, in collaboration with other United nations entities, as well as governments and civil society organizations. At the regional level, we promote the implementation of the global compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration as co-chairs of the United Nations Regional Network for Migration, together with the IOM. We also promote the uh, Montevideo Consensus on Population and Development in Latin America and the Caribbean, which has a chapter on international migration and protection of the human rights of all migrants. Uh, the program of the forum is a very rich one, as you know, including six plenaries, 24 parallel sessions, and the poster exhibition addressing six priority themes, including the monitoring of global agreements, impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, and other overlapping crises on migration data and new data approaches and methodology. ECLAC is pleased that such important topics will be covered as their key for development, the realization of human rights and greater equality. We must address critical emergencies and humanitarian situations, but we uh, also maintain a longer term vision of migration processes as being an integral part of socioeconomic development and the evolution of societies. In conclusion, let me reiterate that we feel honored to host this forum at the ECLAC with gratitude for the superb preparatory work done by DESA and their partners in the organization of this forum, IOM and OECD. I convey our best wishes for the success of the forum and confirm ECLAC's commitment to support initiatives oriented to strengthening uh, migration statistics. Please make yourself at home and then make the most of these days uh, at the ECLAC. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Simone. I think that provides an excellent introduction to the substance of the meeting. Uh, but let me now give the floor to Ms. Sandra Quijada, uh, Director of the National Statistics Institute of Chile. Ms. Quijada is here representing the government of our host country. Ms. Quijada, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm excused this because I speak in Spanish. Uh, 
Well, thank you very much. May you all be very welcome to this special event organized by the United by the IOM and by the OECD and with the host um, Celade. I would also like to greet uh, the different uh, delegations that are representing both uh, governments and uh, the national the national statistical offices and government uh, entities international organizations and also academia civil society and the private sector i feel honored uh, to be with you here today during this inauguration not only representing my country but also the national statistical offices that uh, are called upon to play a relevant role in uh, the information that is provided for decision making around this very important issue. In specific terms, uh, the National Statistical Office uh, actually plays a relevant role in the collection of information for migration. And we are a technical independent entity in this sphere. And it is one of the oldest institutions of the Chilean state. Uh, this year, we will be 180 years old, or perhaps we're one of the oldest offices in the region. And as from its uh, beginning, so we have provided official statistics via the production of various indicators that are the input uh, for public uh, policy, uh, for citizens, academic uh, studies, and of course, uh, the private sector contributing uh, to form the uh, decisions uh, since migration is a relevant uh, phenomena and an increasingly significant phenomenon uh, in our societies it, will, it is also a priority for our office uh, to be able to make headway when it comes to measuring this phenomenon i would like to thank the organizers of that during this week uh, because during this week we will have uh, the possibility of facing different aspects of migration such as the use of administrative records in order to generate new indicators the strengthening of migration data for the monitoring and review of uh, global agreements and uh, other aspects about migrants and migration and also to have scope for discussion on new approaches methodologies innovations uh, and innovations in the production data production the importance of the strengthening of uh, capacity building of um, the statistical offices in each one of our countries and its financing is an extremely relevant issue uh, given the budgetary restraints uh, that have arisen during the pandemic finally we will also have the possibility of uh, um, getting to know different experiences in the communication of data, the way in which, in which they are viewed and dissemination among public opinion, which is extremely, is increasingly relevant and which is a stakeholder that is uh, very closely linked to these issues of the increasing importance of migration in uh, the evolution of societies uh, from a demographic uh, perspective is undeniable. Uh, the UN estimated 281 million people living in a country that is different to their country of birth in 2020 a figure that uh, is greater by is 228 million greater than in the 90s and uh, increases uh, is a threefold increase uh, from the 90s by far in uh, history migration flows have been and will continue to be important uh, factors of social economic and cultural changes in countries and therefore dealing with migration from a statistical perspective through the design production and dissemination of data on uh, the evolution of uh, demographic uh, variables and the emerging uh, trends implicit in social and, and world uh, social and economic transformations uh, determined by migration will enable us to better understand uh, the changes of today's world and contribute uh, to uh, policy, um, public policy decision making based on evidence. Historical data on international migration have taught us that migration is not the same everywhere in the world but a response to economic, geographic, demographic, and other types of phenomena that create a clear migration patterns. In our country, for example, the balance of the migration flow since 2014 has shown a positive balance with a larger number of people arriving and the number of people leaving our country. The last population census that we have, dating back to 2017, reveals that 
there is not only an important increase in migration, representing 750,000 migrants, but also represents 4.4% of the population. And in addition to that, we not only maintain uh, the migration of uh, border countries such as Peru, Bolivia, and Argentina, but we also find uh, new countries uh, that have that formed part of the migration process in our countries, such as Haiti, Colombia, and uh, Venezuela. And that uh, is uh, established by the 2017 census. However, in joint work undertaken with different uh, state agencies, the most updated so official statistics in our country estimated that we already have 1.5 million people residing in our country by 31st of December 2021. And in order to reach that total, we need to establish coordination with other agencies. We need uh, national statistical systems to work. In our case, uh, we have received the collaboration of the National Migration Service, the collaboration of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of the police and of the civil registration service. And thus, every year we can provide estimates of the number of migrants living in our country that have uh, entered uh, our country uh, formally uh, and not uh, via uh, illegal uh, border crossings. And that is a challenge that our countries uh, still have to deal with. Yes. Now, this bodies are increasingly important because they allow for us to exchange information uh, techniques and uh, ideas as well as methodologies moreover they allow us to share the dis different perspectives of our countries uh, from uh, the academic sector civil society and technical sectors because it's important to understand the migratory as well as the people involved now the covid 19 pandemic and the various travel restrictions clearly evidenced how closely tied mobility and migration is. We know that a variety of different measures were implemented around the world to prevent the virus from spreading, and many of the restrictions were launched in early 2020, and they have evolved over time. Now, closing the regular border crossings result in a situation in which thousands of individuals were unable to travel. Thousands of immigrants were stuck behind and left without aid, and it was uh, not possible for them to enter legally, so they entered illegally. And this obviously brought about new challenges for all of the nations with regard to our intentions and in, uh, actions to have a regulatory situation that's stable. Now, these vulnerable groups need protection. Now, from within the UN, there has been a call to the states to improve and develop methodological uh, processes, data assessment as well, by broken down by gender, and do this for all the different stages of migration. Now, this is a challenge and will continue to be a challenge for all the NSOs. We have made a great deal of progress, but still there's a great deal more to do. In our country, we are currently engaged in the design and stage and building this uh, population registry stage. This is something many countries aspire to do. This will provide us with an integrated information system that addresses the entire population, including the migrant population. We have also slowly, gradually progressed towards adding the migration variable in our various surveys, specifically the national uh, employment survey. This allows us to characterize what our immigrants are doing in terms of the labor market. This includes variables related to um, work and uh, working on different platforms, uh, transportation platforms, hybrid platforms, and uh, social media platforms. We do know that working on platforms such as the delivery platform is clearly a job that is held by immigrants and migrants. So that's what's very important for the NSOs to be able to characterize this type of work. And it's, we would like to invite you to become familiar with our experience, our experimental experience that we have been working on since 2020. We believe we can still make 
progress with regard to current statistics. For example, we can improve information integration and coordination systems among the various state agencies. Moreover, we would like to foster the work of our immigration panel and bring this up to the level of a migratory statistics subcommission so that we can agree upon technical guidelines with regard to our actions to foster an interoperable system and a cooperative system. Moreover, we would like for this to meet the information needs related to the 2030 agenda. Now, we know there are a variety of different areas of work that uh, we are focusing on, and we would like to thank the various UN agencies for their guidelines and their support in allowing, allowing all of our countries to standardize what we do with regard to migration policies. And we are truly appreciative of the interagency interdisciplinary work. We know that this will allow us to move forward and tackle this significant challenge. Prior to concluding, I would like to wish you all a very fruitful event. Let us share experiences and knowledge. And again, I would like to thank the organizers for holding this event. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kihara. Uh, you know, one of the points emphasized in the uh, GCM, the Global Compact, it concerns the importance of the 360 degree approach to migration. And you describe how that works within your government, the all of government approach that is necessary, the integration of all these different processes. And, and so I think I really appreciate your, your intervention for drawing attention to these issues. And, and now I would like to give the floor to the Director General of IOM, Mr. Antonio Vitorino. Muchas gracias y buenos días. Thank you and good morning to all. I would like to begin by thanking ECLAC and the Chilean National Statistics Office for hosting us and receiving us here. I would also like to thank uh, our UN colleagues, UNDESA, and the others, thank you for sharing this initiative with us. If you would like to, I would like to go into English. Thank you. From employment to education. However, as it has already been said, data migration is not yet as abundant or refined as it is for other issues of global interest. But as we have just heard from the Chilean experience, Migration is becoming a much more relevant uh, issue in the agenda of all countries around the world and also in the United Nations agen uh, agency's agenda. And that's why we are particularly proud to join this third uh, forum to share uh, some insights uh, about what we are doing as IOM uh, in terms of uh, data collection and analysis, but also to discuss the power of data to enhance safe, orderly, and regular migration, as it is stated in the Global Compact. Let's be honest, when we last met, as uh, John reminded us in Cairo, in January 2020, the world was a different place. Since then, the COVID-19 pandemic, the rising inflation we are experiencing, expanding energy and food insecurity, have all impacted migrant communities, just as the climate crisis, political instability, and the conflict. I'm delighted that we are able to gather today in person, at last, here in Chile, to reflect on how these new and continuing challenges have affected data collection and data sharing. From the challenges of constructing conducting 2020 census in many countries during the COVID-19, including the lockdowns of the COVID-19, to improve data collection on health migrants, on the health of migrants. That is a very critical issue. On access to health services, on inclusion in terms of diagnosis and treatment of migrants. From addressing emerging yet persistent gaps in data and information on how people are moving in a context 
of uh, rapid environmental and climate change. And we see that climate change is having a huge impact in forced displacement through ensuring basic data on migrant stocks, but also on migrant flows that uh, we should be able to disaggregate by age, by sex, and by gender. This uh, disaggregation is crucial to frame the best public policy to address the needs of migrants. Many migrants have not been accounted for in data collection systems due to their lack of formal status. Yes, there are invisible people. Statistics cannot have a blind eye to those invisible people that are migrants in irregular situations. And invisibility has many forms. Some groups, such as persons with disabilities, for instance, are still missed in our accounting. And I speak also on behalf of IOM. We still miss them. At the same time, we likely undercount the number who tragically disappear, even lose their lives during the migratory journey. Since our last meeting in Cairo, IOM estimates that more than 15,000 people have lost their lives. Yes, but this is a, clearly an undercount. We are indeed witnessing to a growing number of migrants in vulnerable situations. The many million Venezuelan nationals that have moved in recent years, the vast majority of them residing in Latin America and Caribbean countries. Just to mention last year, 2022, the number of migrants crossing into Panama across the Darien Gap increased by 86% to almost 250,000. And over the past year, 14 million Ukrainians have been displaced by the conflict, both internally in the country and across the European continent. But indeed, we must look beyond the raw numbers and remember that each number is one person, is one human being. We must continue to place data in context, creating evidence-based narratives that can help combat xenophobia and discrimination that are also rising everywhere. We must also remember that migrants are not only resilient, but are indeed integral partners, agents of our humanitarian crisis and development responses. However, we still lack global comparable data on diaspora numbers and their contribution to the development of the countries of origin. And I have to recall you that the total amount of remittances sent back home by the migrants worldwide is more than uh, ODI and uh, the development official aid put together. IOM's diaspora mapping handbook and guidance on migrants' economic contributions showcased in the On the Road to Santiago webinar series in the run-up to this forum is intended to further that discussion about the role of diaspora in the development of the countries of origin. Since our last meeting, uh, we have registered important advances. The UN Migration Data Expert Group has revised migration definitions and data collection methods. The Expert Group on Refugee, IDP, and Stateless Statistics, AGRIS, has issued what I believe is essential guidance on data collection. Some initiatives are a, a direct consequence of our discussions in Cairo, such as the creation of the African Migration Data Network, a partnership among IOM, the African Union, OECD, the Swedish government, and the African National Statistical Offices. And I believe that we must continue to press to establish collaborative approaches and facilitate uh, these with common standards. And there are good practices. The Interagency Coordination Platform for Refugees and Migrants from Venezuela, which brings together 200 partners. And the challenge to make sense of data is, in our view, real and growing. We may quickly become overwhelmed by the speed and scale of information flow and struggle to make sense of it even while the demand for more accurate, timely, and innovative insights into human mobility 
increases too. The world, let's be humble, the world is moving more quickly in and out of crisis, while technology changes our place, our places and our communities, as we have just heard, including remote work in the statistics is quite a challenge. In this context, for me, the priority is to enhance the quality and the availability and the policy relevance of global migration and human mobility data and offer greater guidance and clarity in a world crowded with information and we must say misinformation. Core to this is uh, what we have just done in IOM, the Global Data Institute based in Berlin, bringing together our capabilities on migration, displacement, and on uh, supporting member states with capacity building. And uh, we want to expand our capacity to contribute to humanitarian responses through the displacement tracking matrix that today informs 84% of all humanitarian response plans of the United Nations. But we also need to recognize that there is a work to be done to strengthen our data analytics, including predictive analytics and data capacity development through partnership with key stakeholders in the academy, in the private sector, in the civil society. And we have invested in regional analysis through nine dedicated regional data apps. Migration is its time more and more, not a statistic, a static issue, it's a flow issue. And we need to have a regional approach about migration routes. And of course, we will continue to try to innovate as much as we can using Wi-Fi analytics, which has proved to be very interesting. Wi-Fi analytics in Colombia, for instance, based on internet access points where migrants connect for data collection to better understand migrants' needs. I can assure you, migrants nowadays, they may lack many things, but they all have a smartphone with the internet connection and geolocalization. Developing emergency event uh, tracking to complement our baseline assessment in crisis situations, such as, for instance, in Afghanistan, to boost the timeliness and comprehensiveness of the humanitarian response. And using computer-assisted telephone interviews, for instance, that's what we do in Ukraine, to collect data on the situation of the almost 6 million internally displaced people because of the war, identifying their most urgent needs and, not irrelevant, their mobility intentions to prepare and to be able to address their needs once they move. And we work closely with Microsoft Research to, pub to publish synthetic data sets based on our counter-trafficking data collaborative uh, project, which ensures the privacy of data, but allows the inter international community to know what are the trends of trafficking in human beings. And even here in the Latin America region, we support the South American Conference on Migration in developing a regional view. We work with the Mercosur member states and uh, we developed a technical structure for encryption of sensitive border data to facilitate exchange among migration uh, authorities. Dear colleagues, uh, as John has recalled us, it is notable that the first objective of the global compact for migration focuses precisely on data. As such, the UN network on migration is working at global, regional and national level to improve coordination of migration data. Meanwhile, issue-based coalitions, such as the one in Latin America and the Caribbean on human mobility, are hosting the regional UN Migration Network Task Force on Data, co-led by IOM, the UN Commissioner for Refugees, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, and the UN Children's Fund, UNICEF. And therefore, as co-organizers of this third uh, international forum, I hope that this meeting can further the momentum of the Global Migration Data Network that we have launched in Cairo three years ago. In addition to global cooperation, we hope to strengthen the work of the network 
of data focal points of national statistic offices in Latin America and the Caribbean, as we have just heard, based on a working group led by our partners, ECLAC and UN DESA, in the framework of the Statistics Conference of the Americas. To conclude, I'm grateful to all of you here for your attendance to this meeting, for your commitment, whether in person or online, to this important series of discussions. And my particular thanks goes, of course, to our great partners in the UN DESA and in OECD, who continue to strengthen this partnership with uh, their commitment and their expertise. The preparations of this forum started, I recall, more than a year ago, and all three themes, teams have worked extremely hard to ensure we have a successful meeting. I want to thank all the teams involved, and of course, I wish you all a very fr fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, let me say, I, I'm, I'm sure that on behalf of all of us, we really appreciate your leadership in this area. Your comments point to first, the considerable vulner vulnerabilities that are faced by migrants, but also to the contribution that migrants make as agents of development. And in that context, the importance of data to improve understanding, to counter misinformation, and to guide action. And so I really appreciate what you've said. And we now turn, last but not least, we turn to uh, Mr. Stefano Scarpeta, who is the Director of the Employment, Labor, and Social Affairs Directorate of OECD. Muchas gracias and buenos días a todos y todas. Uh, dear Director Chiada, uh, Director General Vitorino, dear Antonio, Director Wilmot, dear John, uh, Population Development uh, uh, Director Cecchini, distinguished participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me start by one uh, point that was certainly highlighted by all the speakers, migration is definitely an integral part of our life. When we look at the statistics at the OECD in 2021, the foreign born population living in OECD countries reached 138 million. This represents a 33% increase uh, since uh, in the past 15 years. And indeed, this trend uh, is there to stay. In 22 alone, the OECD counted 4.8 million new permanent migrants and over 5 million people sought refuge in OECD countries following the unprovoked war of aggression of Russia against Ukraine. Migration is indeed an integral part of the social and economic life of our countries, as Antonio Vitorino stressed, but we need to do more, much more, to actually build the database, the information set to guide policies. By monitoring all aspects of migration, we can design better evidence-based policies that make the most of migration from the country of origin, for the destination countries, but most and foremost for the migrants themselves. Indeed, the International Forum of Migration Statistics, thanks to all of you, plays a crucial role in this. The forum is not just an opportunity for national and international statistical offices, government agencies, international organizations, academia, civil society, and the private sector to exchange on migration measurement systems. It is also a network of actors who share a common goal of improving migration statistics. And uh, let me stress that OECD, together with our partner, IOM UNDESA, is fully committed to the, uh, this partnership and uh, um, with the objective, again, to improve uh, migration monitoring and to support the global compact on migration. Uh, much has been said already, but let me just point on three elements, which in my view are particularly important for our discussion during this uh, uh, forum. First, it is essential that we keep improving the monitoring of migration flows. Uh, probably some of you know the OECD International Migration Outlook is one of the most long lasting uh, flagship publication of the OECD. We celebrated last year the 46th annual edition and our regional monitoring system in Asia and Latin America enabled us at the OECD to monitor migration flows in about 80 uh, countries worldwide. But we cannot rest on this. We need to continue investing in our monitoring system to ensure that these systems are responsive to shocks. And unfortunately we have seen several shocks in our global economy 
but also they are future ready. I think Antonio made an important point about how the technology, the digital technology can be an enabler of making progress in this space. Since the last International Forum of Migration Statistics in January 2020, of course, uh, our global economy has been affected by two major unprecedented shocks, the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russia war of aggression against Ukraine. And these have changed the world in which we live. The pandemic brought international movement to an unprecedented halt in 2020, disrupting migration plans and leaving many migrants unable to return to their countries of origin. The pandemic also brought to light the crucial role of migrants in the, our labor markets. The statistics suggest that 16% of migrant work are frontline workers. And we all know how much we do to the frontline work and we've been able to keep us going while many of our countries were facing significant uh, lockdown. And this compared to a 13% among the native world population. But also one in six doctors in OECD countries studied abroad. Of course, the rush of aggression in Ukraine is first and foremost a tragedy for the Ukrainian people but also, as we know, has led to the largest wave of refugees in Europe since World War II. The latest statistics we have from November of 22 suggest that about 4.7 million refugees went from Ukraine and registered for temporary protection in, Euro in the European Union. And about a million had applied to move in non-EU OECD countries, including Canada, the United Kingdom, United States, and Israel. Fully monitoring in real time such large disruptions in migration flows is no doubt challenging. It is only through innovative statistical approaches and international cooperation, let me underline this international cooperation aspect, that actually we can raise to this challenge. Data on secondary movement and return migration of populations displaced by conflict are indeed scarce, as Antonio was recalling, but essential to design effective integration policies. Last year, the OECD partnered with the European Union Agency for Asylum to launch, I think, the first online survey of migrants arriving from Ukraine to collect data directly from the people fleeing the war, including information on their migration plans, but also what were the essential needs that they had. Data on migrant children are also critically limited. Children make up a large part of displaced populations due to the conflict. And in this context, better information is essential to tailor policies to the needs of this vulnerable group. The OECD will continue working on closing this gap through the International Data Alliance for Children on the Move in collaboration with UNICEF, Eurostat, IOM, and the UNHCR. Looking ahead, we also need to ensure that our monitoring systems are ready to capture new forms of mobility, such as the digital nomads or migrants commuting from country of residence to country of work. We see more of these flows. We need to accurately measure the movement driven by climate change as well, a point that was mentioned also by the previous speaker. We look forward to learning more on the experience and innovation in Latin America on this topic in the dedicated session we have during our forum. The second broad priority in my view is improving monitoring of economic and social integration of immigrants in the host countries. Some of you may know our flagship publication, Settling In, published jointly with the European Union that monitors the integration of immigrants and their children. Since the first edition, about 10 years ago, it has expanded to cover a wider range of destination countries, but also a richer set of integration indicators. Result in the next initiative that is about to be released in May of this year, shows the labor market integration outcomes have improved markedly through better policy of the past decade in most of the OECD countries, despite, of course, the negative impact on the pandemic. To expand on this work, later this year, we will also launch the first ever set of indicators of integration of immigrants in Latin America and the Caribbean, jointly with the IDB and the UNDP. A preview of the result will be presented tomorrow here at the forum. Looking forward, we need to build on the crucial step forward on broadening the scope of integration beyond the labor market. We need to monitor housing condition, health status, and access to care, education, social, and civil engagement in the host country. Only with this information we'll be able to adapt integration policies at the national, but also at the subnational level to increase migration and to address migration shocks. 
The third point I would like to mention is also making migration statistics an integral part of the migration policy narrative. I think many of us experience the fact that there is a disconnect between migration statistics and the perception of individual in many of the destination countries. Many OECD citizens typically overestimate the share of the immigrant population and the share of irregular migrants among the immigrant population. Many OECD citizens continue to believe that immigration are a burden for the welfare state. Some of you may remember that in 2017, one of the key chapters of the International Migration Outlook was devoted to an in-depth assessment of the fiscal impact of migration. The results are very clear. Altogether, across all of the OECD countries, immigrants contribute 547 billion US dollar more in taxes and contribution than governments spend on their social protection, health and education. Of course, there are differences across countries and across groups, but there is a net positive also for the public purse. We need effective communication strategies to address this disconnect, which is quite widespread across countries. But we also need to acknowledge that the statistics we produce do not always capture the full reality of migration and fail to address some of the concern, legitimate concern that the public uh, opinion definitely has. More need to be done to capture irregular, irregular migration and some form of temporary labor migration, which are blind spot in the traditional statistics. Ladies and gentlemen, the first edition of the International Forum Migration Statistics, as John recalled, was in Paris in 2018. We then traveled to Cairo in 2020, and now we are in the beautiful Santiago. The OECD is delighted to host the next session with our partners of the forum in 2025. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank warmly our partners, the IOM UNDESA, with which we have co-organized this event, and of course, ECLAC for hosting the third edition of the forum. Let me conclude by quoting Gabriela Mistral, the first Nobel Prize winner for literature from Latin America. She famously said, Tengo un día, si lo sé aprovechar, tengo un tesoro. I have a day, if I know how to make the most of it, I will have a treasure. With that in mind, let us make the most of this today of the forum and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Your remarks uh, do an excellent job of reminding us uh, of the importance uh, of, of making the case and how to make the case about the role of migrants and the contributions that they make. And some of the statistics that you quoted, I think, were really truly uh, impressive and worth keeping in mind. One sixth of doctors in OECD countries having studied abroad and $540 billion of excess uh, in terms of what migrants contribute to taxes and so forth versus what they receive in benefits. These are powerful statistics that uh, are worth carrying forward and reminding. Uh, the world about. So friends and colleagues, I hope you will agree that the IFMS represents a unique opportunity and platform to bring together experts from both user and producer communities to discuss key topics in the area of migration statistics. Migration has become a priority in the policy agenda of many countries in all regions of the world. Reliable data on migration patterns and trends and about the contributions and well-being of migrants are essential for ensuring that migration policies are guided by solid evidence and are tailored to realities on the ground. Our work on migration in, UN, in UNDESA focuses on supporting governments and generating data to enable evidence-based policymaking aligned with the objectives of the Global Compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration. Drawing on the available country data, DESA produces estimates of migrant stocks and flows for individual countries and areas, which are aggregated to provide a summary of regional and global trends. We also work with experts from around the world to establish international standards so that the data on migration and migrants produced by national statistical systems are harmonized and comparable. Also, as part of the UN Secretariat, DESA continues to support intergovernmental discussions of migration issues, including for the negotiation of resolutions adopted by the General Assembly or by the Economic and Social Council and its subsidiary bodies. The experts who are joining us this week have firsthand experience in collecting, producing, analyzing, and using data on international migration and migrants. At this forum, we have an opportunity to share our knowledge, best practices, and insights, and to strengthen the dialogue between data users and data producers. Working together, we can continue to improve the availability 
comparability, and overall quality of data on migration and migrants. Before we move into the main sessions of this forum, let us quickly do some housekeeping. While the use of masks is optional, we remind you that it may be advisable in situations where there is insufficient space for social distancing. And we ask you especially to kindly respect the policies of our host institution. Please do not bring food or beverages into the meeting rooms except for water. Over the next three days, the various sessions will be held in four different rooms. This one on the second floor called Raul Prebish will host the opening, all plenary sessions, one quarter of the parallel sessions and the closing. The three other rooms will be used only for the parallel sessions. Going down the stairs to the first floor, you will find the room Celso Furtado. Going up the stairs to the fourth floor, you will find the room Fernando Feinzelber. I don't know if I said that correctly. Uh, <laughs> thus, three of the four rooms are very close together and quite easy to find just up and down uh, in this uh, area. The fourth and final room, Enrique Iglesias, is not far away, and you will have a chance to observe its location and the path to get there later this morning when, when we take our coffee break. So please refer to the program for the locations of the parallel sessions that you wish to attend. Maps of the ECLAC premises are available just outside this room. We encourage you to have lunch here at ECLAC and to return on time for the afternoon sessions. Those two things are related. Having lunch here at ECLAC will help you to return on time for the afternoon sessions. On the first floor, you will find both a coffee shop and a canteen offering a variety of options. I would like to thank all of our panelists and other participants, uh, both those who are here with us in Santiago and those who are watching online. I look forward to many fruitful discussions over the next three days. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.
Uh, Keiko, uh, Keiko, Coco, Diego, where are my panelists? <laughs> Marcella, Diego, Coco, Marina. Huh? Yeah. Okay, are you all uh, ready? Are we ready on the panel? Yes. Dear colleagues, if you can take your seat, please. Thank you. We are ready to start uh, session one, our technical discussion that will take place over the next three days. Uh, please take your seat so we can start sharply. Thank you. Okay. A warm welcome again to the third International Forum on Migration Statistics. Uh, Greetings also to colleagues and participants following us uh, online. We are very happy to have you with us. I'm uh, Francesca Grum. I'm Assistant Director at the United Nations Statistics Division in New York, where I lead uh, the demographic and social statistics programs. And it's a great uh, pleasure to be uh, with you all uh, and with our expert panelists for session one, where we will talk about uh, uh, strategies and solutions uh, to uh, improve uh, and strengthen migration data for the follow-up and review of global agreements. Um, we will talk about data requirements, existing data gaps uh, for monitoring uh, progress uh, on global commitments, uh, of course, on international migration. Uh, in particular, uh, we will talk about uh, uh, data requirements in the context of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its SDGs, as well as the data requirements for the monitoring of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, or GCM. Um, I believe that the discussion uh, will be very interesting because uh, we will talk about challenges faced by uh, data producers at the country level, but we will also talk about uh, uh, potential solutions uh, and lessons learned uh, on how to ensure that countries have the information base, uh, the data, high quality data, timely data, granular data that are needed at the country level in order to inform uh, national priorities and uh, migration policies, but also uh, the required data to um, measure and monitor uh, these landmark international agreements uh, um, adopted by UN member states. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, our expert um, speakers this morning. Uh, I'm uh, very honored uh, to introduce them all first so that we can go into our questions and answers. We have prepared a couple of questions and uh, we hope that we'll have enough time uh, to uh, go through both of them. And then I still hope we are running a little bit late, but I hope we'll have the opportunity to get some uh, uh, feedback from the floor. So pay attention and uh, uh, get ready to ask questions to our panelists. So on my right, I have uh, Coco Warner, uh, who is the director of the Global Data Institute at IOM, the International Organization for Migration. 
Uh, she has a lot of experience, uh, including uh, 16 years uh, working at the United Nations uh, in different capacities. Um, she has uh, experience uh, in research on climate change and migration and climate risk management uh, um, at the United Nations University. Uh, she also worked uh, at the Secretariat uh, to the UN Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change. Thank you, Coco. Um, we have uh, Mohamed uh, next, uh, next to Coco. Uh, Mohamed Mugari, uh, he is the regional director of the High Commission for Planning of Morocco. Uh, he is the chair of a technical group uh, uh, for the harmonization of international migration statistics uh, at the African Union. And in Morocco, uh, he is responsible for all official national surveys on international migration. Thank you for being with us. Um, next to Mohamed, we have Diego Ituralde. Uh, Diego is the Chief Director for Demography and Population Statistics at Statistics South Africa. Uh, he is responsible for population estimates uh, published by his organization, as well as uh, uh, analysis and research uh, on uh, related uh, topics, uh, um, including mortality, fertility, and migration. Diego is also very active at the international level and the regional level, uh, working with many entities, uh, including uh, the UN Statistics Division, um, the International Organization for Migration, UNICEF, the African Union, and the African Migration Data Network. Thank you, uh, Diego. And uh, we have Marcella, Marcella Ceruti. Uh, is a member of the National Council for Scientific and Technical Research at the Center for Population Studies uh, in Argentina, and is a full professor at the National University of San Martin. She is also a member of the Scientific Panel on International Migration of the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population, or IUSSP. So um, we are all very pleased to have you with us. Let's start with our first question uh, for Coco. Coco, we are talking about in this session, we want to set the stage of why we need the migration data uh, to measure and monitor global commitments. So maybe you can say a few words about the global commitments and the data requirements. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here on this panel with such distinguished speakers and our moderator. Um, and as this is the first time that I've had a chance to say good morning, I wanted to extend a thank you to the organizers um, of IMFS, DESA, and OECD for the excellent partnership also with IOM, and of course to ECLAC or CEPAL for hosting this event and bringing us all together. It's a privilege to be in this room with you, a colleague of mine, described you as the creme de la creme of the statistics, at least the statistics community worldwide. And um, whatever we can do to get behind your efforts, um, just let us know. I hope we can continue those partnerships. So global commitments on international migration and the data needed for the review and follow-up. I'll mention three things and, and they're somewhat linked. Um, so maybe to get started, something that's top of mind for many of you is sustainable development. We're in a world, as we heard our opening panel talk about, that's full of opportunity, but also a lot of uncertainty. And just looking back since the last time all of you convened, if you look at the globally um, or, or the trends that have affected you personally, as well as in your day work, we've had a pandemic, we have conflict, food insecurity, a number of opportunities and challenges with rapidly changing technologies, and any of you could go on and on. There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unpredictability and variability in the world that we live in, and we look to you, our statisticians, to help make sense of what to actually do. So the Sustainable Development Goals draws so much on your work. Now, let me just mention three or four things that we're trying to contribute to some of your work, but also to the Sustainable Development um, Goals in the 2030 Agenda. Um, so as you know, the, SD, uh, the 2030 Agenda is the first global agreement on international 
development to include a number of migration related indicators. You'll be familiar with them. Um, I'll mention a central one, which is indicator 10.7.2 on the percentage of countries with migration policies to facilitate orderly, safe, regular, and responsible migration. This is really exciting. As all of you know, when there are indicators, it provides a guidepost and an orientation, and data then often follows on those. Um, there's just so much to say, but I'll mention that one of the things that IOM is doing with, with many of you is a partnership on migration governance indicators, which is increasingly used. A report has been put out to establish a baseline, and things like this data and baselines help countries um, measure their progress and assess where they are. Let me move on to the Global Compact on Refugees, as well as the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. If and, and we heard our Director General talk about this, the place for information and data is front and center in the Global Compact on Migration, as well as the Global Compact on Refugees. The first objective of the GCN has to do with data. Um, I'll mention a couple of um, things. You mentioned this, this question about follow-up and review, and this is the third and maybe last point that I would make about data, including statistics. Um, last summer, the International Migration Review Forum was held. Some of you may have participated. Um, in the absence of global database overview of where the international community stood on this global compact on migration, shortly before the IMRF, um, as I mentioned just a minute ago, IOM produced a baseline um, report presenting global regional and thematic trends um, that are emerging from the migration governance indicators. And in paragraph 70, of the progress declaration of this first IMRF, um, the UN member states requested the UNSG, the Secretary General, to propose a limited set of indicators <laughs> to assist member states in reviewing progress. Um, and it's really then interesting to have a baseline against which progress can be assessed. And second, a strategy for data disaggregation at the local, national, regional, and global levels. And we're hearing everywhere, who are the people that we're working with? What are their profiles? What age um, characteristics do they have? Um, how does gender show up or sex disaggregation? So I'll be listening with interest to hear about your insights on all of these things. So these are maybe three major global frameworks and how we're working together to provide some data that help countries understand where are they in the world? How do they address the needs and move towards a sustainable, resilient future? Thank you. Thank you, Coco. Thank you for um, uh, putting the accent uh, on the acknowledgement uh, by member states uh, of the importance and the power of data in their global uh, commitments uh, and also for pointing out uh, the paragraph uh, 70 uh, in the progress uh, declaration of the International Migration Review Forum, uh, where there is a clear mention uh, to the importance of having agreed a set of indicators, uh, agreed set of measures uh, that all countries should uh, um, review, I mean, use for their follow up uh, and review of uh, progress towards their commitments. Um, Mohamed, you are the second one to go. Um, so we are moving uh, from IOM, international organization, uh, to a, a representative uh, from a country, from a national statistical office. Actually, Mohamed, you represent both the data producers, but somehow also the data users uh, in your position uh, at the High Commission for Planning in Morocco. Um, can you please describe uh, in a few steps uh, the steps that Morocco takes to improve the quality uh, of, uh, the, of its data on international migration? So the production of data in uh, Morocco for international migration. Thank you. 
Merci, Francesca. Euh, bonjour à tout le monde. C'est un plaisir pour moi de partager avec vous l'expérience du, du Maroc et plus particulièrement du, du Haut Commissariat au plan, qui est le, le principal organe de, de collecte d'informations dans tous les domaines au Maroc, et de, de partager avec vous justement les, les récents progrès qui ont été réalisés en matière de collecte that has been achieved in uh, analysis and dissemination of data on international migration uh, in a country from the southern hemisphere such as uh, morocco morocco is not only a one of the four countries which was uh, which reached the quarterfinals of the world uh, cup but it's also one of the four countries in the implementation and principles uh, and uh, recommendations of the objectives of the World Agreement on International Migrations uh, for a regular and safe uh, migration adopted in Marrakesh in 2018. Morocco also uh, under the leadership of uh, His Majesty the African Agreement uh, dating 2018 uh, on uh, migration and is a leader in Africa with regards to migration. It has also adopted uh, since uh, 2013 a national migration strategy, an asylum strategy, and has also uh, created and implemented under the leadership of Africa, of Africa the, the African Observatory on mi Migration, implemented through the migration governance and uh, with the implementation of a full IT system on international migration, including uh, statistical data resulting from surveys and uh, from administrative statistics. And in this sense, uh, Morocco has continued to integrate uh, the dimension of international migration in order to reinforce its uh, IT systems. And uh, recently, it has made a tremendous progress in the collection, analysis, and uh, dissemination of data on international migration. I would like to quote here the example of a census that, that you're all aware of, and that uh, enables us uh, to learn uh, from uh, the phenomenon of international migration and phenomena, including its three components, emigration, immigration, and uh, migration that enables us to provide uh, data and information about the flows and stock of the different uh, migrant uh, categories, and also uh, to be able to establish a structure in order to undertake uh, surveys out in the field about uh, structures and obtain samples in order to conduct uh, these uh, surveys. We have also achieved the integration of an important module on immigration on within uh, the National Employment uh, Survey, which is an annual survey enabling us uh, to monitor uh, the, 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 the insertion into the labor uh, system of uh, migrants uh, in our national territory and in order to uh, hold a recent uh, survey in 2018-2020 on the different dimensions of international migration, emigration, immigration and forced uh, immigration and then uh, the category non-migrant in order to measure the proportion that will emigrate. We also recently conducted a survey in 2020 on the impact of COVID-19 on the psychological and socioeconomic situation of refugees in Morocco that was conducted in 2020, I repeat, and actually was updated this year so that we can follow up on this population and understand where they have ended up. Now, with regard to perspectives, during the first semester of 23, we will be conducting two surveys in conjunction with the International Labor Office. The first one will address item 10.7.1 related to hiring international migrants, and then a survey 
uh, an assessment on the recommendations issued by the 27 2018 labor statistics conference and also also in conjunction with the i l o now we have in morocco also begun launching a standardized comprehensive international migratory statistics effort with other agencies that produce statistics and the ILO as well. Now, the goal is for us to have a comprehensive, standardized information system in keeping with the UN recommendations and the ILO recommendations. Now, in this regard, we have conducted an assessment jointly with the various agencies involved. There are roughly 12 agencies or institutions that produce data, roughly 20 statistics related to international migration. We have also launched a working group that has already held several multilateral and bilateral meetings in order to standardize the various statistics. We also have an action plan that has been planned, uh, validated at the high level and rolled out with the various institutions for the purpose of adopting concrete actions related to securing results and logistics and indicators to follow up on the various matters. The goal, of course, in the end is to launch this information system. This is a very important activity. I believe that technical assistance perhaps is the most important aspects related to standardizing these statistics to make sure that they are in keeping with international standards and to make sure that we have a standardized nomenclature and that the various indicators, methods, reference periods, etc., are all standardized. Likewise, another goal is to enrich the database with other potential indicators and to adapt the various databases so that we may exchange and compare data. All, of course, this has been carried out under the uh, leadership of the high commissioner's planning office. And uh, this is key for the activities carried out related to international statistics. It's this overview of this uh, integrated uh, IT system, uh, migration data system that put together, brings together uh, information from different data sources. Um, Diego, uh, next, first questions uh, for you. Uh, we move from Morocco to South Africa. Uh, we remain the same continent, but quite a different uh, context. Um, so there is consensus on the need for reliable, timely, disaggregated data, um, but we also know that there are a lot of uh, uh, challenges that are faced by uh, national uh, statistical offices and national statistical systems uh, that are financial, logistical, uh, uh, practical challenges. So can you elaborate on this uh, based on the experience of South Africa? Thank you. Buenos dias a todos. Good morning, everybody. Thank you um, for organizing this session and for including me in it. Uh, all the, the key organizers. Um, I think when, when, we, when we consider the question at hand, it's, it, it's important that we use all types of available data, um, that we, we uh, take advantage of the data ecosystem uh, that we have, and not just to rely on one particular source, such as the census, a survey, and administrative records, or big data, but all of them. All parts should contribute in a synergistic manner to the production of required data and indicators with a clear understanding of the strengths, weaknesses, and limitations. In uh, South Africa, Statistics South Africa's strategic vision is that of improving lives through data ecosystems, and very explicit initiatives are being made to enhance migration measurements in all parts of the ecosystem. Secondly, we need to look at investment in data. Investment must be made in data sources that are lacking, 
Um, to this day, many countries still do not have basic up-to-date information on the number of international migrants in their countries by age and sex. Population census are critical in this respect. It's also important to invest in administrative data, um, as well as exploring opportunities around big data and AI. Um, data will unfortunately not just appear because it is demanded of us. In South Africa, further exploration into the use of administrative data is being done, as well as how to improve its uh, quality. Uh, where necessary, a case for further financial investments into the data production need to be made, and a well-coordinated capacity building program is important in this regard. Thirdly, um, data sharing and access is really important. So it's a, a key aspect of the production of, of uh, migration indicators or the sharing of data that are produced by line departments such as health, education, home affairs, justice or labor with statistical offices for the um, purpose of uh, quality assessment and, and, and aggregation to required levels as well as the publication thereof. In South Africa, Statistics South Africa and the Department of Social Development have established a national migration and urbanization forum, which I'll be speaking about on Thursday, uh, to stress the all of government and the all of society approach <clears throat> to data sharing access and analysis. And this has borne a lot of good fruit uh, in recent times. Finally, uh, there need to be clear and agreed outputs in terms of um, Indicator collation, South Africa has established an integrated indicator framework, IIF, which combines the indicators required for the SDGs for, for Vision 2063 of the African Union and our own national development plan, and most certainly will, will include the indicators from paragraph 70 of the IMRF. Um, and these are used as a guideline for the data collection projects, which would be supported as and when they occur. The production of a migration profile report in the forthcoming financial year uh, would certainly be an example of a key output in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Diego, for touching and proposing some of the solutions uh, to improve uh, um, uh, data on international migration, international migrants. Um, talking about the use of all existing data, talking about the importance of investing. So we are talking about financing for migration data. We are statisticians, uh, most of us, but we need to remember that data are not cheap. So <laughs> mm -hmm. I hope that this is just the first uh, technical session, uh, but over the next three years, I hope that the el that element um, is also picked up uh, from other sessions uh, and further expanded. Uh, you talk about data sharing, of course, that needs to happen because we need uh, to create this data ecosystem uh, building on all the bits and pieces, uh, surveys, uh, censuses, administrative records as much as possible, um, and also having uh, uh, clear outputs, uh, uh, agreed outputs at the country level. Uh, we talk about indicators, we are talking about other products that are also aligned, completely aligned with uh, um, international recommendations. Marcella? You are our representative from the academia, from the researchers community. We are very pleased to have you with us. Um, let me go to the question that we prepared for you. Uh, how does your work and the work of the academic community support the implementation and monitoring of the Global Compact on Migration and the 2030 Agenda and other regional commitments on international migration? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Muy buenos días a todos y a todas. Good morning to everyone. And I, I would start saying thank you very much for the invitation to participate in the forum and to this panel in particular. And let's start saying that the academic community has actively participated in the identif identification of data needs and requirements to support the implementation and monitoring of international agreements and commitments for a long time now. There is a wide consensus on the type of data we need, um, or at least on a minimum standard of data. We, we do know that there are countries that still have difficulties estimating stocks and flows, and not many countries today produce disaggregated information on migrants, and even fewer have adapted registries and administrative, administrative data 
to produce statistical information. We also know that often, often suggested indicators are complex and really hard to measure. So progress in a way has been slow. Um, so a fundamental question, um, an apparently naive question uh, that affect the data production process is what is the purpose of having timely and reliable data on migrants and migrations? Who really needs the data? and therefore is commit, committed to produce it and to use it for policy design, implementation, and evaluation. We are living in an era that uh, is obsessed with data, but at the same time is less respectful and of sounded empirical evidences. So there is no doubt that the academic community is certainly interested to advance knowledge on migration and for doing so, we need better data. We also know that international organizations are interested as well and are willing actually to promote it. So the question is, what are these bottlenecks that in the data production process? And I think that academia may have something to say. Um, we cannot, we should not only collaborate on substantive and technical aspects of the data production and dissemination, um, but also to understand why this process has been slow. Various aspects might operate as barriers and we should think thoroughly about them as the lack of political will uh, and commitment. I mean, what is the place of migration in government agendas? weak institutional capacities or technical expertise. And I think that lots of advances have been made in, this area, in that area. Matters of internal organization of states, such as low predisposition for cooperation and coordination among government branches. In a few words, uh, national statistical offices cannot do it all. And of course, it is a pervasive issue of financial resources. So I think that an, a, academia could help understanding these precise and concrete barriers in specific situations to overcome them. So this is, would be my first point. My second point is of course, the academic community can and must collaborate in proposing methodologies and techniques to produce harmonized and comparative information on determinants and consequences of migration for both destination and origin countries. And we have been doing those things for a long time. Um, the issue of immigrant contribution and not just in OECD countries. I mean, we have uh, massive intra-regional migrations and we don't have any kind of data to show that our contributions uh, to measure as was mentioned before, people on the move and other aspects such as discrimination and xenophobia. Uh, this is an ongoing process. But my third point would be that academia also can contribute to make useful and necessary linkages between knowledge and policy design, implementation and evaluation. That is to help evidence-based policy. This relationship however, have not been easy in time. I mean, there are differences in timings, requirements, languages, and objectives, but we really need to do these efforts together. Thank you. Thank you, Marcela. Of course, uh, I believe that we are all with you when we talk about the importance of strengthening uh, collaboration with all stakeholders, uh, and of course, academia have uh, a very strong uh, role to play. Thank you so much. Um, coming back to you, Coco, um, as the representative from uh, IOM in the panel, do you want to say a few words about uh, uh, your strategy um, on uh, what's, what, what your uh, uh, organization is doing to improve the production of reliable and disaggregated data? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And um, in my longer <laughs> preliminary comments, I mentioned at least three huge challenges that we're all facing and where data and other information can really help. 
Um, I mentioned the, the great variability and change in the world, the speed of change, the global, temporal, and geographic scale of change, what that means for institutions that are tasked to take action. And in this area, what a privilege to um, be tasked with helping and helping protect people who are in tentative and difficult situations as well as to help people on their way um, to achieve their life aspirations. And then of course, the question of, in a, it's almost philosophical in a world with so much data and so much information, as the DG of IOM said, how can that data be harnessed as a power for good to inform and to inform about the right actions? Um, so what is ION doing? Let me mention three things. The Global Data Institute is new, um, and so we're on our way, and we hope that we'll build partnerships and continue building on all of the work that's come before. Some of you are familiar with the dis displacement tracking matrix. Um, the displacement tracking matrix, or DTM, is deployed in medium to large-scale humanitarian situations, and it does four things. It does mobility um, tracking, flow monitoring, and um, two other things that my screen just went off and I'm not yet memorizing everything. So um, DTM does a lot of work, as you know, and we're working um, to move forward to also apply some of the methodologies and systems, 300,000 enumerators worldwide, if you can imagine the potential, to see what additional um, applications that these wonderful tools and networks can be brought to bear in um, situations in addition to humanitarian response. Now, JimDAC, um, and, and many of you are partners with JimDAC, I'm going to mention two flagships. Um, this is just two of many, many things. I mentioned the migration data indicators. We have a baseline. We'll be moving that work forward. And there's also um, the Missing Migrants Initiative, which is the largest database on migrants who have gone missing. Um, and this is really important work to inform the public as well as to help governments make sure that people can move in regular and safe and dignified ways. Now, the third thing that I'd mention is, is really moving forward. One of IOM's greatest privileges is to be in countries, almost every country in the world, and some of you know the country offices and regional offices. If you don't and would like to, let us make the connections. They would be enhanced by knowing you and your work in the national statistic offices and others. But it's this work together to make sure that countries of the world have the best available, updated information and data to help inform those decisions, data for action, data that gives greater meaning and understanding, greater insight, and data that will ultimately help countries and people respond appropriately that requires foresight. Um, and hopefully we'll really pave that way to that sustainable, resilient future that all of us want. Thank you. Thank you, Coco. And uh, I can tell you, we are all uh, very, um proud uh, of the, the excellent work that is done uh, by IOM, uh, both at the global, at the regional, at the country level. And we are uh, very excited uh, to continuing uh, our partnership and also with you in your new capacity. Uh, thank you also for mentioning uh, this new initiative uh, on the uh, missing migrants. I believe we'll also have a follow-up session where some of the national statistical offices uh, will present their latest uh, solutions uh, to capture uh, um, uh, migrants on the move uh, and uh, uh, being able to inform that important indicator that is part of the SDGs. Uh, Mohamed, going back to you, um, can you maybe uh, say a few words um, on the pending challenges uh, and uh, few priorities uh, uh, in Morocco in terms of improving data uh, to monitor uh, global agreements? The next steps. Thank you. Merci, Francesca. En ce qui concerne les, les défis qui restent à relever pour justement améliorer et renforcer le système d'information sur la migration internationale au Maroc, je dois dire qu'il y a beaucoup de, de défis, certainement. 
mais euh, les plus importants pour nous euh, jusqu'à présent au niveau du Haut-Commissariat au plan se résument dans ce qui suit. D'abord, nous avons une difficulté d'obtenir une estimation fiable de l'ensemble ou du volume de la communauté marocaine résidant à l'étranger et de sa cartographie. Nous, nous parlons euh, comme ça, d'une manière euh, un peu, euh, disons, non scientifique, d'un volume aux alentours de 6 millions, mais qui n'a jamais été estimé euh, sur, euh, sur, euh, disons, sur la base des fondements scientifiques. Euh, les, les statistiques consulaires dont on dispose et qui sont issues des, des, des enregistrements et des immatriculations des représentations diplomatiques fournissent un, un effectif aux alentours de 4 800 000 jusqu'à présent. Donc ça, c'est un défi qui se pose au niveau euh, du, du système. Nous avons également un, un défi qui consiste en l'absence d'une base de sondage des MRE, des Marocains résidant à l'étranger, permettant de tirer des échantillons représentatifs et de procéder à l'extrapolation des résultats des enquêtes sur ces catégories de population. Et jusqu'à présent, les enquêtes qu'on a exécutées, jusqu'à présent, on se contente uniquement des résultats sous forme de structure et non pas sous forme d'effectifs. Ça, c'est un défi à relever et voir comment le faire. Nous avons également un défi d'obtenir des, des données fiables sur les flux de sortants de Marocains vers l'étranger à travers les recensements. Nous avons expérimenté trois approches, une période de référence d'une année précédant le recensement, puis le recensement suivant, une période de cinq ans, puis dix ans pour ce qui est du dernier recensement, mais on n'a jamais eu des résultats significatifs et euh, acceptables et satisfaisants à ce niveau, parce que nous avons eu une, une enquête qui se réfère à l'année 2009-2010, qui est l'enquête démographique à passage répété, qui est euh, basée sur un certain nombre, un grand nombre de, de ménages, 105 ménages, 105 000 ménages exactement, et qui consiste en plusieurs passages successifs espacés de six mois, et on a eu euh, une, une estimation euh, vraisemblable de quelques 106 000 sortants au cours de l'année euh, et euh, 20 000 retours. Donc, à travers les, les ressourcements, on n'a jamais eu ce, ce genre d'informations. Dans l'enquête nationale sur l'emploi, nous avons également un défi majeur à relever, malgré sa très grande taille d'échantillons, 90 000 ménages. La dimension migration dans cette enquête dans laquelle se trouve un, on a intégré un module sur l'immigration pourrait être amélioré dans le sens d'harmoniser justement ces, ces modules sur les recommandations des Nations Unies à l'instar d'autres pays. Donc, il est conseillé d'améliorer ce module et d'intégrer également deux modules. Un module sur l'immigration, c'est-à-dire les départs vers l'étranger à partir des, des ménages marocains et les, la migration de retour. Nous avons les informations concernant les personnes retournées et qui s'installent euh, dans les ménages marocains, mais nous manquons d'informations pour justement cerner le devenir de ces populations et comment ils sont euh, insérés sur le marché de l'emploi. Et bien entendu, cette enquête, pour justement insérer ces modules, nous avons aussi besoin d'adapter le plan de sondage de cette enquête pour obtenir des, des informations fiables concernant ces modules sur l'immigration. Et c'est une action qui fait partie du système d'information harmonisé qu'on qu est en train de, de mener en collaboration avec le BIT. Ça fait partie des actions qui sont prévues. Euh, également, nous avons les défis d'intégrer de, de, dans le, le prochain recensement et nous avons l'opportunité du prochain recensement qui aura lieu l'année prochaine, en 2024, et euh, dans lequel nous avons deux questionnaires, un questionnaire court et un questionnaire lent qui sera euh, administré à quelques 20 de la population. Donc, nous avons cette opportunité à saisir pour intégrer des questions aussi bien sur la migration internationale, les préoccupations, nos préoccupations, sur les, le statut juridique des, des, des migrants qui n'a jamais été posé dans les recensements, 
pour justement concerner aussi les, les migrants vulnérables, les réfugiés, les migrants qui sont en situation irrégulière, etc. Et, euh, et également intégrer des questions sur les déplacements internes pour justement répondre aux besoins et aux engagements du Maroc en ce qui concerne les besoins en termes d'information sur l'impact de, des changements climatiques sur les déplacements des personnes non internes à, à, dans le cadre de, des engagements avec l'Union africaine. Euh, et nous avons ce défi justement d'harmoniser, de, de, comme j'ai dit tout à l'heure, l'ensemble des systèmes d'information euh, statistique, de statistiques administratives qu'on a commencé et qui continue et qui va demander un, un, certain, un, un certain temps. Merci, euh, Francesca. Okay. Thank you, Mohamed, and uh, definitely a call uh, for all of us. Uh, uh, do not miss the opportunity of using uh, population housing censuses uh, for this round uh, as you prepare for the next round uh, to collect uh, the critical information on uh, migrants and international migration. And thanks also for pointing out uh, data gaps uh, and current challenges in your country, and I'm sure that also um, uh, reflecting uh, um, uh, other challenges faced by other countries in the region uh, and globally when we talk about measuring diaspora, measuring immigration uh, and measuring uh, returning migrants. Um, uh, Diego, we are back to you. Uh, you touched on some of the solutions on how to improve uh, um, the availability of data on international migration. Maybe you can say a uh, um, few additional steps few that Statistics South Africa is uh, undertaking to improve uh, the evidence base. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Um, I think firstly that in order for data to be used for policy formulation, there needs to be an, an appetite from line departments to make use of such data. Uh, very often data-driven indicators do not grab the headlines in the way that anecdotal episodes, episodes do. It's often an inconvenience to predetermined um, policy stances that are driven by other interests. And, and evidence-based culture needs to be inculcated into the work of government. Um, in South Africa, for, us, for instance, we are building capacity through the Migration and Urbanization Forum that I mentioned, and raising awareness of policy issues and the impact of misinformation. Um, regionally, uh, South Africa also engages with IOM regional offices uh, and the countries represented in our region to establish best practices in migration measurement and coordinating responses to global agreements. Uh, from a funding and fiscal perspective, there is a need for political will to prevail to ensure that resources are efficiently used and that additional resources are availed to be able to ensure that disaggregated, reliable, accurate, and timely indicators that are required for the monitoring and reporting of global frameworks prevail. Um, global community also needs to agree on methods and sources to produce desired and disaggregated indicators. The UN expert group on international migration statistics, which I had the pleasure to co-chair until June of 2022, has recently identified a set of core indicators that are relevant for policy and which will be which will be presented to the UN Statistics Commission in March this year. Um, further work by this group will identify relevant data sources and collaborations with the academic sector will make clear guidelines on methodological considerations in this regard. Uh, these indicators, the core and the additional ones, will serve as a critical resource for monitoring policy related to migration in various fields at the national level, and it will also support efforts to monitor global commitments and processes. Um, furthermore, demands for migration-related data have become more and more as more development uh, and global frameworks begin to include migration, given its importance and its its important role in society. Often these demands require highly disaggregated data that um, are accurate and timely and, produce, and are produced regularly. In South Africa, migration statistics are regularly disaggregated by age, sex, and country of birth in the census, but often at, uh, in surveys, the level of disaggregation is limited by the sample size. However, we are not in a position to disseminate data by migratory status due to the methodological challenges associated with that. 
but we are committed to, to look into this and into other themes which are not currently being reported on. Finally, to ensure that empirical data is aligned to the newly adopted conceptual framework ratified by the UN Statistics Commission, uh, and that all definitions are harmonized towards this important piece of work so that um, countries can ensure that when we compare concepts, terms, and definitions, we're all speaking about the same thing. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Uh, again, uh, a lot of critical points that I'm sure will be further expanded uh, and touched upon uh, as we move uh, from this session to the next. This is just session one. We have plenty of uh, uh, discussions that are well planned uh, for you. And uh, again, I hope we can also hear from the floor soon. Um, I like uh, the point uh, on uh, uh, making sure that we are promoting uh, um, a culture that is evidence-based or for evidence-based policy making. And for that, for sure, we need to talk much more and work much more closely to our uh, user community, policymakers in particular, having uh, uh, regular dialogues with them, uh, making sure that we are also promoting some level of statistical literacy so that what we are uh, uh, producing and promoting is actually properly understood and uh, definitely used. Um, you also touch on data disaggregation and again uh, links very well with uh, some of the key remarks uh, during the openings, uh, making sure that uh, migrants are not invisible to official statistics. So again, there will be plenty of discussion on granularity of the data that we produce and making sure that data are properly disaggregated uh, to leave no one behind. Marcella, uh, that's your last question. And then I'm ready to open uh, uh, for questions from the floor. I hope you have your uh, question ready. Um, going back again to the role uh, of um, academia and your own experience, uh, we were actually sitting uh, in a similar panel three years ago in Cairo, the two of us. Um, do you see progress on migration data since then uh, based on your work? Thank you. Well, I, I want to reiterate something that was already said, that the, the global scenario became more problematic I mean, compared to three years ago, basically due to the repercussions of COVID uh, pandemic for the well, Ukrainian world. Uh, the economies in general are, are, are worse, and migrants in particular. And there, is a, there has been a growing number of forced and also survival, what is the so-called survival or mixed flows um, and migrants. Uh, there is an increasing xenophobia and discrimination toward migrants and asylum seekers in many countries. So this is a more hostile context that requires better data to address risks and challenges associated to migrations and migrants' rights. Um, the, the, the COVID pandemic also exacerbated some challenges in data collections, and in particularly the 2020 census round. And many countries have to postpone that data collection process that was a key source of uh, migration data. Um, looking at SDG, I would say that the most problematic aspect continues to be monitoring uh, across SDG due to the lack of disaggregation the disaggregated data in a considerable number of countries. So um, we cannot see how migrants are doing, if they are doing worse or better or surely worse in comparison to non-migrant population. So um, I think that we are falling well behind on that uh, matter. However, there has been specific progress on um, that are worth mentioning, like for example, um, in the, the remittance costs, methodologies and sources of data of labor recruitment, as, as a colleague had mentioned, um, the increasing number of countries that are reporting information in relations to indicator 10.7.2 of migration governance. Uh, and I would say that there has been a less visible work, but very relevant during this time, that has to do with improvements in institutional capacities of national statistical offices. And that has been a process uh, in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America. And I would like to point out uh, the, the Latin American case, because uh, here in the region, we have, we have multiple instances of dialogue and cooperation. 
And this is not new. This is a process that has been going on for at least 20 years. Um, the working group on international migration at the American Statistics <laughs> Conference have done an outstanding um, technical work to improve migration statistics in the near future. Another, uh, another good example is the regional, the regional interagency coordination platform for refugees and migrants of Venezuela. Um, and there are other regional dialogues and platforms that, like the Latin American Regional Conference on Population and Development uh, that have reached significant progress uh, on migrants' rights and therefore on the indicators that to follow these agreements. Um, I think that there have been in the region also advancements in the transformation on uh, administrative registries and the generation of population registries in many countries, uh, in, particularly in South America, um, and also uh, trying to overcome some of the technical challenges to adapt sampling frames, something that was uh, mentioned already, sampling frames uh, to of households and labor force service uh, to collect disaggregated information on migration. Thank you. Thank you, Marcella. And I think it's nice to end at least uh, the staged uh, discussion with the uh, speakers with this positive note. Uh, I mean, uh, very happy to learn uh, that the uh, statistical capacity across countries has improved, so the capacity to provide uh, um, a relevant, uh, high quality and disaggregated data is there. Of course, there is always a room for improvement, and we know that we still need to do much more to fill in uh, persistent data gaps. But good to know that from your angle, you see some improvement uh, um, there in terms of uh, statistical capacities. Um, I also am also happy to take stock that uh, in the region, and I can confirm actually it's in all regions of the world, uh, there is a, a much stronger focus on using population registers uh, for statistical purposes, including for the production of uh, um, uh, migration statistics or migration data systems. Um, so having said that, I'm also very happy because we have some time left for uh, questions, comments uh, from the floor. So this is your moment to uh, raise your hand uh, and uh, introduce yourself. Uh, uh, we are trying to have uh, a very lively discussion. I move, uh, I need to take off my glasses because I use them for reading. Uh, yes, uh, please, if you can also introduce yourself, thank you. Gracias. Bueno, buenos días a todos. Quiero en primer momento agradecer la invitación a este importante foro. Mi nombre es Carlos Hernández y actualmente soy el presidente de la Comisión de Relaciones Exteriores y Asuntos Migratorios del Parlamento Centroamericano. Por lo tanto, representamos a estos países que integran este organismo de representación política. Eh, quiero externar un saludo a los representantes de las divisiones de estadísticas y población del Departamento de Asuntos Económicos y Sociales de Naciones Unidas, a la Organización para la Cooperación y el Desarrollo Económico, OCDE, y a la Organización Internacional para las Migraciones, OIM, funcionarios y representantes de organismos internacionales, gobiernos, productores y usuarios de estadísticas de migración, de oficinas de estadísticas nacionales e internacionales, a la academia, a la sociedad civil y al sector privado, así como a todos los presentes, buenos días. Eh, solicité la palabra para hablar un poco acerca de nuestra experiencia en Centroamérica y quiero compartirles, como la mayoría de los que estamos acá, sabemos que la migración es multicausal, eh, y también conocemos la variabilidad que puede existir de un país a otro. Sin embargo, en la región centroamericana y república dominicana, de la cual eh, forma parte también del Parlacén, hemos identificado eh, muchas veces que nuestros países son... Uh, seen that our countries are, to a large extent, uh, countries of origin of migrants, uh, but also 
uh, countries uh, where migrants are in transit and sometimes countries of destination as well. We face many challenges in terms of irregular migration. We face uh, uh, different crises in uh, Central America, for example, the crisis in the Dominican Republic with the Haitian citizens uh, that are um, arriving in that uh, in the Dominican Republic in Panama. We also face a crisis as a result of the large uh, flow of uh, Venezuelan migrants uh, that arrive in Panama and that uh, travel uh, through this uh, Central American country. And this undoubtedly uh, means uh, that countries are unable to provide a timely response to this. In the central part of Central America, we find Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador that have been countries uh, that have uh, traditionally expelled uh, migrants, especially to the to North America, specifically to the United States of America. And this is a brief outlook of uh, the uh, situation of irregular migration in Central America. And of course, as a deputy of El Salvador in the Central American Parliament, I cannot but uh, share the experience that we have had in El Salvador. And uh, it has been, and the decision of President Bukele has been fundamental um, because so when he took office, he developed a statistics of the main uh, causes uh, of irregular migration. In other words, why our citizens uh, were leaving our country uh, searching uh, for uh, better opportunities and uh, normally looking at the United States. And with this information, with these statistics, we were able to identify that at first uh, uh, citizens from El Salvador migrated to the US uh, before as a result of the insecurity in El Salvador. El Salvador was uh, the most violent country in the world with uh, murder rates uh, that even uh, meant um, 80 murders per day. And El Salvador had to face up uh, to this crisis for many years. And that was one of the main uh, statistics uh, that we had. The second uh, cause uh, for uh, our citizens migrating from El Salvador was a result of uh, a lack of opportunities and uh, we, uh, and as a third cause, uh, the migration tradition. In other words, people who wanted to leave El Salvador because a mother, father, or a relative uh, lived in the US or in any other country. And based on that, uh, clear decisions were made and a plan was implemented for territorial control. Uh, gangs are used to control the territories in El Salvador, its communities, uh, neighborhoods, and departments. And thus, in 2019, uh, the territorial control plan was launched uh, involving different stages. First of all, the prevention of, mi of irregular migration, uh, creating uh, urban centers for welfare and opportunity where the state uh, could uh, r rescue young people from gangs so that these could have a better future. And thus we worked uh, in different stages until we have reached a stage that has been uh, very criticized by, by the international community, which has been a phase of repression and that has involved uh, the whole coercive uh, power of the state in order to guarantee uh, Salvadorians, uh, the insecurity that they did not have uh, for many years. And that's this main reason uh, that led to migration and which involved uh, collecting information uh, about uh, the main causes uh, for migration in El Salvador, safeguarding uh, life, uh, which is fundamental for them and for their um, uh, dear ones. Uh, well, that uh, the, the implementation of this territorial control plan and uh, the exceptions uh, regime approved by our parliament have, has meant uh, that uh, El Salvador is no longer a violent country. The most violent country in the world has become the safest uh, country in Latin America. And that is mentioned not only by our national surveys or private surveys in El Salvador, but uh, this has also been ratified uh, by the uh, Customs and uh, Border Protection Office of the US uh, that issued a bulletin explaining that as from October 
2021 and up until October 2022, El Salvador had uh, left uh, the list of 10 uh, countries uh, whose citizens were reaching the southern uh, border of, our, of uh, the U.S. And that means that the territorial control plan in El Salvador has been affected. Moreover, job creation is another area that has uh, resulted in uh, funds being channeled. And this has allowed for having uh, a focus on generating, creating more jobs in El Salvador. Now we're at 60,000 to 80,000, roughly six to 8,000 new jobs. And uh, this has had a positive impact on the situation. Um, making it possible for others to remain behind and not migrate. So I just wanted to mention these aspects. And the Central American Parliament has also been working on reaching agreements with Canadian, the Canadian business community and the government in order to uh, have members, uh, individuals from my country go to their country in a legal fashion. Now, this not would have been possible uh, without having actually identified the main causes uh, provoking uh, Salvadorans to leave our country. Now, we have identified these causes, and as a result, we have been able to uh, roll out uh, security and job-related policies resulting in a situation and we have the uh, lowest level of uh, illegal or abnormal, one could say, not regulated migration. And this, uh, we need statistics to understand how far we've gone and to know what lies ahead. And I just wanted to mention that, yes, statistics are necessary, figures are necessary, but let's never forget that behind each number, we have a face, a, a real individual who's going through a difficult uh, situation and uh, most likely a vulnerable situation. And as decision makers, it is our duty to make the best possible decisions that will allow for uh, lives to change and for uh, allow us to guarantee a migrants human rights. That's why I would like to make an appeal to all the countries here at this forum to bear in mind our, to, to have a human rights approach to our policies and much more than a security or repressive approach. We must always ensure that we are uh, safeguarding the human rights of all the migrants. So again, I would like to thank you for inviting me to be here, uh, my country, and uh, greetings from Salvador and the Central American Congress. Thank you. Uh, from the Central uh, American uh, uh, Parliament, uh, as representative also from uh, uh, the user perspective uh, from El Salvador, this is very much appreciated, your comments. Uh, you touched also on very important issues. Uh, the importance of having uh, data on the causes, uh, on the drivers behind the migration and uh, uh, sharing with us how these official statistics produced by your, your country were used to inform uh, uh, policies and programs in El Salvador, including to ensuring uh, better work opportunities uh, for your citizens. So thank you. Um, we still have a few minutes. I really would like to hear from um, Somebody else, don't be shy. I know session one is always a little scary, but please, colleagues. Uh, yes, I, I acknowledge uh, two colleagues on this first row. Uh, please, can you introduce yourself? Uh, so, Willy Otañez, uh, the Republic of Dominicana, y estoy como encargado del departamento de encuesta de la Oficina Nacional de Estadística. Agradezco por la invitación a este foro. I have a question for Marcela. The question is, so the role of academia in terms of updating the theoretical conceptual framework that should be applied to migratory statistics given the context of migration, maybe you could talk a bit about that and could you talk a bit about the challenges today with regard to updating the theoretical and conceptual framework. Uh, maybe we take a second question 
one and then we stop. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm called uh, Dennis, Dennis Lomondo. I'm a principal statistician from uh, National Bureau of Statistics, South Sudan. Uh, I would like to uh, go to the experience shared by a uh, delegate from Morocco. Uh, very interesting. Some of the points we uh, have similar challenges, like uh, the reliability of diaspora statistics, uh, uh, the estimates, and also the differences given by the consular services and also uh, the challenges of harmonizing uh, administrative data. However, uh, I'm interested in uh, uh, the point where you said you launched standardized migration system, uh, which worked very well in the country. And indeed, uh, Morocco being a uh, leader in the Migration Governance Observatory, I think this is a very interesting point. Uh, we are back home, we are looking at, uh, you know, shortening time of uh, sharing migration data from the land ministries so that the data can be digitally shared instantly. Uh, now that we have launched a uh, standardized migration system, I would like to know which tool you used uh, for, for, for this uh, system. Was it uh, Excel-based or other uh, methodologies that has been developed so that uh, the, the migration uh, data can be shared uh, to the national statistical system or to your office. Thank you so much. Thank you. One last uh, question uh, from the gentleman behind you. You have the floor. If you can introduce yourself, thank you. Sí, muchas gracias. Soy Arevalo Méndez, embajador de la República Bolivariana de Venezuela. No es una pregunta, es una algunas reflexiones que mi gobierno quiere transmitir a este importante foro. Yes, thank you. Maybe just briefly so that I can give the floor back to our speakers. Thank you. Sí, muchas gracias. Eh, la República Bolivariana de Venezuela se congratula en participar en el... The Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela is pleased to have uh, taken part in the third event. We know that a variety of different important uh, participants are involved to address practices related to statistics. We would like to send greetings to the authorities present here today and the participants as well. I would. I have requested the floor because I think it's quite opportune to speak out on behalf of my country, uh, given the importance of uh, that this form has attributed to Venezuela. We believe that gathering data is crucial because this will allow for implementing public policies that are uh, spot on that will contribute to the well-being of migrants and to strengthen policies applicable to human mobility. Now, it's important to emphasize that the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, historically speaking, has been marked by two factors. One, we have never been a migrant country. Uh, we are one of the countries, top three countries, with the lowest level of uh, migration abroad. And we are a country made up of migrants. Millions of migrants have come to Venezuela. Venezuela has opened and welcomed uh, my opened its arm to migrants and we have fostered inclusion in our society. Now today, today more than 12 million migrants constitute the 30% of our population. So this shows that uh, this shows how Venezuela has received migrants. We are a, re a country receiving migrants. Now, given this context, we think it's important to refer to a very key issue that would allow for us to understand the causes behind the, the movement of our uh, nationals abroad. As you all know, the Venezuelan population has been forced to leave under pressure of uh, as a result of the illegal violation of international law. There has been a unilateral course of actions that have affected the nation in all regards, including our economy. Our economy has been severely affected. Toward the end of 22, more than 9 
hundred coercive measures, unilateral coercive measures have been counted. We are the fifth country in the world that has been most affected by this grave violation of international law. This has impacted the Pacific development, peaceful development of the Venezuelans. And we have seen that some powers, geopolitical interests have been forced. And this has impacted uh, the rights of individuals to stay in our country. In this regard, we denounce the consequences that have resulted from these measures imposed on Venezuela. And generally speaking, affecting those have been who have been forced to leave their country. We would also like to call upon you to reflect upon the various campaigns that have been rolled out as well to supposedly help Venezuelans under movement. Now we know have there been co coercive measures and we know that it's important to have statistics to assist this situation. We would also like to emphasize that there has uh, been ferocious financial persecution as well on Venezuelans abroad. And the executive has been imposing and rolling out the return to the uh, country plan to ensure safe, effective return of Venezuelans to Venezuela. For those Venezuelans who are in a vulnerable situation abroad, we know that they have, they, they suffer from xenophobia as well as other situations. From 2018 forward, we have seen that this program has resulted in the return of more than 40,000 Venezuelans and more than 400,000 well, the, many of them in the, in, the, in the last three years, primarily. Now, we would like to mention that this is one way to secure safe and orderly migration now, above and beyond the figures behind each individual uh, situation. We have faces, we have people. So this is our reflection. Now, migration is the consequence of a variety of different causes. Let's ask ourselves about how important it is to, to assess and measure the root causes. That's what we would like to do. We would like to call your attention to that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. The children, Venezuelan boys and girls have died and they are dying in uh, specialty hospitals abroad because Venezuelans cannot pay for their medical care. This is something we need to measure as well. Not just measure the human side, but the uh, the abusive, inhumane side of these unilateral coercive measures. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we appreciate uh, your uh, feedback and comments. Uh, I really like that you stress the importance of data uh, to inform uh, uh, public policies uh, on human mobility and also that we are here statistician technicians talking about uh, data and statistics but we should really um, remember the uh, that behind each data there is a person of course uh, and the importance of adopting uh, a human right approach when collecting the data when analyzing the data when disseminating and communicating the data so thanks, uh, thank you very much for your intervention. I think it really added uh, um, an additional element uh, to the first session this morning. Uh, we are running uh, a little bit late, so maybe just one minute uh, for our key speakers uh, to reflect, to maybe some just uh, key words that you want uh, to leave us with. Uh, and uh, for the two questions, also very interesting, uh, I invite you to join uh, our colleagues uh, at the coffee break that's coming up. Thank you. Maybe Marcella, you start. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be very quick, so I want to speak in Spanish. Uh, una, una apreciación respecto de un marco teórico conceptual. No hay un marco teórico conceptual de la migración. Eh, entonces, creo que sería además misleading pensar en que hay una manera de mirar a la migración internacional. Eh, hay distintas aproximaciones, distintas teorías, y depende de qué, eh, de qué tipo de migración estemos mirando. Eh, probablemente hay un campo que se abre bastante amplio de indagación hoy en día que tiene que ver con los mixed flows, porque pone en cuestión esta distinción que hemos venido haciendo históricamente entre la migración laboral y voluntaria versus la migración eh, forzada. 
de todas maneras, sí, no la voy a hacer muy larga, pero sí hay acuerdos sobre marcos metodológicos para mirar ciertos aspectos de la migración, de cómo deben aproximarse, de cómo deben ser observados metodológicamente hablando. Eh, pero realmente si tengo un minuto sobre esto no me puedo explayar. Thank you, Marcela. Diego, just final remarks. Yeah, thank you very much, Francesca. Um, I think I think one thing that what that has struck me the most about some of the conversations we've had from the audience and from ourselves is that there are people behind each one of these numbers that we produce, and we we should never lose sight of that. Uh, the reason we collect data and we report on it and we use it for various purposes is precisely to improve the livelihoods of people on, on the move, whether we are talking about children, whether we're talking about labor migrants, uh, uh, people being trafficked or people in more vulnerable situations like refugees, asylum seekers or internally displaced people. There are, there are people behind all of this. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's important to, to, to take a, a uh, or to place a human face behind the numbers that are being collected. I think, I think also I'd like to use some of the words that the Director General used, used this morning. Um, something he said struck me. He said that statistics cannot hold a blind eye to invisible migrants in irregular status. Um, and I, I think these, these are the most vulnerable of all migrants, those who end up being invisible and who have no right or no access to education, to health services, or to anything that you and I take for granted. So besides being a, a technical initiative, I think we, we need to view the, the human aspect behind the work that we are involved in. Thank you. Merci, Francesca. Quelques éléments de réponse à notre collègue de Soudan concernant la, la standardisation, comme je l'ai présenté au début. Donc, tout ce travail d'harmonisation des différents systèmes d'information qui existent sur la migration. I would like to respond to my colleague from Sudan. All of these questions regarding international migration are addressed under the leadership of the body for producing Moroccan statistics. This is part of the High Commissioner's Office for Planning, and this is in keeping with international standards related to statistics. Therefore, the High Commissioner has regrouped, actually, all of these bodies. There are roughly 10 of these, and these include the Ministry of the Interior, with three or four statistics departments, the Ministry of Employment, Labor, the Social Security body, the uh, National Social Security Agency as well, and others. Now, the High Commissioner for Planning has grouped these again together, and they have agreed to take part in this initiative, uh, spearheaded by the High Commissioner's Office for Planning. And obviously, law, the law has uh, authorize this person to uh, carry out thank you it's been such a privilege to listen into this conversation and take part um, a couple of things come to mind I'll mention three I loved this exchange um, between um, you with your perspective from Morocco and Sudan and I think that is in some ways the quintess the quintessence of what we're trying to do here, which is through your networks of expertise, exchange, what are you doing? How is that going with that new approach that you've just rolled out? What needs to be done? And the reason is this session is about bringing and enhancing and strengthening data on migration to countries who need to know what's the right thing to do. What do we do next to be informed by your data? Um, and so I, I hope that we can all, I hope that we can be part of strengthening your networks in that exchange, and also that we can be informed um, at the Global Data Institute at IOM much more broadly um, to make sure that we're bringing that information to countries as they create consensus frameworks together 
and review them and decide, ah, this is where we were, this is where we are, and then hopefully chart um, an improved and ever better situation out, out in the future as we're working together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you also to all of you and our expert speakers. Please join me for a round of applause and we are ready for our first coffee break. Thank you.
Thank you for coming back. We will start in a minute or so. Hello, in case you would like to move closer to the to the panelists, please feel free. Don't be shy. Okay. Oh, I'm seeing myself on, on camera. That's always a good sign. This means technology is working. So welcome. Uh, welcome to the first uh, parallel session of this <clears throat> afternoon. Um, needs already water. <laughs> Perfect. My name is Tarek Abu Shabake. I am the chief statistician at UNHCR, uh, the UN Refugee Agency, also known in Spanish as ACNUR. Uh, I'm based in Geneva, and I oversee the global statistical program of, uh, of UNHCR. Um, I'm very happy to have four distinguished panelists with me today in, in a panel that is close to my heart, thematically wise, and which is entitled Promoting Inclusive Official Statistics on Migration, Forced Displacement, and Statelessness. Obviously, clear linkages on the one side between migration and forced displacement, and subsequently statelessness, which is a separate topic, but occasionally and sometimes also being affected through uh, forced displacement happening uh, worldwide. Um, this session, while I am happy to moderate, it's a joint session. Uh, organized with a number of uh, my colleagues in, in other uh, institutions. To start with, with um, the EGRIS, which you may have heard already this morning from Director General Vittorino from the IOM, who mentioned already the expert group on refugee, internally displaced persons and statelessness statistics, known as EGRIS, uh, as well as the Joint Data Center, the World Bank UNICEF Joint Data Center on Forced Displacement, which is a Copenhagen-based entity. And last but certainly not least, uh, with the Intersecretariat Working Group on Household Surveys, which how it is coordinating uh, out of UNSD in, in New York City. So those three entities together with UNICEF have jointly put this panel together. Um, and I'm happy to moderate the subsequent hour and something before we break. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the all panelists you have in common is that all of them, all four, are in the institution. They are members of the expert group on refugee IDPs and statelessness statistics. So that's a commonality, and they will speak to the different experiences how they've come across this court displacement statistics, uh, how they've tried to improve at national, regional, and global level, of course. Um, this session is 
focusing on the inclusion of uh, forcibly displaced migrant and status persons in, in statistical production and national policy development. And we have a couple, of course, presentations prepared by the distinguished panelists. Um, but of course, the first question that was raised yesterday uh, when, when I had a little conversation with um, a colleague from academia was, what does inclusion actually mean? Uh, for me, working in, in, in displacement statistics for such a long time, uh, for me, it's clear it's my bread and butter to some extent, but for others, the inclusion can be uh, can take different shapes and means. And so before we go into what our panelists are going to talk about, let's start a bit to put the, the scene right here and see a little video, two and a half minutes or so, that Bjorn and his team have gratefully have, um, have produced on what inclusion how do governments allocate health and education services, social protection, and livelihood support? Data from major national surveys like NICS, DHS, Labor Force Surveys and Poverty, and living condition surveys play a crucial role in identifying who needs what. These surveys represent almost everyone who lives in the country, but they often exclude refugees and internally displaced people. This is a blind spot in national data and a real obstacle for governments in finding solutions to forced displacement, which the Global Compact on Refugees, the UN Action Agenda on Internal Displacement, and the Agenda 2030's Leave No One Behind principle are all calling for. Why are refugees and IDPs excluded from national surveys? When forcibly displaced people live in camps, these locations are often crossed off the map when the survey sample is selected. When they live among the wider population, they are only occasionally picked up by the random sample selection process. But because they constitute only a small part of the population, they end up being a tiny fraction of the survey sample. This is not enough to produce any reliable analysis. The solution is to include refugees and IDPs fully in national surveys. Changing the tide, a growing number of countries are beginning to include refugees and IDPs in essential surveys. Together with national statistical offices and international partners, we are fixing the blind spot ensuring that refugees and IDPs are no longer invisible in national surveys. Help us identify new opportunities. Speak to your government counterparts about which national surveys are coming up and where refugees and IDPs can be included. Funds and technical expertise are available. We are the World Bank, UNHCR, Joint Data Center on Forced Displacement. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. I hope inclusion is now a bit clearer than perhaps it was, than it was earlier in, in the morning when you just simply read the, uh, the title of the session. So this session is trying to address a couple of questions. Uh, one is why is it important to include actually forcibly displaced people, migrants and stateless in official statistics? And what are expected outcomes of such inclusion? for programming and planning, which is an important aspect when you use data. Um, how are international recommendations on refugees or on internally displaced persons, etc., being utilized by national slash re uh, regional or global partners? Uh, we also want to explore a bit some examples of capacity building work and, and point to collaboration that happened quite extensively in recent years between the forced displacement and the migration statistics environment. Uh, and last but not least, what contributions can different stakeholders and the different data sources I can offer to resolve data gaps, of which there are quite prominent ones, as you have probably heard early in the morning today. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our four panelists. Um, to start with, to my right, we have Mohamed Amgari, who is the Regional Director of Planning at the High Commission for Planning uh, in, in Morocco. 
He is also president of the specialized technical group on the harmonization of international migration statistics of the African Union and focal point of the High Commission for Planning for International Migration Issues. He is also Secretary General of the International Migration Association, which is a research structure in the field of international migration in Morocco. To his right, we have Mariana Francisca Ospina Bohorquez, who is um, a coordinator of projections and demographic analysis, and currently director in charge of the technical department of censuses and demography of the National Administrative Department of Statistics, also known as DANE in Colombia. To Mariana's right, we have Leila Ben Ali, who is a chief engineer in statistics and a researcher in demography with more than 30 years of experience at national and international level, including at broader management and leadership positions. In, in 2016, she was appointed as the head of statistics division in the economic affairs department for the establishment and operationalization of the African Union Institute for Statistics, also known as StatAfrique, which is based in Tunisia. And uh, before taking on the role, she took on afterwards another role, which was acting director of the African Migration Observatory in Rabat, in Morocco, where she was responsible for its establishment until fairly recently, after having returned to her current hat in, in South Africa. And last but not least, certainly, definitely not least, to Leila's rights, we have the one and only Bjorn Gilsetter, who is the head of the World Bank Unity Joint Data Center on Force Displacement and is based in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, prior to being the head, of which he has been for roughly four years now, um, he was the World Bank's special representative to the UN in New York and also held positions as alternate executive director at the African Development Bank, as well as as chief for multilateral system analysis with UNICEF. He also had, he brings more than 20 years of experience in multilateral affairs. Uh, among other things, he has also been serving in the Ministry of Finance of Sweden as a government official, which was a long time ago, I think. So, we have a very distinguished panelist, clearly, and as I mentioned earlier, we are tackling an important issue about inclusion in official statistics of migra migrants, forcibly displaced people, as well as stateless people. And without further ado, I shall give the floor to the national slash regional and then subsequently global level, which we could start with Mohammed from Morocco, over then to, to Mariana from Colombia, and then subsequently Leila, and we round off the global perspective from, from the onside. And with this, Mr. Mohammed, over to you. Merci, Tarek. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I have the pleasure of uh, sharing with you Morocco's experience, especially uh, the High Commission Commissioner Commission for Planning in terms of reinforcing the national statistics system in uh, the category in the population category. Uh, basically, uh, talking about uh, forced uh, migrants, I am going to share with you some experiences, recent experiences that we have had. Uh, the good practices, the challenges, and uh, difficulties. This uh, presentation contains uh, specific points. Uh, first of all, I'll talk about context issues. After that, uh, some element, elements related uh, to forced uh, migration. Uh, could you please uh, show the presentation? Before we dwell on this uh, general vision of some methodological aspects in the different uh, surveys about forced migration in Morocco, uh, before we point uh, to the challenges and opportunities that have arisen when it comes to integrating international recommendations on uh, refugee statistics in uh, the Moroccan statistical system, and finally the role played by Morocco in order to strengthen uh, cooperation in uh, issues relating uh, statistics and data on uh, forced uh, migration. First of all, then, let's talk about the context. 
I would like to remind you that uh, Morocco plays an active and responsible role in uh, the governance uh, of international migration, uh, specifically in, in Africa. And it's also very sensitive uh, or very aware of the migration question and has acted on different uh, initiatives. First of all, the adoption of a national immigration strategy and asylum strategy after 2013, which involved uh, the regularization of some uh, 50 odd thousand uh, illegal immigrants uh, after many thousands of uh, requests during the 2014, 2018 period. And this has also implied uh, the creation of an interministerial committee to implement this policy in a regular fashion. In order to integrate uh, vulnerable uh, immigrants, um, and also refugees, in order to protect uh, their rights in all fields, uh, the right to employment, education, and uh, uh, social uh, security, and so that they can receive training, professional training, and so on. In this sense, uh, we have implemented a national observatory on migration in Morocco. Which uh, links us uh, to the international framework and uh, to the demands of being able to respond uh, to the international framework that you're already aware of, uh, we have um, felt uh, the need to have uh, data. This uh, requirement has been very uh, strong on the part of Morocco in order to monitor uh, this vulnerable population. There is a need to accompany the various uh, regional, national, and international initiatives and promote uh, uh, policies based on facts and to include uh, the category of forced uh, uh, migration into our national planning and to prevent uh, forced uh, displacements and to improve the identification of people that are victims uh, of uh, human uh, trafficking and uh, violence in order to protect them and provide them with all the necessary assistance. And finally, the last need is to create awareness among decision makers about the question of forced uh, migration. The program and the strategy national. And that begins uh, uh, to be present uh, in the national plans and programs. Uh, first of all, then, a national outlook on uh, methodological aspects uh, of our recent uh, surveys. First of all, what I already mentioned, uh, the impact of COVID-19 upon the socio-economic and psychological situation of refugees in Morocco. This survey was uh, conducted in 2020. After that, and uh, this year, we conducted an update uh, involving the same sample, or the same type of sample, to analyze the, uh, the situation of this population in terms of employment, health, and so on, basically with regards to all types of services, so that we can report, um, develop um, public policies to protect these migrants. And among them, a national um, survey on forced migration that was held in 2021 which is a second phase of the major national survey of the first uh, phase of this uh, survey that was conducted in 2018-2019, uh, um, conducted at a regional level and prepared within the framework of the NETSPAT program that was uh, financed uh, by the European Union. Now, with regards to some uh, methodological aspects of these uh, three surveys, Next slide, please. 
I would like to remind you that these are surveys of uh, refugees uh, conducted uh, or based uh, on a sample of uh, 500 households uh, stratified into four variables contained in the database uh, provided by NCR, country of origin, city of residence, age, gender, and uh, school level of the head of household, uh, uh, 600 households. And the method to collect this data has been uh, over the phone and also via direct uh, interviews uh, using the method, the computer and tablet-based uh, um, surveys. The 2021 survey on forced migration was conducted with a sample of 3,000 forced migrants older than 15, stratified using two methods. Uh, first of all, refugees, uh, as occurred with the two previous surveys, we stratify that in terms of four variables and migrants because we focused on four migrant categories. Migrants in a um, legal situation, uh, migrants uh, that were legalized under exceptional legalization uh, rules between 2014 and 2018, refugees, and uh, fourthly, um, asylum requesters. Now, for this uh, type of migrants in a legal or illegal situation, we use a database provided by the Ministry of the Interior. Now, with regards to uh, um, legalization requests that contain the different variables in order to stratify which what we have just mentioned, country of origin, nationality, age, gender, and uh, city of uh, residence, and the uh, level of education of the people that were surveyed. Uh, we have focused on uh, migrants uh, that come from sub-Saharan Africa, but also some uh, Arab uh, nationalities that have experienced uh, wars and uh, conflicts such as uh, Libyans, Syrians, and so on, and from Yemen also. And uh, now I would like to share with you the contents of the uh, survey of the last uh, survey on refugees uh, 2022. And, uh, it, and its analytical work is uh, concluding. We have completed the collection stage with seven modules. First of all, the characteristics of the head of household, uh, of the refugee head of household, uh, demographic uh, characteristics, uh, a module on security and documentation, then economic integration, uh, services uh, for the victims of uh, gender-based uh, violence, uh, social protection, health, uh, social inclusion, and um, Next slide, shared uh, coexistence. Now, with regards um, opportunities uh, that are uh, offered uh, via the integration of international uh, recommendations on uh, refugee statistics uh, via the group of experts and uh, R RS, of which uh, Morocco forms part, we have had the opportunity with regards to uh, migration and refugees through the impact of COVID and the socioeconomic condition of refugees be it 2020 or 2021 or 2022. We have also made uh, efforts uh, to try to integrate uh, international recommendations on, uh, statist on refugee statistics, integrating them to the national statistics uh, system. From a methodological viewpoint, uh, the definitions, terminologies and related uh, classifications on classifications related to the um, target population aligned with the IRRS and the Convention on Refugees. Uh, in addition, the recommendations also provided us with operational guidelines in order to facilitate the production of the questionnaires and uh, the analysis of the data that was collected. 
uh, primarily through a list of uh, uh, indicators uh, recommended by EGRISS in order to measure the integration of refugees. Well, we continue now with the issue of opportunities uh, that we have found within the framework of these recommendations. We had the possibility of improving the quality of data, obtaining uh, comparable uh, statistics at an international level that were reliable, coherent and uh, relevant. Also, the possibility of reinforcing the capacities of the national statistical system and also recommendations uh, that have helped uh, Morocco uh, to advance uh, towards uh, common procedures in accordance with uh, international standards. These recommendations have also helped Morocco to meet its national and international commitments regarding this population group. We have also had the opportunity to produce an official database for designing policies that are adapted to this vulnerable population. Now I would like to refer to some methodological challenges. Regarding sampling, we have used a list of refugees provided by the UNHCR, including phone numbers. And we can see that the reference persons are not always heads of households in terms of statistics. So that's a hurdle that needs to be overcome and pointed out on the next survey or list of refugees. These are individuals who may actually live in mixed households. We have also seen that at the survey level, there were there was bias with regard to some questions aimed at mixed households, uh, questions regarding household income and uh, expenditures have made it difficult to estimate the percentage of households that actually live under the poverty line. Moreover, there may be students and uh, students may become refugees. In other words, they may actually undergo a change in their status when they are students on a scholarship. They may actually turn into migrants or refugees. And given their precarious employment situation, they need to further develop their situation. And so there are a variety of issues involved and it's important to take into consideration the occasional work carried out by students and beggars as well. We know that a large number of these individuals need to beg. And with regard quantitative, with regard to quantitative aspects, some of the uh, topics do not allow us to fully address forced migration. For example, the individuals come across a variety of different difficulties. So we need open-ended questions and other types of questions in order to appropriately allow the refugees to actually speak freely with regard to their experiences and their expectations. With regard to the limits related to data collection methods, we have one limit, which is one limitation, which is using telephones, uh, telephone interviews. We know that there are limitations with regard to availability of those being interviewed. There are sensitive topics that are difficult to address over the phone. For example, uh, white uh, trafficking or uh, gender violence. Also, all of the indicators requested were calculated. However, some of the indicators face certain limitations with, for example, refugees who uh, may be using clean technologies for cooking fuel, what have you. And then uh, with regard to technology, some refugees use uh, clean technologies, clean devices for cooking, again. And then the question here 
regarding how the individuals cook actually refers to the entire household and not specifically referring to the individual members of the household. Now, with regard to the role of Morocco in terms of reinforcing cooperation related to statistics, we are a member of a group of experts on uh, migration statistics. We are also a member of the Edris group, and that's what we're talking about right now, Morocco, specifically the High Commission, is a member of the Data Alliance for Children on the Move, IDEC. Now, Morocco is also, also leads the presidency of the specialized group of the American Nations on Statistics, Migration Statistics. We are also coordinating the uh, surveys, statistical surveys on international migration under the NextStat 5 program. And internationally, our country is a leader with regard to producing official statistics in Morocco, specifically regarding migration. Moreover, we provide technical assistance to data users and producers with regard to international migration. And we improve the quality of statistics so that they meet international standards. In this regard, Morocco contributes to disseminating the principles of the various groups of experts in order to improve the quality and reliability of data. Thank you. And with this, I would like to conclude. What statistical inclusion of refugees actually means in practice from the perspective of, an, of a national statistical office. Um, I liked in particular that in the different scenarios that you outlined on the data collection side, you use different data sources to look at how refugees actually favor within the country, uh, but also didn't shy away from, from the challenges uh, with regard to sampling or the questionnaire, for example but at the same time trying to adhere to international comparability, which I think has been lacking for many decades in the area of forced displacement statistics. Voila, thank you very much. We pass on to another country example, that's Colombia, to Mariana, who will take us to a slightly different angle. Uh, and that's the angle of how to combine different data sources for the purpose of enumerating immigration statistics. So a different angle within the wider spectrum of migration and forced placement statistics. Over to you, Mariana. Thank you, Tarek. Uh, hello, good afternoon for everyone. Uh, buenos días para todos y todas. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for this invitation. Dane is very pleased to be taking part in this event from the executive board headed by Dr. Pia Ordenone, we would like to send you warm greetings and allow me to uh, refer to the Colombian case and estimating the portion of households that have had an international migratory experience. Now, generally speaking, this exercise Generally speaking, this exercise has aimed to explore the various methods to address small areas, or in other words, a small areas estimation, and this has been specifically employed to the Fay Harriet, quite the Fay Harriet model. And we have used two approaches to estimate the variation coefficients of the indicator related to the small areas estimation technique in order to extrapolate the behavior that we have observed in the survey in a more recent period. And again, based on information taken from a previous census, we have identified scenarios to that can be measured between census periods because generally speaking in Colombia, similar to other developing nations, what we do is that we see that there are some gaps with regard to the uh, relative information applicable to migration. 
Now, the national statistics offices have worked with administrative records related to international movements and migration control points. We have also worked with estimates based on censuses from other countries in order to estimate international migration. Now, these are the traditional sources that are generally used to measure international migration. We do, however, have a significant inconvenience, and that is that, generally speaking, we do not have data, associated data, to identify in a subnational level the origin of the international migration. Therefore, we have employed the small areas estimation in order to estimate what's going on during the years for which we do not have census data. Next, please. Essentially, this is the context. As I mentioned earlier, this is based on applying the Fay Harriet model. It's the first time we have used this for a municipal level indicator. This will provide us with several different estimates of the variance coefficient. And this is also associated with uh, frequentist and Bayesian approaches. We will do this to determine which will provide us with the best results for the uh, estimates that we are carrying out in Colombia. Next slide. Overall, the goal is to measure the PHMLA, which is the proportion of households with at least one member living abroad, and do this for the intercensal periods, again, at the municipal level for the 1,300 municipalities. This, these direct estimates which are part of the Fay Harriet model, will provide us with information to come up with the best empiric predictor, linear, non-biased, the EP loop, the empirical best linear unbiased predictors, the EP loop ones. Next slide, please. I'm not going to focus on the details of the methodology per se. Rather, what I would like to do is refer to the sampling and the inference techniques for finite populations. This can be used to estimate stocks and other rates for demographic estimates. And this is not just applicable to migratory aspects. We were interested in that uh, for our country because there was a lack of information for our population projections relative to international migration. But again, Professor Morales and other colleagues working on this methodological application have also addressed poverty using small areas estimates. And this is in keeping with the experience of Professor Morales. So we have, again, applied this approach in order to have direct estimates and variances in the PHMLA predictor. Now, with regard to this model, estimates will be available for calculating the EP loop. And that is, generally speaking, what makes the estimates uh, more robust. Next slide, please. Next. Next slide, please. Thank you. Here you have the math related to the vectors used to estimate the different portions of the indicator. Next slide, please. Again, essentially when we you apply the model, the idea is to have direct estimates 
that do not necessarily have the uh, quantity we want when working with small area estimates, but generally speaking, the model will help us improve the estimates, taking into consideration auxiliary information that will allow us to explain certain variables and the variability between municipalities. And we do this by uh, using direct estimators as model target variables. Next slide, please. Generally speaking, the results are quite satisfactory because we decided to work with the health and demographics survey data. And we, and this is based on the question related to experiences in international migration. In keeping with this and in keeping with the municipalities sample size, we are able to determine using Bayesian methods, we are able to determine the difference between that and direct estimators. So here you have the results. This is a disaggregated by municipality. The first map refers to the portion of households with a migratory experience, taking into consideration the direct estimators. The second one refers to the variation coefficient related to this direct estimate. The third is the estimate of the, actu the indicator's actual estimate, but using the Bayesian approach. And then the last is the variation coefficient related to the Bayesian model. Now, when you actually observe, when you see the darker colors, that refers to where we have identified the highest proportion of households with uh, migratory experience. And these coincide with the urban areas in our country. And uh, this allows us to characterize what areas have been affected by international migration. These also coincide with the border areas, uh, border regions with Ecuador and Venezuela where we see a higher percentage of households with at least one member with uh, migratory experience or re someone living abroad. Comparing the second and fourth lab, we can identify how through the use of, uh, through estimation in minor areas, the methodologies, we can arrive at a better interpretation of results, given the fact that we can estimate uh, variation coefficients or a variance uh, which is estimated on the basis of sample sizes that enable us to identify in which area so we can have a better interpretation of results. This information is quite uh, new for the country because in the past we were not able to have um, a control with a continuous uh, regularity of changes in this variable. And uh, despite the fact that the results of the uh, subsequent census and surveys enable us uh, to um, conclude that uh, uh, indicators of international migrations is not homogeneous at a geographic level, and that accounts for characteristics that some, somehow coincide with expected values, uh, considering uh, demographic bibliographies associated uh, to the uh, context in the sense that within each geographic unit uh, there is a greater movement. Uh, within it, um, human movement, uh, migrations. And this is quite notorious in uh, border areas. And just to summarize, we see the same thing that I was uh, telling you beforehand, but focusing on the municipalities that uh, obtained uh, the best uh, results in the estimation of uh, variation coefficients. 
both uh, using direct models and also uh, Bayesian uh, uh, models. Here you can see the main uh, capitals uh, that have a largest proportion of households with uh, uh, experience in uh, migration in Bogota, uh, Cali, uh, the city of Armenia, and Cartagena de Indias, uh, which is a city in the Colombian Caribbean. And we also find other municipalities, such as Soledad and Chile, below to the metropolitan area of the major cities, so, which uh, concentrate the largest supply of education and employment services in our country. And we also have other areas, such as Villa del Rosario, Manaure, Valle del Gamues, and San Andres de Tumaco, which are border and municipalities uh, with highly uh, connected uh, to international mobility associated uh, to the fact that they are areas that neighbor other countries. And we find uh, that uh, using direct methods, uh, we find a, that a representation for a city such as Chia, for example, where we have direct uh, variation coefficients uh, of 75, uh, the Bayesian uh, model enables us to estimate a variation coefficients uh, that enable a much more robust interpretation of uh, sample data associated to municipalities such as Chia, for example, that uh, is a municipality uh, close to the city of Bogota. Well, these conclusions basically repeat what I have just said. Uh, the main Colombian cities such as Bogotá, Cali, Medellín, Barranquilla, and Cartagena present some of the highest estimations in the proportions of households uh, that have experienced international migration. And this is interesting in as much as these cities, uh, which are the, are the main areas uh, where uh, services uh, on education and uh, work are concentrated and that, in fact, and given that that uh, may be uh, some of the main reasons why people migrate, uh, these cities are in general terms the origin of um, a domestic migration that, that uh, are stepped and that end up by being migrations, by being migrations abroad. Uh, these high levels can also be seen can also be found in municipalities of the uh, coffee growing uh, region, which enables us uh, to determine uh, migration determinants uh, that are different to those of capital cities. For example, in the coffee growing region, depending on uh, harvesting cycles, populations become more or less mobile. And this enables us to deal with the issues uh, related to how this migration uh, how this uh, tends to be much more frequent or less uh, probability of migrating, um, especially um, moving towards some um, international migration. And we would also like to highlight uh, that uh, the specific location of uh, migration is not homogeneous. In other words, our territories so that have a have a, a greater vocation, so to speak, uh, when it comes to this indicator. There are uh, municipalities and regions, uh, such as uh, border areas, uh, that have a greater vocation uh, to become, uh, to produce much more migrants at an, at an international level, and how this is connected with uh, economic cycles, uh, both uh, in uh, Colombia and also with regards to uh, regional cycles, uh, regional economic cycles. Uh, basically, our main lesson is that uh, based on the analysis and the application of methodological alternatives, uh, we are able to increase our knowledge on uh, the international migration phenomenon, especially when it comes to the historic uh, uh, vacuums that we have found uh, when it comes uh, to the origin, uh, the origins of international migration. And it also enables us to improve the quality of uh, information because we have tools or more continuous sources of information in order to conduct these exercises without having to depend 100% on population censuses. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mariana. Very insightful. 
about the new way of estimating, looking at the country of origin, or rather the municipality of origin uh, perspective. Uh, very promising to hear that this model uh, can be applied to other situations. That's very interesting. And I'm sure that will be of interest to some colleagues here working in the, in the national statistical offices uh, to hear more about it. Um, we're moving straight forward to Madame Leila. We're moving from country experience to regional perspective. And Leila has been, as I mentioned earlier, very active in many, for many years in this area. So I'll pass on straight away to, to Leila for her perspective on, the, on migration, forced displacement, particular capacity building areas. Thank you, Monsieur Tarek. <coughs> Let I start. Uh, well, in my presentation, let me go down. In my presentation on uh, <clears throat> sorry on capacity building on forced displacement and migration uh, statistic in Africa, I will, I will highlight uh, some information about the South Africa achievement, but it's from another uh, angle based on the. Uh, coordination, uh, partnership, uh, sharing good uh, experience and uh, and uh, listen and learn and networking. Uh, but I will brief you uh, on the uh, establishment of the, some uh, institutional uh, uh, technical specialized technical group on Shasa uh, two to uh, uh, facilitate this coordination. Also, the African Migration uh, Data uh, Network. Uh, the, uh, also briefing on the uh, experience of the African Union on irregular migration, IDP and stateless uh, statistics, and the promotion on uh, uh, inclusive uh, uh, official statistics on migration, uh, displacement, and uh, stateless. Uh, as you are aware, migration uh, uh, phenomenon has become very crucial in, uh, in the African continent, particularly with the uh, increasing uh, number of uh, intra-African migration and different uh, challenges uh, facing uh, the migrants. In order to manage uh, better uh, these uh, migration uh, flows, the Assembly of Head of State and Government of the African Union uh, adopted two key instruments for the governance of the, uh, the migration uh, in uh, Africa and are being implemented by the African Union uh, Commission. We can mention the uh, uh, EU uh, revised uh, migration uh, policy framework for the period 2018-2030 uh, and uh, its uh, plan of action <clears throat> and also the famous uh, joint EU ILO uh, IOM ECE uh, program on the governance of uh, labor uh, migration for the development on uh, and integration in Africa called GLMP uh, program. These uh, policies identify migration data and statistics as key pillars uh, in improving migration governance in the uh, continent. Uh, it uh, should be noted that uh, in uh, recent years there, there has uh, improvement in the quality of uh, uh, data produced on migration uh, by the African countries. Uh, this was made possible with the adoption of the two instruments for the adoption of statistics uh, in Africa, uh, mainly the African Charter on Statistics and the Strategy for the Harmonization of Statistics in Africa. We have the Shasa 1 and a revised uh, strategy, uh, Shasa uh, 2. At institutional uh, level, we can mention the creation of the African Union Institute for Statistics of Africa and also the African Migration Observatory sorry, observatory, uh, and the African Center for Study and Research on uh, Migration, and also the Continental Operational Center in, uh, in charge of uh, irregular migration for the improvement of the migration governance in uh, Africa. Alors, Shasa II uh, aims at enabling the African statistical system to generate quality, timely, and harmonized statistics to monitor regional uh, integration policy and support uh, uh, national, uh, regional, and international development agenda. Within, within uh, this continental strategy, uh, 18 uh, specialized technical groups were created and set up uh, for the uh, harmonization of uh, statistics in the different uh, domain and also coordinate uh, between the 55 uh, EU member states and the regional economic communities to facilitate this harmonization and also to uh, uh, avoid the duplication 
uh, with partners on the implementation of uh, uh, the uh, program and projects for the development of uh, statistics in uh, in uh, Africa. The sp one uh, of uh, uh, the uh, 18 uh, specialized technical groups is uh, the specialized technical uh, groups on migration uh, statistics. Alors, this, the, the mandate of this uh, uh, STG or specialized technical groups on migration, on migration with STG, uh, migration statistics, it's to, as I mentioned, to coordinate the uh, harmonization and facilitate the harmonization uh, of uh, uh, migration statistics at uh, national, regional, and continental level in line with the international uh, standard and uh, uh, definition. Uh, and this, uh, the composition of this uh, uh, STG, it's uh, represented by uh, the different countries uh, with the rotation uh, from the five uh, uh, regions uh, from uh, Africa. Alors, in, uh, uh, for the African Migration Data, we come to the African Migration Data Network, the second uh, uh, not institution, but uh, uh, a network uh, established to facilitate the coordination uh, for the inclusion of uh, uh, different uh, uh, migration statistics co uh, component. It's the African Migration Data Network. This, this uh, uh, ID or the uh, came uh, during the uh, last uh, uh, IFMS uh, in uh, on 2021, in uh, and we uh, African Union, uh, OECD, uh, Statistics Sweden, and IOM uh, GIMDAC. At that time, we organized a parallel session, and uh, the participants expressed the need to have uh, this uh, network to facilitate the coordination, uh, uh, the coordination of uh, the. Uh, the sharing uh, this uh, this uh, knowledge on the uh, migration uh, statistics and this uh, this uh, network was created uh, after the uh, long uh, effort uh, and coordination between South Africa IOMG DAC, OECD and the statistic uh, Sweden uh, it was launched on April 2021. Uh, the object, the main objective of this African Migration Data Network is to facilitate and create the dialogue between users and uh, producers of uh, uh, migration uh, uh, statistics uh, and also uh, uh, facilitate the, uh, the adoption uh, of the international uh, standard uh, at national, regional and uh, continental uh, level. Bon, the, the, the composition or the structure of this uh, of this uh, African Migration Data Network uh, it's uh, represented by uh, the uh, uh, it's led by the African Union, but the steering committee was established uh, represented by uh, African Union, Statistics Sweden, uh, IOM GINDAC, and OECD, and the 55 member uh, states of uh, African Union. Uh, represented by the producer and uh, users and also uh, researcher and academia and also the eight uh, uh, regional economic communities of uh, Africa. Uh, some, uh, I can uh, mention some activities represent, uh, uh, achieved by uh, this African Migration Data uh, Network since the, its uh, la launching. Uh, uh, it, uh, it was the organization of uh, three sessions of the uh, summer uh, uh, school on the uh, migration statistics, and it, uh, uh, it uh, helped a uh, lot uh, the uh, members of African uh, uh, Union member states to uh, understand and to uh, see the different challenges encountered by member states uh, at the level of the definition the concepts at international level and the difference of this definition and concept used at national and uh, regional uh, level. Uh, and uh, also uh, 
the organization of uh, webinars, mini webinars uh, organized to uh, sensitize and advocate the, uh, the different uh, uh, members of uh, this, uh, uh, web, uh, this uh, African Migration Data uh, Network on the uh, uh, international recommendation to be uh, adopted and in, uh, included in their uh, plan, uh, plan on migration, uh, uh, on the production of migration uh, statistics. And also the uh, project on the disaggregation of uh, Agenda 2030 indicators uh, uh, by the statue of migrants for uh, some uh, pilot uh, countries. Uh, also, uh, the development of uh, the Africa uh, migration profile and these uh, two activities uh, were developed uh, by uh, IOM, GDAC, uh, Statistics uh, Statistic Sweden and uh, uh, South Africa. Another uh, level of uh, inclusion of uh, this uh, uh, forced uh, displacement uh, and uh, migration uh, statistics uh, it comes at uh, uh, the experience of the African Union to uh, develop methodology on the irregular migration and ITP and stateless uh, uh, statistics. Uh, it was uh, developed uh, in collaboration with the IOM and other partners. Uh, uh, they developed a, guide, uh, a guideline uh, on measuring irregular migration and associated uh, protection uh, uh, risks. risks. Uh, also, uh, many building capacity and trainings were organized to uh, EU member states involving the different uh, producers and uh, on trafficking in person statistics. It means that we don't focus only on the National Statistical Office who produce the data, but uh, we invite the other uh, organizations and institutions who are in charge to uh, collect the data on the trafficking uh, in person to create this uh, knowledge uh, or to, to uh, uh, receive the knowledge and to create the dialogue between the different uh, producers to facilitate the harmonization of the definition and the concept uh, uh, to uh, produce uh, data. Also, Start Africa, and, uh, uh, as a member of El uh, Greece, uh, uh, gave uh, her the opportunity uh, to, to reinforce the coordination at all levels in Africa for the dissemination and advocacy. Uh, of the recommendation and methodological uh, guidelines developed by uh, Greece. Uh, in addition, South Africa has brought on board the challenges on the African specificity to be considered in the recommendation developed by uh, uh, Greece. Uh, together, South Africa and, uh, and uh, uh, Greece uh, are supporting EU member states for the production of statistics on irregular migration, IDP, and uh, state statistics. Uh, uh, with uh, the collaboration of uh, uh, Statistics Sweden. And I can take the example of uh, uh, the activities uh, organized uh, uh, to uh, ECOWAS uh, or the building capacity organized to uh, ECOWAS and the IGAD with uh, EGRIS and uh, South Africa. Uh, also, uh, South Africa, as a member of EGRIS, will uh, facilitate uh, uh, the sharing the good practices and listen and learn, of course, the displacement and migration statistics within the continent and beyond through uh, the uh, uh, members. Uh, also support the implementation in Africa to the various methodological developments uh, 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 developed by EGRIS at national, regional, and continental level in, uh, in Africa. South Africa also contributed in the development and the recommendation of uh, stateless uh, statistics and make sure that the African specificity and uh, are integrated in the methodology and recommendations developed by uh, EGRIS. Uh, for the, uh, uh, the promotion on, uh, of inclusive official statistics on migration for the, uh, the displacement and the stateless, the Stat Africa uh, is supporting the EU member state to produce migration through the development of a module, and uh, this one is. Uh, uh, um, Managerish planet for uh, 2023 to bring the, the, the necessary uh, building capacity uh, and the technical support to, to uh, the member state who is, uh, who is planning to uh, uh, conduct their uh, population and housing, uh, housing the census to include one model in their uh, uh, census or uh, uh, for uh, 
uh, to measure or to collect data on this issue. Also, uh, the, for very regular surveys on migration, uh, we uh, also uh, brought uh, uh, technical uh, capacity, uh, technical support uh, to uh, for the use of administrative sources on data to be used for a statistical purpose, not uh, other uh, issue, and also explore new or alternative data sources. Uh, for uh, Stata, Stata Freak, uh, uh, also is advocating and ensuring the technical support of member states and the regs to consider the production of migration statistics into their uh, NSDS and RSDS uh, to be uh, uh, sure that it's uh, uh, considered in their uh, strategy, uh, in their law or act, also in the, uh, their national plan for uh, migration. And also, they uh, supported the member states to set up the national and regional uh, technical uh, working group on migration statistics, uh, and also national coordination mechanism on uh, migration. Uh, bon, for uh, the way forward, Stat Africa is committed to continue its support to EU member states on the production of forced displacement and the migration statistics with collaboration of its key partners. Uh, and also will ensure coordination with the uh, REX, EU member states and partners to make sure that production of forced displacement and migration statistics are part of the official statistics in EU member states and ensure the, the, connection, the connection between efforts to strengthen migration and forced displacement statistics together. Also, Stat Africa is committed to support the dissemination of uh, EGRIS tools and guidance at all level in uh, in Africa, uh, Stat Africa also is engaged to facilitate the peer-to-peer -peer exchange and learning with it within the and across regions, uh, uh, sharing the African experience and also developing a regional uh, partnership with other uh, regions. Stat Africa, in collaboration with EGRIS, has to develop an advocacy plan for better uh, inform policy makers on the EGRIS recommendation and the interest to adopt them at national, uh, regional, and continental level uh, in Africa. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Leila. Clearly articulated the importance of migration and forced displacement statistics in, in Africa. Uh, like in particular also the fact that it's not a top-down approach uh, that the global level says to regions and countries what's supposed to do, but actually in your case, you have taken the experience within the African continent on displacement and fed back into how to international recommendations on displacement statistics or statelessness statistics as they will be hopefully adopted soon uh, have been produced. Uh, without further ado, we're moving to our last pass, a part of the, of the puzzle. Uh, before doing so, let me tell you, give you a heads up. Um, in principle, we're supposed to end in three minutes. We're not going to end in three minutes. We inherited a bit of a delay from the morning session which was then a bit uh, further delayed through a quite a long coffee break. So I take the liberty of extending a bit this session by approximately 15 minutes, just giving you a heads up. I'm going to eat into your lunch break. And I apologize for that in advance. If you go hungry, please come to me. I'm happy to buy you a sandwich subsequently. <laughs> um, and because Leila and others have mentioned quite extensively Agris, I want to also highlight that the Agris coordinator is here in the room, and that's Natalia Ball. Would you please raise your hand just so in case you have any further questions on Agris, uh, you're most welcome to contact uh, uh, Natalia, of course, going forward in the next coming days. And now, finally, my last words go to Mr. Bjorn. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tarek. I hate to be sitting here between you and the lunch. Um, be as quick as I can um, to go through my remarks. Um, I want to start by saying how delighted I am to be here in Chile and in South America. You, you really feel the energy, the dynamism and the compassion. Um, it's also, I find a very good place to be discussing inclusion of migrants and refugee-like populations, given the progressive and inclusive policies pursued by this country and the other Andean countries. I also want to thank the hosts for organizing DESA OECD IOM for a really interesting and comprehensive program. Um, 
I, I feel I have to give you the one-on-one -on, -one on the Bruint data center. We're the new kid on the block, although we've been around for almost four years now. Um, the uh, JDC's mission in one sentence is to dramatically improve the quality, the amount of, and the accessibility and uh, of data and evidence on the more than 303 million people who are forcibly displaced and their host populations. Um, over these four years or three and a half years, we've invested some 30 million uh, for this pur purpose, awarding funding uh, for activities implemented in over 30 countries by UNHCR and World Bank colleagues, often in partnership with national statistical agencies. We've been able to do this thanks to funding from the Danish government, the US government, uh, the EU, as well as IKEA and Hilton Foundations. And as you, as you may imagine, the overall objective of the center, center's work is to allow for evidence-informed policymaking and programming. So Tarek, you have asked me to try to connect some of the previous interventions and articulate a statement related to how the work from each of the partners contribute to the goal of statistical inclusion. I think that was the ask. Um, I made it easy for myself by uh, uh, by showing you the animation that we have put together on statistical inclusion, um, and also listening to uh, to the colleagues on the panel. I think you have a, a good sense of this already. Um, but I, I do think it's about three things. Three things. It's about having national surveys conducted by national statistical agency the gold standard, to be inclusive and allow for disaggregation by country of origin, or in the case of census, that it asks the question about origin. It's about designing administrative data collection efforts by other government entities, such as migration management offices like Migración Colombia or the Instituto Nacional de Estatística de Chile, um, as we heard from the Director General earlier. Um, so that they allow for comparison between those forcibly displaced and migrants with their host communities and national averages. And it's about making administrative data flow from government agencies to the national statistical offices using anonymization and aggregation techniques that protect the individuals behind the responses. At the Joint Data Center, we believe that we need to work on three fronts in parallel to achieve statistical inclusion. First, need to strengthen international statistical um, system and the standards. Um, EGRIS work is the cornerstone of this effort and I want to commend all of you who have worked to design them. Including some of the panel members here, um, Natalia um, and Tarek and many others. Increasingly, the work conducted to implement the recommendation, it's really about the country level. How do we take these nice, beautiful recommendations agreed in New York and have them implemented at the country level? At the JDC, we support um, two countries, specifically Djibouti and Colombia, for precisely this, both technically and financially. And it was really pleased to hear that our colleague from, from Morocco to describe the, their egress e journey. Um, the rollout at country level and building the capacity to take on board the recommendations is a key priority right now, as global recommendations and agreements are only as useful as they are being adopted at the national levels. So that was my, that was number one. Number two, we need to make sure that national surveys give statistically solid results also for those, these, this subpopulation. I'm talking about the demographic and health surveys, labor force surveys, living standard measurement studies, the multi-indicator cluster surveys, just to name a few. The point here is that countries and stakeholders can create solid basis for consistent, representative, and comparable data of all populations in a country or territory with a view to provide regular and nationally owned data. I want to tell you about a couple of examples of this. Um, the first one is for Chad who in 2018, 2019 became, I believe the first country in Sub-Saharan Africa to include refugees in their nationwide household budget survey. 
And based on that evidence develop, um, that they, it produced, the government asked the, bank, the World Bank and UNHCR to support the integration of development and humanitarian projects in order to address food insecurity and other socioeconomic challenges facing refugees and host communities in that country. Another example, in Uganda, we are currently supporting the government's effort to have the forthcoming demographic and health survey inclusive of their 1.5 million refugees. The sample for this population will be boosted so that it gives us meaningful statistics. And it may be the first DHS fully inclusive of refugees globally. Here in South America, coming closer to, to home, for these days. We're supporting a similar effort in Colombia, including a, through an initiative by DANE um, and the World Bank called Pulso Migración, which gives us granular information on the migrants in that country. And the Pulso is repeated every six months to give us panel-like data. So far, four rounds have been completed and we hope that it becomes institutionalized within DANE going forward. Here in Chile, we've supported the National Service for Migration in gen generating evidence to support the design of public policies aiming to improve the economic and social, sociocultural integration of migrants into Chilean society, including data collection and analysis to understand socioeconomic barriers to integration. We see progress also in, in, a, couple of, in a few other countries, in Brazil, Kenya, Rwanda, and South Africa. Um, where they have in their recent surveys, uh, census, I'm sorry, um, included the critical country of origin question. We find that there's so much energy and good initiatives ongoing in this space. And as pointed out by the representative in academia from academia in the, in the previous session, there really is a, 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 a sea change going on. My third point is, is that we need to invest in the capacity to share and access the data once collected. A colleague from South Africa in, a, in the previous session made this point. To achieve this, we need to strengthen national statistical capacities. It takes expertise to quality assure, to anonymize, to aggregate the data, whether at administrative or statistical levels, so that it can be shared with partners without jeopardizing the identity of the people behind the data. Protection concerns are high, particularly for this population uh, who is often persecuted by states or other actors, and those um, protection concerns need to be fully respected. To allow for this, we have secured long you need, we need to secure long-term financial investments in statistical and, and data science capacities. I want to use, if, if I may, Tarek, uh, uh, an example very close to, to Tarek's home. Um, where we um, helped UNHCR build a microdata library, um, which didn't exist. There, there was no microdata library in UNHCR four years ago. While just creating this microdata library, which was built on the, uh, uh, on the World Bank model, uh, that was just the first step in this effort. I would say the more important step is have the capacity to curate, to do the quality control, to do the aggregation, and to do the anonymization. And for this purpose, we have set up a separate office in, in Tarek shop in UNHCR. And Andrea over there is, is, is head of that uh, outfit. And they, over these three years or so, have been able to collect over 500, I think there are close to 550 data sets um, at this time, and, and bring them up to the library, make them accessible, to any serious actors who find, find them uh, useful for their uh, work, whether that's for um, programming purposes or it's for policy making or if it's for, um, for um, evidence building by, by academia. It's important that we come together in support of these efforts, both through financing, technical support and lessons learned. So let me conclude. Um, we urgently need to make migrants, refugees, IDPs, stateless persons, visible in the official statistics so we can understand who they are, what their situation is in terms of income, in terms of education, health, and other, as Mr. Scarpetta pointed out in the previous session. Thank you, Tarek. Thank you very much, uh, Bjorn. Not much to add to your last words of wisdom. 
Um, clearly, the JDC has been what I tend to like to call the catalyst for change, not only for UNHCR and the World Bank, but far beyond that, particularly at national and regional level in, in making change happen in the area of data and statistics on forced displacement and more recently statelessness statistics. So thank you very much for, for making this change happen and hopefully continuing to make it happen in the, in the years to come with the second mandate of the, of the Joint Data Center going forward. Um, we have a few minutes, as I mentioned to you, to eat into your lunchtime. Um, I would like to open the floor to give our audience here a bit of an uh, opportunity to provide feedback, have questions, have comments on what you heard so far. And I see one single finger already pointing into the sky, which means it's the statistical sky. So we have one person over there already. We have a second one over there and we have a third one. Okay, so perhaps would you like to identify yourself first and then your question and particularly if it's addressed to a particular panelist or it's in general? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a general um, question. Um, my name is Alessio Cangiano. I'm from UNFPA. Um, HQ. I work with the census team. And um, the main contribution of UNFPA to global migration statistics is probably through the census, to the support to the census. And so the question I would like to ask is, is around the use of, of the census for producing data on, on refugee populations, IDP and, and stateless populations. And reflecting back to the, to the notion of inclusion that you uh, um, wisely discussed at the beginning of, uh, of the session. So on paper, the census should, you know, as a universal data source, should include everybody in the country and, um, you know, um, should be able to generate data on key subpopulations at any level of disaggregation and shouldn't have the problems of statistical representativeness of household surveys in producing such, such data. In practice, the situation is a lot more complicated than that because we know that the coverage of, of refugees uh, and IDPs in censuses is always very problematic uh, for a number of constraints uh, related to the definition of the census population. Sometimes, you know, the focus on the usual resident population, for example, related to the high non-response rate of people with undocumented status, of people who don't speak the language, and also related to the coverage of um, 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 communal institutions, population living in communal institutions, whether refugee camps, for example, are included or not, immigration detention facilities are included or not, etc. So, you know, when, when it comes to censuses, the, the key recommendation of the UN uh, recommendations on international migration statistics is to include a question on um, reasons for migration as a way to identify um, refugees and asylum seekers. But this is hardly enough unless we address all of these other issues that I, I referred to uh, earlier on. And so I think my question is, is really, um, you know, are we making the most of the census for producing refugee statistics? Um, is the potential of the census fulfilled? Are there good examples of countries that are um, changing the use of the census to, to be more inclusive of these subpopulations? And um, I would welcome a reflection from any of the panelists on this. If not, uh, I hope this is a, a, a useful reflection in itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before passing on quickly to, to Thomas, I've been instructed that we have to end at 1.45, which is in two minutes. So we have 120 seconds. Um, you, we can post a question and perhaps the, the questionnaires can be asked to the panels uh, during the lunch break, so we can accommodate the, the dead end we have here in two minutes. Yeah, uh, thanks. It goes a little bit in a, in a similar direction. I would have appreciated just a one or two sentence reply from everybody uh, who feels like it. I mean, like we've heard a lot about these um, um, like household-based surveys, the coverage of uh, people who are in an irregular situation who may not be living in a household, um, I've heard relatively little about improving coverage for these groups. I mean, like we've seen sample boosting examples and uh, 
uh, uh, trying to be uh, um, more representative. But but what about what about these groups that you don't regularly cover in your in your standard household surveys? I mean, uh, what are some of the innovative tools that you have seen experimented? To improve, uh, um, to to reach out to uh, to migrants, perhaps living in, in on the street or wherever. Thanks. Thanks very much. And just to clarify, that's Thomas Liebig from the OECD. And the last question, and then. Hi, I'm uh, Sarah Stillman from UC Berkeley. Um, so my question was very similar to my colleague at UNFPA, but maybe building on that, um, how can I guess researchers or academics support or serve as a link um, between, or basically given the constraints that the uh, governments have in terms of being able to track these extremely hard to reach populations, um, how can academia fill that gap, uh, people that have more time and more resources to be really making sure that these are indeed inclusive? Thank you. Thanks very much. All three are very important questions. The academic academia question, I think, would be greatly appreciated by Bjorn because JDC has done quite some work in this area. Um, on the census question, I feel Morocco and, uh, and Colombia would be best placed, given the national experience, to understand, does it make sense to include a census, yes or no? And on the survey, obviously, it's a challenging environment, and we are rolling out our census units here, uh, currently what we call the forced displacement survey a nationally representative sample survey of refugees and hosts. We're piloting it now in a few countries, given the challenges uh, in, in very challenging environments. And uh, so we hope to have some, gain some experience in this uh, coming forward in the next six to eight months. Um, since we have to break, may I ask, perhaps Bjorn first, very quickly, and then um, the two colleagues from Morocco and, and, and Colombia before we, I hopefully don't get shot here with a statistical gun. <laughs> yes, we love academia. We <laughs> love what you can bring to this space. You have more time and you have some of the most intelligent people around. Um, and um, I, I find perhaps the the challenge that I've seen, and, and we've organized two research conferences for this purpose, try to connect policymakers um, program people and academia. Um, the, the challenge is that there are still uh, uh, some key critical data gaps um, in areas where few of the academic researchers are able to go. Um, I'm thinking about the Sahel, I'm thinking about DRC, South Sudan, some other really remote places where the biggest data gaps are. And that's, to me, how do we overcome that hurdle? of collecting data and do the proper analysis in those hardest to reach places. Thanks very much, perhaps. And you're welcome to connect with Bjorn separately on, on that topic, of course. Over to perhaps uh, Marianne or Mohamed, who wants to go first? Peut-être quelques éléments de réponse aux deux questions. Je crois que d'abord, la question du recensement, je pense qu'il est le mieux placé pour cerner de manière exhaustive ces populations particulières qui sont rares dans, notre, dans nos sociétés, que ce soit les réfugiés, les apatrides, les enfants en mouvement, etc. C'est la meilleure source de données. Mais jusqu'à présent, il y a une, une réticence des bureaux statistiques à intégrer des questions, et vous, vous, vous savez pourquoi parce qu'il y a des, des priorités et on ne peut pas leur dire le questionnaire, mais il, il y a des approches maintenant avec les, les nouvelles méthodologies d'exécution de, des recensements. Il y a possibilité, quand il y a euh, un questionnaire long et un questionnaire court, d'intégrer toutes ces catégories de migrants, le statut de réfugiés, le, les apatrides dont on a, mais c'est une population qui est rare. La deuxième question concernant les, les enquêtes ménages, Oui, c'est vrai que je pense que j'ai donné le matin l'exemple le, le, de l'enquête emploi pour ce qui est des, des, des immigrés. Jusqu'à présent, on n'arrive pas à obtenir des estimations de type effectif parce que c'est une petite, c'est un problème de petit nombre. Et c'est un, un problème aussi d'approche. Donc, cette approche devrait être révisée. Comme vous avez souligné, il y a les, les, la plupart des immigrés ne vivent pas dans des ménages ordinaires. 
sont dans des chantiers, ils sont dans des, des, des endroits particuliers. Donc, il faudrait réviser la méthodologie pour pouvoir cerner de manière exhaustive l'ensemble des catégories de ces migrants au niveau des enquêtes ménage, notamment l'enquête emploi, par exemple, ou autre enquête. Merci. Pues uno de los desafíos que por lo menos eh, las oficinas de estadística están tratando un poco de mitigar está asociado al fortalecimiento. Uh, to mitigate this, and this is associated uh, to strengthening the synergies between entities uh, to strengthen uh, national statistical systems and so that we can connect uh, the information from uh, different uh, administrative records. And this implies other challenges associated to the protection of personal data, to delays in connection to the time uh, of the data. But uh, DANE has begun uh, to explore uh, strategies uh, to have uh, better synergies with the entities uh, that have uh, migration databases, as for example, the victims unit, or Migración Colombia, who conduct uh, border crossing controls. And to put into one uh, uh, data table information obtained from different entities, despite this is a challenge for intergovernmental communication, uh, this could uh, provide an important potential to uh, public uh, based, to evidence-based uh, public policies. And that is what Dani has tried to work on, on strengthening administrative records and on strengthening the national statistical system so that we are able to improve access to information and coverage. But in any case, uh, there are many limitations, especially uh, when it comes uh, to periods of time and the protection of uh, personal data. But we also have uh, surveys uh, that enable us to characterize in a much more expeditious manner and uh, also to have information in far shorter periods, other strategies that we're working on. For example, with the entities uh, that uh, provide uh, programs uh, uh, for migrants, uh, they receive a certain amount of information, but they are not uh, uh, they are not a source of an important source of statistical information, but rather the study of some isolated cases. For example, USA programs have an important uh, level of information uh, collection, but they are they focus on a very specific territory that uh, me that cannot be representative of the whole phenomenon, but uh, that despite the fact that they enable us to identify certain aspects regarding discrimination, the vulnerability of communities and so on. And we're beginning to uh, organize uh, un uh, workshops uh, to understand the reality of those territories that, that are most highly impacted. Thank you very much. Um, as I had a couple of colleagues are moving towards the canteen, let me conclude here. Thank you, first of all, and first of all panelists for having been with us today and having given us insights into forces, placement, migration, and statelessness statistics. Um, I would also like to very much thank the co-organizers of, of this session, which means the Agri Secretariat, the Joint Data Center, and uh, the Inter-Secretariat Working Group on Household Service, of course. Um, the IFMS team for giving us the space here. Thanks very much for giving refugees and others an identity in statistics, in particular in such sessions, which are important to all of us. And last but not least, I would like to apologize to the interpreters for having gone over time and thank them for their patience um, for having gone the extra mile. Thanks a lot to everybody. And uh, there are a couple of sessions more coming in the course of these next two and a half days on displacement and statelessness. So stay tuned, more to come. Thanks a lot and bon appetit.
afternoon, Miss Michelle Flame. Can we test your camera and your audio, please? Hello. Good afternoon. How are you? Everything you. good here. We can, can you see, see you and we can hear you very clear. Very good. Thank you. Thanks to you, you can uh, stay with your camera off and your microphone off. Thank okay, you very much. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the uh, second plenary session on strengthening data on migrants in vulnerable situation of the International Forum on Migration Statistics. Uh, my name is Stefano Scarpetta. I'm the Director for Employment, Labor and Social Affairs. Um, this is a, a crucial session in our discussion today and tomorrow. I think uh, in the introduction remarks this morning, but also in the first plenary, uh, the issue about uh, moving, improving data in general, but also making data more granular to be able to capture the specific condition of the different groups, I think uh, uh, has resonated in several of the intervention. And this, of course, uh, has a particular importance when we look at uh, people in need uh, uh, with special needs to protect their right, to ensure that no one is left behind. And this is also a core of both the global contact on migration refugees, but of course is also an integral part of the 2030 agenda. Uh, in this session in particular, we would like to uh, look at very concrete ways to improve the availability and quality of data on migrants in vulnerable situations, including migrants in transit, refugees, asylum seekers, migrant women and children on the move. Uh, we have a very great uh, panel to present their own experience, but also some of the challenges. Uh, and then, of course, as usual, uh, we will look forward also to your comments and your questions and interventions. Let me immediately introduce our four panelists. The two of them are here in presence with us in, uh, in Santiago, and two are connected online. Uh, on my right is uh, Tarek Abu Chabake who is the Chief Statistician of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Then we have Amparo Gonzalez Ferrer, uh, who is the Deputy Director General for Migratory Analysis at the Secretary of State of Migration in Spain. And then connected online with us are uh, Inkeri uh, von Hase, who is the Global Coordinator of Making Migration Safe for Women of the UN Women. And then we have Michelle Klein Solomon, who is the Regional, Regional Director for Central in North America and the Caribbean of the International Organization for Migration. What I'd like to do in this uh, plenary session is to give the floor to our four panelists for their introductory remarks. And then we go for a second round of questions, which will be specific to their specific competences and some of the recent experience they've been undertaking. And then of course, so we open up the floor for your questions and for your comments. So with no further ado, I'd like to give the floor to you, Tarek, for your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefano. And thank you very much to the organizers for having invited me on behalf of UNHCR to, this, to the IFMS, first of all, and secondly, to this panel, of course. Um, it's a, the IFMS is about statistics. And if you listen to the, to the presentations that we heard earlier in the morning, uh, people speak about migration statistics, but I didn't hear the statistics on global displacement, on global force displacement. So let me frame a bit the discussion here by giving you a couple of numbers that are important to understand the magnitude we're actually dealing here with as a community. 10 years ago, we spoke about 35 million, roughly 35 million people who are globally displaced due to conflict, war, uh, individual persecution, uh, human rights violations, generalized violence, et cetera, et cetera. This means people displaced internally within their country, and those who have crossed international borders and been recognized as refugees, or being still somewhere in the asylum system waiting for an outcome of the asylum claim. So about 10 years ago, it was about 35 million. By the time of the first IFMS, which took place in, in 2018 in Paris, this number had climbed to 65 million, obviously a significant increase. Today, we are at the third IFMS, and today we released, as UNHCR a couple of months ago, our latest statistics, this number had, uh, had crossed the 100 million mark. It stood at 103 million people who are globally displaced due to conflict, war, persecution, et cetera. So we have, within a time span of about a decade, we have seen almost a tripling of global displacement. And I think it should be no secret that the outlook for the future does not look very positive. You don't need to be a statistician to understand the trajectory the world is taking with regard to forced displacement and that solutions are actually drying up may it be a return of refugees to the home country or may it be being resettled to a third country as a solution. But the question is now is how do we turn a humanitarian challenge into a statistical success? And that's what I'm trying to, to kind of portray a bit what the community has done in, in improving uh, statistics on global force displacement over the last couple of years. 
But let me phrase it a bit differently here. Uh, lawyers always need a legal framework to operate with a certain area of expertise. And so do statisticians. And within the legal and statistical framework, you wouldn't believe it, but the drafters of the 1951 Refugee Convention, they put a paragraph into the convention that makes explicit reference to statistics on refugees, which means any country signing up to the Refugee Convention, and of which they are now the majority in the world, they basically have a legal, legal obligation to collect statistics on refugees and disseminate them at the same time. So that was already more than 70 years ago, the drafters thought that statistics are an important protection mechanism for the global international community by looking at the world of statistics. So that's quite striking, I find, when you go back more than 70 years. More recently, and it was mentioned already several times, the Global Compact on Refugees reinforces the message on how to improve the lives of refugees and the host communities which host them. And here again, we have data as a cross-cutting issue. As was mentioned, the GCM has data as an integral part of its framework, and so does the GCR, the Global Compact on Refugees, which talks about data as a, as a very empowering aspect of improving lives of refugees and the host communities. So what have we done as a community? And we, I mean, we here, all of us together, those online and the rest of the statistical community. I will give you a couple of examples of what has actually been a success, a statistical success. One is international recommendations on refugee statistics have been endorsed in 2018 by the Statistical Commission in New York. The first framework that governs how to count refugees, how to enumerate them, how to define them most importantly, and how to analyze refugee statistics related data. This was complemented in 2020 by the international recommendations on internally displaced person statistics. So within a couple of years, after 70 years, nothing has happened pretty much at the international statistical arena. Within a few years, the Statistical Commission endorsed two major important recommendations on refugees and IDPs as they call them, internally displaced persons. So that's an important milestone. The next milestone is gonna be hopefully very soon, the recommendations on statelessness statistics, which sometimes intersect between displacement and the legal aspect of not having a nationality. At the same time also, recommendations itself are great, but collaboration has intensified. Uh, what we have seen over the years, more and more actors getting engaged on the one side because the humanitarian challenge and the magnitude it shows is quite tremendous and different partners, partners and parties have stepped up to, to meet this uh, demand for, for data. The most successful success, I would say, is, and it has been coming up several times today, including by the, by the Director General of IOM, AGRIS the expert group on refugees, internally displaced persons, and statelessness statistics, which has a mandate from the Statistical Commission in New York to basically imp uh, implement the recommendations on refugee and IDP statistics, and moving forward also help states in implementing those recommendations. So there's a framework, there's an expert group, and UNICEF is happy to host this expert group and will continue to do so, obviously, as a service to the international statistical community. Another good news is, Migration statistics on the one side as a community, forced displacement statistic as a community on the other side. And in the past, those two did not intersect by and large. But this is changing for the better. Those two communities are starting to intersect to understand how both operate, how they can benefit from each other, how the different modalities to collect data, analyze, and disseminate actually intersect across migration and forced displacement. Um, also to understand, obviously, they intersect to understand what are the protection needs and the concerns of the individuals, in this case, refugees or migrants. Increasingly, and this is something that I'm really, you would not have heard it, me saying about 10 years ago, is the, the upscaling of development partners, international development partners, moving into the humanitarian space for the better. Meaning that development always was looking at humanitarian situations let them deal with the situation, and when the moment comes down, development partners come on board and we see post-crisis, post-conflict situations, how can we improve? How can we help as a development agency in improving the lives of refugees, which often happened in the past years later? This is changing. Humanitarian and development partners are working together nowadays, hand in hand. And a classical example is the World Bank UNHCR Joint Data Center on Post Displacement, which was established by those two agencies in Copenhagen has been in existence for almost four years now as a catalyst for change on data. Last but not least, 
And that's, I would say, is my most important point is national ownership of information is important. Meaning in our community, it would be the national statistical offices, which have a responsibility to understand what is happening on the territory, because that's the mandate given to them by the respective governments and given to them by international law, but also statistical regulations and law. And so national statistical offices for the, for the better of the last couple of decades have ignored forced displacement and have given this task to humanitarian agencies by and large. But this is changing partly because of the international recommendations are available on, on statistics, on refugee statistics and IDPs, but also national ownership is getting increasingly important for national statistical systems to understand what's happening on the territory. And so I'm very happy that all of those little positive elements as a, as a bigger picture have shown from a humanitarian challenge, you can actually have statistical success. And now I'm gonna rest my case because not everything is positive, but these are positive elements and let's start on the positive news. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Tarek. Uh, thank you for reminding us of some of the numbers in terms of uh, the number of global displays. But I think also thank you for bringing some uh, positive news. I think we need that also in our discussion, especially I would say in this, in this panel, in terms of the legal framework and the recommendation, which are major milestone in terms of the strength and collaboration, but also in the fact that the different communities are now working together to address these issues. I think it is indeed a very important point we might come into the issues, and there are many that we have still to address, but I think I really appreciate uh, sort of this uh, uh, sort of picture that you, you depict. I'd like to go now to Amparo Gonzalez Ferrer for your opening remark. Try to keep it concise because we have a lot to discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to, to present to you all here uh, the recent experience that we have been uh, pushing within the um, Ministry of Migration in Spain uh, with a new unit for migration analysis. This unit was created almost two years ago, and we were lucky enough uh, in having the, the status of a statistical unit that made the, the, the unit able to, to access uh, some data that otherwise could not be possible to, to access and, and, and exploit and share for the general public, but also for the design of public policy within the ministry. Uh, we have the status of uh, the, the migration analysis unit have a double goal. So we definitely uh, run the, the more traditional type of tasks of any statistical unit in a ministry to publish official statistics on basic uh, uh, indicators or, or magnitudes that are uh, that we are obligated by law as part of the statistical system in the country, but also we wanted to push it a bit further and to, to start making some progress in linking data coming from different sources for which uh, we are in a privileged position in the case of Spain. We are lucky enough there because uh, any migrant that arrives to the territory is given a personal identification number, regardless of whether the way of arriving is uh, regular, regular or irregular, and the person keeps this number over his entire life until in case they acquire Spanish uh, uh, nationality. It's the only moment in which the personal identification number changes. So being representative and responsible for, for official statistics on stock of resi uh, foreign residents and the flow of uh, uh, residence permits uh, granted every year, we were in a privileged position to start using this personal identification number to reconstruct the trajectories of migrants over life. Since uh, they arrived to Spanish territory, as far as they uh, get in touch somehow with the competencies and the activities developed by the Ministry of Inclusion, to which I belong. So what we started to do uh, was in the case of uh, uh, trying to, to go further and not to, to, to restrict ourselves to publish uh, statistic, uh, official statistics, what we uh, tried to do from the very beginning was to be coordinated with the reception units within the ministry. So, for instance, in different emergency situations, like uh, when Spain was leading the, for instance, the, the, the reception of Afghan refugees in summer 2021, what we did was to, to deploy a basic tool for, for data collection 
where the refugees from Afghanistan were landing and uh, uh, collect a very basic social demographic information on the spot that uh, allowed, first of all, our ministry to better organize the distribution of uh, re Afghan refugees all over the country in the different reception facilities that the ministry has. And on the other hand, to follow up uh, the different uh, groups of Afghan refugees that had to be uh, sent to other EU countries and to be able to do that in real time. So this was a very modest exercise in which we just collected very, very basic uh, social demographic information and the crucial information that the reception unit needed in order to be quick in allocate uh, refugee, uh, Afghan uh, refugees to the different facilities that the ministry had all over Spain. So from this exercise, what we learned is how we need to be very uh, pragmatic uh, when we are in an emergency situation and we need to collect some basic data, but advance the difficulties or the possibilities to improve and enrich this data later on if we, if we have this personal identification number that we will allow us to later trace and the follow up uh, people over the different registries of the public administration uh, as they start uh, being in touch with different serv public services or public uh, institutions in the country. Uh, from that experience, then we move to the, to the Ukrainian emergency and the, the size of the two operations were absolutely different. In the first case, we only had to attend to assist uh, to 2,000, a bit more than 2,000 people, but in very few days, in 10 days. So in many cases, uh, three, four planes arrived one after another, and uh, in a very um, relative small uh, place, we had to, to assist all of them and be very quick in allocating them to the different countries they were expected to go to or to the different facilities in Spain for those who were staying in our country. Uh, in the case of Ukraine emergency, the situation was completely different. We have already received more than 160,000 uh, refugees from, from uh, the Ukrainian conflict. And uh, in this case, we had to deploy a different big reception center all over the country. And we started having a better tool for collecting this basic information. Once we have this basic information in the four main reception centers that uh, concentrated about uh, 60, 65 percent of all the arrivals from, uh, of Ukrainian refugees in the country, we started to link them with the uh, police data that we are responsible for, for, for publishing. And that was the, the, the legal basis to do that. And then we started to link that with the uh, registration in the social security system for those who found a, a, a job and were legally employed in the country. So we combine it to two different, uh, let's say, two different strategies. One is deployed on, on, on the ground when the emergency arrives and when we need to support our colleagues in other units within the ministry for the reception uh, activities. And this is very basic, very modest. Uh, you need to renounce to, to some uh, super fancy ideas that you have for, for showing some numbers and some statistics and you need to keep to the basic and to, to provide service to your colleagues they are, who are the ones that are uh, providing the, the, the actual important uh, service in that moment, who is, uh, that is to, to, to assist the people uh, as soon as possible. And once that is done, you need to, to, to have been, um, um, how you say, it? to plan in advance that you would like to follow up those people when they are already in the, the proper facilities, when they start to adapt into the new country, when they start to overcome some traumas, it's not the right moment when they arrive to start making questions, as many people sometimes try to do. It's just very basic to be able to follow up later. And when that is possible, as in our case, we keep enriching the data and the type of uh, 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 statistical information that we can collect over time uh, for this population in order to also better evaluate or assess how the different services that the public administration is providing to these vulnerable populations can improve or not. Unfortunately, in some cases, uh, their, their progress in the country as time elapses. So here, uh, probably we can uh, keep this for the second part of the, of the 
But this is just the part of the of official statistics that we are producing with the Ukrainian refugees data, linking that to the social security register. And there is another one, who is, uh, that is the one that we collect uh, on the spot, which is uh, much, uh, um, let's say, less rich, but uh, more important in the sense that we can there include questions that usually are not included in, in public register, like uh, the region of origin in Ukraine, the size of their family, how many people they are waiting to come later on, or uh, whether they have uh, accommodation already arranged or not in the country. So we complemented one and another in different moments of time. And in this, uh, in this way, we were able to, to have a better understanding on how the situation of these vulnerable populations is developing in our country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amparo. I think that was an extremely interesting, uh, concrete example about a major effort made in your country. And uh, you basically show that the data that do exist can be put together to actually provide much better information for, for policymakers. And the fact that you follow up by putting together the data also with the, uh, the rapid response, and the fact that this was uh, quite important also in the context of the recent crisis, including, of course, most recently, to try to provide support to the Ukrainian refugees. is a very concrete example that I think all of us have benefited from. With that, I'd like to give the floor to our third uh, panelist. Uh, she's connected uh, uh, online. Is it Inke Ribonhas from uh, UN Women. Over to you, Inke. focus my intervention on the um, experience of gender-based violence against uh, migrant women and girls. And firstly, I'd like to uh, highlight that while women and girls make up <clears throat> approximately half of the 281 million international migrants, the continued lack of sex disaggregated data and gender statistics on migration, especially on gender-based violence against migrant women and girls, is a significant issue that really needs to be urgently addressed. So being a migrant accentuates the risk of women and girls to various forms of GBE, GBV in countries of origin, transit, destination, and return. It's structural and gender inequalities, including discriminatory laws and policies, as well as a lack of access to safe and regular migration pathways, which place women in greater situations of vulnerability and increase the risk to GBV. In fact, migrant women face an omnipresent risk of violence at all stages of migration, and that's committed by a variety of actors, uh, such as smugglers, human traffickers, criminal gangs, corrupt officials, and of course, also other migrants, and sometimes even family members. And incidences, incidences of violence are often not singular, but take place multiple times. For example, in one, um, in the recent UN Secretary General's report on violence against women migrant workers, 30% um, of migrants who witnessed or in fact experienced violence traveling along the central Mediterranean route did so in more than one location. And the threat of violence against women and girls is especially high along certain migration routes. For instance, um, in one study uh, conducted with migrants who traveled from Northern Africa to Italy, 90% of the women and girls said that they were raped at some point during their journey. So these are ones of studies. And actually, in fact, we, we know very little um, about the experiences of uh, migrant women in relation to GBV. We not only lack information on the prevalence of violence against migrant women girls, but we also have very little data on the forms, frequency, the severity um, of violence against them, and hardly any data on the perpetrators. Nor do we have sex disaggregated data on uh, trafficking of, uh, uh, of in persons of migrants, um, which is really um, uh, critical. So this needs to really urgently change. And um, in, my, in, in my intervention um, shortly, I will explain why we have so much little data and what can be done in order to address the situation. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. I think you 
put on the table a very important issue indeed. And I think I also look forward for the follow-up discussion, try to see how we can improve the information on something of this importance. Thank you also for reminding us that it's not just one episode, but I think many, many women actually suffer from multiple episodes of violence against them. Um, I would like now to go to Michelle Klein Solomon uh, from uh, the uh, IOM for some opening remarks, please. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be with you virtually. I only wish I could be with you in, in person. I very much appreciate the, the opportunity to address this issue today. So data and evidence are clearly critical components of an effective response to migrants in vulnerable situations, including through supporting evidence-based policymaking and program formulation. Data are invaluable for the identification of vulnerabilities, as well as context-specific challenges for scaling up interventions and for defining long-term sustainable solutions to migrant vulnerability. In brief, it is not an overstatement to say that data saves lives. The international community has shown a firm commitment to protect vulnerable migrants, including victims of trafficking, notably through the Transnational Organized Crime Convention and its supplementary protocol on trafficking in persons. The Sustainable Development Goals 5.2, 8.7, and 16.2 that focus on elimination of violence, exploitation, and trafficking, and most significantly for the purposes of this discussion in the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. It's Objective 7 to address and reduce vulnerabilities in migration, Objective eight, to save lives and establish coordinated international efforts on missing migrants. And objective 10, to prevent, combat, and eradicate trafficking in persons in the context of international migration. All of these efforts at the global level demonstrate a clear commitment to work towards the eradication of trafficking in persons and protection of the rights and well being of migrants in vulnerable situations. It's important to underscore that migrant vulnerability can arise at all stages of migratory journeys in countries of origin, transit, destination, and return, and as a result of multiple factors, including external ones such, such as national hazards exacerbated by climate change, discrimination, exploitation, lack of secure jobs, education, housing, and much more, as well as personal characteristics of individual migrants, including, as Inkeri just said, gender, but also age, disability, ethnicity, and so much more. For the purpose of emphasizing the role of, my da of data, my remarks will focus primarily on one instance of migrants in vulnerable situations, trafficking persons, with examples in particular from the Americas. While it is difficult to quantify the magnitude of trafficking persons worldwide, Estimates suggest that hundreds of thousands of persons are subjected to trafficking across borders, while many others suffer similar situations within their own countries. The subregion of Mexico and Central America is considered an origin, transit, and destination point for trafficking, and every country in the region is affected. In the Americas, more than two thirds of human trafficking victims are sexually exploited. More than 80% of the victims are women and almost one third are children. In Central America and the Caribbean, women and girls account for 79% of detected cases. In addition, this subregion has the highest percentage of girl victims, 40%, and one of the highest proportions of minors in the world who suffer from trafficking, equivalent to 48% of all cases. IOM's displacement tracking matrix allows for the identification of the characteristics and conditions of vulnerable populations and their specific needs, and of course, serves as a complement to official um, statistical data. As an example, a survey in Panama City, which I am sitting in today, shows that 87% of migrants did not have access to health insurance, and then only 22% of children and adolescents attending schools. These conditions increase the risks and vulnerabilities significantly of the migration population. Globally, 
Several challenges related to data on migrant vulnerability include the following. The fact that data are rarely standardized or comparable across institutions and or states. Databases are often dispersed and disconnected from each other. Organizations that deal with rights and protecting migrants do not always have the capacity to manage their operational data and use them to develop the evidence base. Migrant data are highly sensitive and their handling raises significant civil liberties and private concerns. For victims of trafficking, for example, the risk of a survivor being identified from these data can be high and the consequences severe, even life-threatening. And these challenges related to information management and data protection are also present overall in this continent in which today's event is taking place. IOM is a key actor in the generation sharing use and management of data regarding migrants in vulnerable situations. Provision of thematic guidance and building capacity to strengthen knowledge and competencies in data management is a priority for IOM offices together with key partners and especially frontline institutions. We aim to leverage data and evidence to allow for better protection of and assistance to migrants in vulnerable situations. This is consistent with IOM's overarching migration data strategy, which aims to improve the evidence based on migration, including through developing local capacities and promoting the US use of evidence across UN system-wide programming. One example of IOM's work in the Americas is assisting migrants in vulnerable situations is the role we play as one of the coordinators together with UNHCR in the R4V platform for Venezuelans out there, outside of their country of origin. This is actually the world's largest geographical response and collects and publishes data, reports, and research related to vulnerable refugees and migrants from Venezuela. The R4V Regional Migrants Needs Assessment supports the identification of needs across 17 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean through both primary and secondary data. This helps uh, by providing an evidence base to uh, permit partners submissions to annual refugee and, and migrant response plan to support mobilization of funds based on vulnerability and needs at both national and local levels. The r for structure includes nine thematic sessions just to get granular, education, food security, health, humanitarian transportation, integration, nutrition, protection, shelter, and wash, three subsectors of the protection sector, child protection, gender-based violence, and human trafficking and smuggling, and five thematic cross-cutting working groups. There are focal points for gender, environment, and protection from sexual exploitation and abuse, and focusing on the centrality of protection. One other example, building on the work done by the Contra Trafficking Data Collaborative, we are working now on standardizing and, and building the capacity for the collection management of use of administrative data on trafficking and persons. This is the source of some of those statistics I just mentioned. Through building the capacity of governments and other anti-trafficking actors to collect, manage, and share high quality standardized human trafficking data, we aim to improve the, dev, uh, the evidence base for collective, the international community-wide counter trafficking responses. Working together with research, government, and NGO partners, the projects are developing and disseminating the first international standards and guidance on the definition, collection, management, and safe use of administrative data on trafficking persons so the governments around the world can collect data that are comparable, high quality, can be safely shared and used to develop the evidence base to inform policy pro and making and programming by all relevant actors. I, and let me quickly conclude by saying, we're also working to develop and disseminate the first international standardized information management toolkit and guidance on collection and management of human trafficking data for frontline anti-trafficking organizations, providing direct assistance to, to victims. In addition, there's been a literature review on regulation and guidance, guidelines 
for management of trafficking cases and other protection related issues in the regions, together with needs assessment in selected countries to generate resources and evidence that orient to programmatic decisions. Let, as an example, and I'm concluding now, during 2022, IOM's regional data hub in Central America provided comprehensive training to frontline civil society organizations to improve data and information management capacities in Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and, so, and Southern Mexico. We will continue this year with other civil society organizations in other selected countries, and will also include governments from Central America and the Caribbean. As I said, data is essential to saving lives and we are committed to use data to assist migrants in vulnerable situations, including trafficking persons, and to work together with civil society organizations, government institutions, including statistical offices, our partners in the UN, related organizations such as OECD, and other relevant partners to build capacity for the collection, management, and proper sharing of data related to trafficking in persons and more broadly, migrants in vulnerable situations. Thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, thank you for your for your intervention. Data save lives. I'd like actually to, to mention this important point you made. Thank you for mentioning uh, how important it is to standardize data, uh, to actually do a better service in understanding what are the issues and that to intervene. But also I think the important point you mentioned is also that some of these data are very sensitive. So data man management is also an extremely important uh, issue that we have to address. Thank you to all the four panelists for their sort of opening remarks. I'd like to have a second round. I'd ask all my panelists to be concise because definitely I would like also to open the floor and to hear from you to get your questions. So I'd like to start uh, with you, Tarek. Uh, in your opening remarks, you have stressed some of the important positive steps both in terms of the legislation, uh, the uh, recommendation, the greater collaboration we do observe. But of course, I think the question to you is that what do you think is the most important challenge in monitoring people in need of international protection? How can host countries and other stakeholders better support your work on UNHCR in the context of the Global Compact on Refugees? Thank you very much, Stefano, for a very important and pertinent question. Let me, let me step out a bit for a second and say, imagine you go to a bookstore and you find a cookbook and you find a dish that is particularly of interest to you. You look at the ingredients and then you say, this is probably gonna taste extremely well based on what you have seen in a cookbook and something similar then. And then you try it out and then you realize it may actually not taste the way you had expected it to be. In statistics, it's somehow similar. You get a statistical framework which provides the concept behind how to count, for example, refugees or internally displaced persons, because it has been adopted by the Stats Commission in New York. And then you are in National Statistical Office, you're trying to implement what has been said in theory. And then the practice kicks in, and then you realize actually it's not as easy as the book says it should be. And so that's a, that's a challenge and that's a dilemma we are all facing when you talk about theoretical frameworks, which is great to have, and I'm the first one to sign off on it, but the challenge is how to implement them in practice and how those implementations then eventually make a difference in the lives of refugees and other displaced populations in the world. So, and this is something we've been facing. We as UNHCR, we as humanitarian community, we as wider statistical community across the board. And it, it does not only apply to the refugee sort of dimension, but also applies obviously to other frame, statistical frameworks as well. So that's, I would say, is, it's an important challenge because when, when, when the international recommendations on refugee statistics were adopted in 2018, I got tons of questions back then and people thought this is a revolution and tomorrow everything is changing. But we know this is a long-term perspective. We have to keep in mind, it takes time to change frameworks, to implement frameworks and actually understand what those frameworks actually constitute. So my aim was always think about long-term perspectives. Hopefully our kids will be there when everything will be internationally comparable in terms of refugee and displacement statistics. We're not there yet. And this is what I would constitute a very important challenge. And let me give you one more example, because my colleague from Spain has mentioned the Ukrainian situation, or Ukrainian refugees. At the outflow of, uh, at the outbreak of the war in, in Ukraine, and when millions of Ukrainians crossed the border into various parts of Europe, uh, the first question is, of course, is how many are, are they? 
and everybody spoke about Ukrainian refugees, which is absolutely the right term to use. From a statistical point of view, it's not as easy because then you have Ukrainians who crossed the border and applied for temporary protection in certain countries. You had Ukrainians who applied for asylum to go to a formal asylum process and wait for an outcome of a determination of an asylum process. That's the second category. And the third one is, of course, those who did neither nor and they applied for something else. Could be family reunification because they had Ukrainian families somewhere across Europe. They applied for student visas, uh, work permits, etc. So where we don't even know that they have international protection needs, but by default they would have because Ukraine is a situation of conflict. So from a statistical point of view, that's a challenge. It is everybody's a refugee and I fully subscribe to it. But from a statistical point of view is you have to look at different databases, different data systems and try to find the integration. As Amparo rightly said before, how they were looking in Spain at different data sources to understand the situation of Ukrainians across the board. Last but not least, I try to be concise. I think one thing that is also close to my heart and that's to the, to the heart of UNHCR is data protection. We're talking about individuals here who are facing severe trauma, conflict, persecution, having gone through difficult journeys, journeys in, in many times. Data protection principles should always prevail over the thirst for data. That's my principle. And I'm counter kind of counterintuitively going against my own profession. As a chief statistician, of course, my goal is the best statistics on refugees and IDPs in the world. But if I had to make a choice between preserving the data protection and the principles of that protection of an individual against losing the level of information in the area of statistics, I would always go for the data protection angle. Example here, imagine a classroom, 30 children, one child is a refugee, 29 are not refugee children. What do we do? Do we go for the one refugee child in statistics or do we go forget about the one child in statistics and preserve the integrity of the classroom? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tarek. I think you said the good ingredients do not make a good dish. The recipe is what matters. And I think this says a lot about the way in which we use actually the data, not only to collect them, but actually make, make a good use of them. The example you gave about the Ukrainian and the fact that they actually are under different uh, systems. Uh, we all call them refugees, but I think uh, this points to the fact that we need really to have good collaboration, good dialogue between statisticians and of course to the policy maker, those who actually put action on the ground. And of course, thank you again uh, to remind all of us the importance of data protection. Sometimes we all would like to get the best possible data to be able to provide the best more possible sort of information. But on the other end, we have to protect the data on this vital, vital, um, this vital importance. Now, Amparo, I think from your first intervention, it's fair to say that uh, uh, Spain has made a tremendous progress in actually putting together data information on migration and integration. The question I have for you is uh, the political economy. How did you manage to get it done? Uh, what was the role of your minister, about your, your team, yourself, uh, but also the support you might have received also from the other stakeholders? There is a lot we can learn from the Spanish experience. Yes. Well, we were lucky in some sense because emergencies uh, always give the opportunity of uh, uh, getting people on board that otherwise wouldn't be uh, so open to collaborate. So emergencies are always an opportunity in order to improve data in my experience. On the other hand, as I said, the fact that we are statistical unit gives you some advantage for sure. But it's also true that you need to have an open mind and you need to make your data or your service or your acti statistical activity helpful to other people. So it's important that you think the best way data can serve those who are working with migrants. Mm. It's not for the sake of statistical uh, presentations that we collect data, it's in order to improve you, to, to, to provide the service you are providing in a better way. And you need to be at the service of these other units in order to make them aware on how data can actually uh, be helpful for them as well. Sometimes you won't be able to publish it. Sometimes will be only for internal uh, goals that you collect the data or that you analyze the data, but uh, you need to have a team that is truly multidisciplinary. 
So we do have statisticians for sure, but we have legal experts on both uh, asylum and, uh, and immigration, because these are two di very different parts of the statistics we have to collect. We have IT engineers and some geographers, and then you always need someone with some experience in, in, in communications in order to be able to publish data in a way that they are made accessible to different publics. And this is, I think it's something very important that I wanted to emphasize before, that I think apart from taking the advantage that emergency offer for start collecting data in a way that probably we never did before, I think we shouldn't underestimate uh, pilot studies. Something we have done in many cases is to start with a very relatively small group, uh, little experience, and then if it works, we start thinking how to extend it to the rest of migrant population for which we have data on Spain. So the case of the Ukrainians, for instance, was important in that sense because we linked their, their information with the social security in order to be able to trace or to follow up their integration into the labor market. But what we did, as uh, Tareka was suggesting before, is we collected the information for all the Ukrainians in Spain. We had a large uh, pre-existing community of Ukrainians in Spain. So the statistics are published in order to be able to compare the recent refugees uh, having temporary protection with the pre-existing Ukrainian economic migrant community that we had. So we can compare whether they are integrated in the same sectors because they already have networks that we they can access to or because they have completely different legal status and they came in a completely different socioeconomic context they started integrating in in different in different ways and it is always by comparison that we learn the most and this is what we are trying to do, to use like a little experiences in order to, to see whether it makes sense and it's worth to extend it to the study of the rest of uh, immigrant population that we have in the country. It's true that being statistical unit helps a lot, but there are many data that are not our property in the ministry that are uh, scattered in other, sorry, in other ministries. Uh, because in Spain, the competence or for, for, for migration policy is very much divided between the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Social Affairs, the Ministry of Inclusion in our case, and uh, we also have to relate with the region. So it's always complicated to get the perfect and complete view of uh, the, the, the population that you want to study, but uh, you start building up some sort of partnerships. Some works better than others. And you try to make progress with those who want to collaborate and basic basic and probably the most most crucial point for us has been to make always to publish something you need to make something public you need to 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 make people aware of what you are working for for and what are you using the the taxpayer money for and uh, you also create the need for the data and you also learned a lot for for, for the comments or the requests that you receive through the website or through different conferences or different meetings with other uh, civil servants on how you could improve the data or how you could uh, make them more useful for other uh, institutions that are looking at uh, your website and you didn't know before. So I think these are basically the experiences. Thank you, thank you so much Amparo. I think a number of very important points. So first of all, when we think about data, make sure we keep in mind how useful this data will be for those who actually are dealing with migrants. The second very important point, I can't agree more, multidisciplinarity. I think in the work you have done, also bring all the different kinds of expertise in order to make sure not only you're putting together the right data, but also you put them for the great, for the good use. The other important point is accessibility and actually make them public. So actually involve to some extent the public in the way in which you use this data. And since we are also exploring different ways to put together different data set, the, the use of pilot, I think this was a very important point you made. Inkeri, I'd like to, to go back to you. Of course, uh, uh, the point you made before is very clear that we need to do much, much better to get data on gender-based violence against uh, migrant women. The question to you is that how can we improve the collection of data and how the international community can help in this front? Yes, thank you so much. I think it's a very, very important question. And um, earlier I highlighted the lack of data. 
Um, and that this really needs to change uh, in, in order to uh, address this uh, issue of gender-based violence. Um, um, but in order to make that change, uh, we need to first of all understand why data on GBV is so limited uh, against like women and girls. So um, I put together five key points that I'd like to share. Uh, first of all, the very sensitive nature of violence against women and girls poses a number of methodological and ethical challenges. While yes, there are international protocols um, that are available to mitigate these challenges, um, it also requires political will and technical and financial capacity. Secondly, data collection instruments on GBV where they exist are often designed to assess prevalence at an aggregate level with sampling methodology that cannot easily accommodate extensive subgroup analysis, including on migrant women. And thirdly, migrant women in vulnerable situations, such as live-in domestic uh, workers, migrants in transit, those in an irregular situation, and migrant, uh, migrant workers in the informal economy, may be more at risk of GBV, but are often isolated and very difficult to reach for data collection purposes. Fourth, migrant women must feel comfortable disclosing sensitive information during data collection, which is often challenging given the social stigma and the shame attached to GBV in many countries. And in addition to that, many migrants are actually reluctant to seek services for fear of arrest and deportation. And fifthly, fifth, um, which was also pointed out by Michelle, um, there is a lack of standardization in GBV terminology, data collection tools and incident classification, and a lack of uniformity in how and in what data are collected across governments, international organizations, and civil society organizations, making comparisons and summaries indeed very challenging. So now we know the challenges, but what can we do now um, based on uh, this understanding to concretely improve the reporting information system on GBV against migrant women and girls? Um, firstly, it's, it's essential to increase the collection, analysis, and dissemination of sex disaggregated data and gender statistics on GBV against migrants through a combination of prevalence data, administrative data, and qualitative data, as on their own, they generate a limited picture of the experiences of GBV against migrants. In addition, it is critical to ensure that safety, confidentiality, and privacy of migrant women survivors of GBV um, is guaranteed, and that adequate support services are offered to them. It is never recommended to collect information about a GBV survivor's migration document, documentation status because that can put them at risk. Some data points that could be safely collected instead are, for example, country of origin, country of citizenship, and geographical reference. In addition, it's critical to standardize GBV terminology, data collection tools, and incident classification to harmonize data and comparability across studies and regions. And finally, it is vital to ensure that all measures and instruments for data collection, storage, sharing, and dissemination are conducted in a legal, ethical, gender responsive, and human rights, human rights based manner in accordance with international standards on privacy and confidentiality. And of course, this requires extensive training of researchers. And before concluding, I'd like to share um, some good practice, practices that UN Women has put in place um, and um, that you know, um, may fill an important uh, gap. So as part of the Germany funded, funded Making Migration Safe for Women program, UN Women piloted a survey instrument on the experiences of women migrating to, through, and from Niger, together with the National Institute of Statistics in Niger and IOM. Currently, a larger study is being carried out with 1,200 uh, 1, respondents to collect quantitative information on migrant women in Niger, which also includes um, gender-based violence. And this survey aims, aims to increase the evidence base, which in turn can inform policy making as well as service design and delivery for women in migrant women in Niger. We will shortly launch a how-to guide on collecting data on migrant women, 
in order to um, enable replication of this initiative in other countries. Because to our knowledge, um, this study um, has never been done in any uh, countries and in fact is a very pioneering effort to better understand the experiences of migrant women. In addition to that, we are also planning to carry out a global study on the experiences of migrant women, which will also include GBV. And this study will for, fill in a very important and critical gap in terms of gender statistics in the context of migration. So to conclude, data is highly important to support efforts to end violence against migrant women and girls, such as developing evidence-based evidence laws, um, policies and programs um, for improving the quality and availability of essential services and increasing the protection of survivors and the prosecution of perpetrators. Data collection on GBV against migrants is urgent and requires political will, adequate resource al allocation, and the active involvement of all stakeholders, including service providers in the health, the police, and justice, and the social services sectors, as well as policymakers, national statistical officers, civil society organizations, including women's organizations, and development partners. So we cannot hope to eliminate the pervasive horror of GBV against migrant women and girls without better data collection and analysis. And in fact, this is key to ending this human rights violation once and for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Inkeri. I think uh, we all know how difficult it is to collect any data on gender-based violence in general, and specifically, of course, for migrant women. But thank you so much for being very concrete in terms of the challenges, but also some of the way to, to, to try to make, uh, make progress. Combine the data, I think this is an issue that has resonated throughout our discussion. Make sure that we bring all the different uh, stakeholders, the safety and confidentiality, the standardization of data, uh, of course, the training of researchers to make sure we can respect the legal, of course, the human, right, uh, human rights. Uh, and thank you also for sharing the good practice, the example. We very much look forward to get the how-to guide uh, on, on that particular issue. Michelle, let me uh, come to you. Uh, I think I'd like to ask you really, uh, what are the lessons we can learn from uh, interagency work, in particular the interagency coordination platform for refugees and migrants for Venezuela. And the question is really, can this be replicated also in other regions? Thanks very much for the question. And I must say it's one we ask ourselves every day. <laughs> and so um, we are still learning the lessons from the R4D platform. It's an extraordinary effort, interagency effort. Of course, it's co-led by IOM and UNHCR but many other agencies participate, as well as more than 200 civil society organizations. Now, it, of course, it has multiple aspects to it, not all related to data, uh, but the data component is, is quite a significant one. And we are asking ourselves that question about could many of the lessons learned from this R4B experience in bringing together so many different stakeholders, governments, UN and other international organizations, civil society organizations, researchers, to focus on a particular population in a particular set of vulnerable circumstances, but a population that's enormously large because there are more than 6 million Venezuelans outside of their own country. And, um, and their circumstances vary significantly depending on where they are located. As just one example, in, in South America, I wanna congratulate many of the governments in South America who have worked really very hard to develop programs and policies to facilitate at least temporary, if not permanent regularization of status and socioeconomic integration of Venezuelans, at least for the time being where it's simply not possible to go back in large numbers to Venezuela. In Central America, we're seeing a very different dynamic. And some of this has um, is particularly challenging sitting where I'm sitting today in Panama. This is not my usual location, but I'm in Panama. And I heard from the Panamanian government this morning um, about the challenges that they've seen with 
more than 260,000 Venez largely Venezuelan migrants crossing the tremendously dangerous Darien Gap between Colombia and Panama last year. And with a view toward continuing their irregular migrant uh, journey on most with the destination of the United States as their ultimate goal. Now those situations are very different. And so uh, we're talking about millions in, in hosted by this very generously by the countries in South America. And now in Central America, we're seeing um, an extraordinary increase in the number of Venezuelans on the move in extraordinary vulnerable situation. And I sit normally in Costa Rica, and I can tell you today, on nearly every street corner, there is a Venezuelan family standing with a sign and a flag asking for help. They have no resources, they have no support, they don't know where to turn. Now, your question is an important one. What can we, I, I have seen and can attest to the tremendous benefits of having multi-layered mechanisms, so an intergovernmental process, an interagency process, and an inclusive space that brings in civil society actors of all different kinds to share their experiences, to share their data, to share their challenges, to identify their needs with a view toward creating a collective analysis that is updated very regularly about trends, patterns, situations, needs, and that is then translated very specifically into a coordinated appeal for resources. And so this is an interesting example of how the international community can work together to address a particular situation of migrants and refugees who are highly vulnerable and to you bring that multidisciplinary expertise and multifaceted, multi-level um, local governments, national governments, and all the other stakeholders that I mentioned to you together with a view toward, and I think this is, this is fundamental and I believe was underscored in the main plenary this morning, that remember that behind every data, every piece of statistic is a human being a human being with needs, desires, goals, aspirations. And so, so we're not looking at collecting data just for the sake of collecting data, but actually to improve uh, the situation of individuals. And I think this example of the R4B platform does a good job of pulling together from multiple sources, um, very granular information, and then translating that into a collective appeal for resources that is then distributed in many countries throughout the region and for multiple purposes based on some of the uh, criteria that um, we looked at. Now, whether that can be and how that can be replicated in other situations is precisely the question that we are looking at now. This is a particular situation where it's a population and oftentimes in migratory movements, it's not just one nationality, but, but mixed movements of many different people. And, I, and let me say in the Darien Gap, again, where I'm sitting in Panama today, it's not just Venezuelans who are coming through, although predominantly Venezuelans. But last year, I think there were over um, individuals of more than 95 nationalities coming through a really treacherous place. So how do you how do you translate the lessons learned? I can tell you right now, we're expanding the R4B platform to look at vulnerabilities of at least four other, three other nationalities, Cubans, Haitians, and Nicaraguans. So not the platform itself, but some of the mechanisms that were used there. So technically the platform of course is focused on Venezuelans as it should be. But using the mechanisms that have been developed, we are now tracking the movements and the vulnerabilities and the intentions of nationals of Cuba, Nicaragua, and Haiti as well. So that's a very concrete um, measure. It's just, it's new. And we haven't yet seen what the results will be, but we are utilizing that basis that was created 
And I think it is, it, the, the R4V platform is, as part of its work, doing fundamental lessons learned as they go to see exactly uh, what you've asked. How could this be adapted or what elements could be adapted and what are some of the key lessons learned to be able to use in other situations? Not only national specific, meaning one nationality when there's a large outflow, obviously UNHCR has a lot of experience that with, with refugee flows from a particular country, so do we including in internal displacement situations. We have a lot of experience with that, everywhere from Afghanistan to Iraq to uh, uh, Haiti to Mexico to so many other countries. Uh, but how do, you do, how do you use these same very productive tools and mechanisms and lessons learned from the R4B situation to more typical migratory situations where it's not limited to one particular nationality nor to one particular route. And, and I think that's an interesting challenge for us and one I, I expect we'll be spending quite a bit of time and energy focusing on. But the commitment to, I mean, the commitment, and I think what Inkara said at, at the end was very important. You need the political will of the governments, without a doubt, that is essential. You need inclusive approaches that bring multidisciplinary as well as multi-actor um, um, participants to bear. That's a key, uh, by the way, key value in the Global Compact for Migration. It talks about whole of government and whole of society approaches. Those are fundamental principles. And I think this is a good example of how those can be applied. I fully subscribe, we all fully subscribe to that idea. And then translating that data collection, that, that analysis into action, into actually informing governmental decision-making in, in informing humanitarian response, development response, and concrete action on the ground that really does make a difference in migrants' lives with a view toward, um, in the first instance, of course, saving lives, but secondly, working toward reducing vulnerability in the first place. And, and I think a lot of data and analysis can be done and is being done to try to address some of the root causes of vulnerability with a view toward very, very granular interventions based on data collection. And just to give you one last example, for in Guatemala right now, we're working with the government, but on a program that is addressed to look at the hyper local level, what are the drivers of irregular migration with a view toward and working with indigenous populations and others to inform that and local mayors and, and, and local groups with a view toward then hearing directly from those stakeholders, what would make the difference? What would they need in order to feel that they can remain safely at home and don't need to undertake a, a dangerous irregular journey? So this is some of the directions that I think uh, we can go in. Thank you very much for the question. No, thank you, Michelle. I think uh, uh, the lessons learned from the R4B coordination platform are extremely interesting. You pointed out that uh, each situation is somewhat different, but I think the point you're making about the fact that this may actually help for these lessons also for other crises you are facing in the region, but certain there are very important lessons that would be useful also for crises in other parts of the world. I think I'd really like to underline the fact of the political will and the commitment of different stakeholders as a key ingredient for making sure that the coordination platform actually delivered. And indeed that we do have a number of legislative framework out there that actually can help uh, this process of coordination and also to bring the political will with that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm conscious of time, but definitely I would like to open the floor. So I'd like to uh, see if there are questions so to our panelists. If there are questions, please introduce yourself. Keep the question very short. We don't have a lot of time and I'd like to hear for as many as you. So who want to raise a question, make a comment? I'm looking around over there, please. Can you introduce yourself, please? Hello, uh, my name is Rebecca Napier-Moore from the ILO Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. I have a question for Ms. Ferrer. Um, I found it very interesting that you talked about collecting data on irregular migrants. And I wanted to know, 
how you work to make people feel safe enough to speak. And then as we've been discussing, how you put in safeguards for data management. Thank you. Other questions? Over there, please. Sí, muchas gracias. Eh, atendiendo su, su exposición, eh, al final aclara que no son solo venezolanos, habla de 97 nacionalidades. Pero de las más de 16 nacionalidades latinoamericanas y caribeñas que transitan, por ejemplo, por el Golfo de Darien, solo dos países están bloqueados. Los otros 15 no están bloqueados. Aclaro que, aclaro que no hay impedimento alguno, porque a veces tiende a creerse es que por razones políticas o de acosos políticos, etcétera, en Venezuela no se le permite el retorno. Esto no es así. En Venezuela, todo el que sale puede entrar. Todo el que sale puede entrar. Y tanto que el gobierno apoya con las operaciones gratuitas de la, de la operación Vuelta a la Patria Gratuita y Segura. Y con esto ocurre algo curioso también, que gran cantidad de gobiernos no permiten que el gobierno venezolano conduzca acciones de retorno a nuestro país. Es decir, el gobierno venezolano ofrece aviones permanentes todas las semanas gratuitos y hasta hoy en Latinoamérica solamente cuatro países están permitiendo la operación de la aerolínea estatal con Viasa para que los venezolanos regresen a nuestro país. Y a propósito de la, de la oferta de colaboración, Venezuela le ha propuesto a ACNUR y a la OIM que colaboren. Que colaboren. No vemos por qué, por ejemplo, y se les ha ofrecido que el Estado venezolano coloque a disposición de la OIM y ACNUR los aviones para que los venezolanos regresen y no tenemos respuesta, ni siquiera para combustible, ni siquiera para pago de, de tasas en aeropuertos, etc. Entonces, Solicitamos a usted que, que bien nos ha ilustrado sobre esto, que colaboren, que cooperen, como se lo hemos pedido. Muchas gracias. Sí. Thank you, thank you very much. And the last call for questions. No. Why don't I then go back to our panelists? So the first question from the ILO and then the second question from the Venezuelan colleague who want to take the first one on the yellow. Yeah, very briefly. In Spain, we have a, a double situation with regard to irregular migration. We have the port that arrives by boat, which is the most vulnerable. And then we have a much bigger part that come by plane. If we focus on those who come by boat, they are immediately assisted in the coast uh, by Red Cross in cooperation with our ministry. Then they go to the police station that is nearby and they need to be registered uh, in less than three days. And after this time, uh, the police call the reception services from the inclusion ministry, from the migration ministry, and they are uh, taken, transferred to reception facilities that we call humanitarian reception facilities. And they have the right to be there up to three months in principle, unless they are in a very, very vulnerable situation, they can't stand it. And uh, so most of those that arrive by boat are immediately identified by the, by the police and the, and the reception authorities. And in that case, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's compulsory for them to, to give some basic information uh, to the police and the police share the information in the, in, the, in the common database for all foreigners that we have. So we know that they arrive in an irregular situation because after time we have their personal identification as persons who came to our reception facilities within the humanitarian network, which is the network for irregular migrants. For those who come by plane, we don't have the immediate identification of this irregular migration, but we deduce it 
uh, deduce it afterwards when we compare the data from the municipal register census, where they are very much interested in registering, even if they don't have the, the proper papers, the proper permits, because this is uh, the registration that gives you access to public health, which is let's say universal in Spain, even if you are an irregular migrant, or to public uh, education for your children. And uh, in the past, and to some extent also today, it, it is the best way of proving for how long you have been irregular in the country in order to access to any type of regularization process that are available from time to time, or to access to, to a potential residence permit if you meet some conditions. So we have two ways to access them, one of them is immediately, and they feel safe because uh, we are the ones providing accommodation for them instead of spelling them immediately from the country. This is something that goes for, 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 the, for the border police, which is a different authority, and they don't identify migration ministry with police. They, it's very clear in their mind that they are playing different roles after a few days. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amparo. Uh, the second question, I don't know, Michelle, if you would like to address it. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I quite agree with the statement of, of the individual. I'm, I'm not sure where he was from, um, but uh, you're right that the, in the Varian Gap, uh, it is by no means only Venezuelan nationals who are transiting. And in 2021, <clears throat> Only 2% of those who transited through the Darien Gap were of Venezuelan nationality. In fact, Haitian nationals were the largest group. But as I said, there was more than 90 nationalities of, of people going through there. I've spent quite a bit of time in the Darien and have seen people from as far away as Bangladesh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Turkmenistan, uh, and um, various different parts of, of Africa. It's quite, it's quite striking um, to see this route that is pure jungle and extraordinarily dangerous being used. With respect to the comment about UNHCR and IOM <clears throat> collaborating on returns, let me be very clear from IOM's perspective. We have never stopped or opposed providing the assistance that we can to vulnerable migrants who choose to go home voluntarily. As many know, uh, a key question that, uh, or a key area that IOM works in is offering assisted voluntary return to individuals who lack the means to return to their countries of origin and who genuinely choose to do so voluntarily. That is equally applicable um, to nationals of Venezuela. And in the current, um, over the last few years, we have not had many requests for return to Venezuela, but the number of requests has gone up uh, in, in the last six months. And we are working to facilitate the safe and orderly and voluntary return to Venezuela of vulnerable migrants who have no other means to do so. That is a complement to and not a substitute for, obviously it is not, not related directly to the program that the representative of the government of Venezuela mentioned. Uh, we don't take over the role of governments working in this area. Uh, we do not pretend to substitute for governments, but we offer service for migrants who are truly vulnerable and wish to go home and lack the means to do so. So let me clarify that. And we are in fact assisting small numbers of Venezuelans who are quite vulnerable and lack the means to return on their own. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very, very much, Michelle. These uh, ladies and gentlemen bring us uh, to the end of this panel, but before closing, I really would like to go to give the floor back to our four panelists for a one minute final uh, observation you'd like to share with all of us. So we'll go in the same order, Tarek, I will start with you. 60 seconds, sounds almost like hashtag something, something. <laughs> um, I think what is what I can see is that a lot of progress has been made, as I mentioned earlier in the, during this panel uh, session, 
still much more has to be done. Many more have to be engaged from the statistical community to make actually a difference in the life of refugees and other displaced populations, including status population. But I think the statistical community has lived up to its expectation, considering where we came from more than a decade ago, which was hardly existent in the humanitarian space, we have gone a far way. And I think I'm very optimistic about the next decade and the next, the fourth or the fifth IFMS will demonstrate how far we have come as a community. And on that one, I would like to end, it has to end on a positive note. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also appreciate the closing positive note. Amparo, over to you. Thank you. I very much agree with Tarek. I think that we have done a huge progress over the last decades in terms of statistics and data availability in, in migration area. And I would say, don't lose your hope and be positive and believe in tiny things because at some point they become big. Thank you so much. And uh, Inkeri, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, in terms of the collection of uh, data on GBV against migrant women and girls, the progress has unfortunately not been that great over the last 10 years. And I think uh, the call um, to action is now. And there are ways of collecting uh, data in a, um, in a survivor and orientated human rights based and gender responsive manner. Um, I outlined how this data can be collected. And I think it's what really is key now is political will, um, as well as the necessary resources to carry out this, uh, this research and make it available. And, um, and yes, the time is now, as I said, we can do it together um, if we want to. And um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Inkeri. And last but certainly not least, Michelle, over to you. Thank you so much. So I will, uh, in the tradition of IOM's former director general, make three quick points, always three. The first is keep the person at the center of our consideration, their needs, their vulnerabilities, and, and that never forget who we are focusing on and what we're trying to achieve. Second is ensure whole of government and whole of society approaches we need all of the stakeholders at the table. And third, echoing what Inkeri just said, is it's critical to maintain the political will and commitment to moving forward. And I believe that fora like this one, the IFMS, do exactly that. So thank you all for the commitment and showing that by showing up today. And we're committed to continuing with you. Thank you very much. And thanks to you, Michelle. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we close this panel. Please join me in a round of applause for our four fantastic panelists. And, and thanks to all of you. I think now we have a coffee break and we resume in about 25 minutes. Thank you.
afternoon, Miss Susana. Can you hear me? Could would you please open the camera and the audio to test it, please? Hello, yes, I can hear you. Perfect, we can hear you clear too. Perfect, thank you. Thanks to you.
hi everyone maybe also to mention for those online we'll wait a couple more minutes uh, for a couple more people to come in for the session and then we'll start Good afternoon, everyone um, here in the room and also uh, online. Thank you for joining us. My name is Susanna Melder. I'm a Regional Knowledge Management Officer of IOM in the Regional Office for South America. And I would like to welcome you to this session on environmental migration data for policymaking, experiences and innovation in Latin America. Just to mention, uh, this is my third IFMS, and each time uh, we have organized a session on this important topic, how human mobility is linked to environmental and climate change uh, and disasters. We started discussing more you know, from an academic point of view on methodologies, on big data. So for instance, in the case of Haiti and the devastating earthquake of 2010, it was for the first time that um, they were using call detail records. So when you uh, actually you know, are in a place, for instance, in that case, in the capital, Port-au-Prince, and then after the disaster, after the earthquake, people logged in uh, with their phone, uh, let's say five kilometers outside of Port-au-Prince, uh, that's how you can know where people were displaced to. Because often what happens when disaster strikes 
is uh, that you don't really know, you know, where did people go, who is affected. We also talked about um, forecasts, we talked about knowledge management, uh, or how can we share all the information we already know. Those of us who've worked on this topic for a long time, we know, you know, there's a lot of data on internal displacement. Uh, so, for instance, in um, the Americas in 2021, the last year where we have estimates, um, 1.7 million people were displaced by disasters. That's a lot more than uh, uh, due to conflict. But we know a lot less about those who move across international borders um, and, and other aspects. And so how do we share this information? And today we're taking it a step further. We're looking at some of uh, the innovative uh, forecasting and modeling approaches. Uh, so, you know, what do we know about uh, 2050 and 10, 20, 30 uh, years? but also looking at uh, some good practices in, in also using other data sources. Uh, often we've heard during the day today that you know, there's a wealth of information uh, and often we can use those existing data sources, maybe making a few tweaks. And we'll hear about uh, one example from the Caribbean and on how some of these other data sources on, on climate data um, can really help us to understand uh, movements, but also what can we actually do about it? And so this session is really great because it brings together not just representatives from statistical offices, but also from other parts of government um, and the work uh, they do. We know, you know, uh, and the environment, climate change are key considerations in global frameworks like the Global Compact on Migration, the Sendai Framework on Disaster Risk Reduction, and countries in the region are doing uh, a lot. So I think, uh, and more can be done. So we're looking at, at those structures. So what we're going to do in this session, uh, we have four uh, speakers. Um, they'll present for about uh, 10 minutes each, then I'll, I'll ask them a question. And then uh, I invite you to, to ask them anything uh, you would like to know. We will start with uh, Susana Adamo, who's joining us online. Um, she's a scientific researcher and associate uh, professor of climate at the Center for International Earth Science Information Network at the Columbia Climate School at Columbia University in the US. So Susana, um, the floor is yours to look at uh, modeling and tell us a bit more uh, what you have done there. Well, thank you, uh, Susanna. Uh, I'm going to uh, pretend in Spanish and I'm going to share my screen now. Can you see my, my screen now? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, bien, como entonces decía Susanne, te voy a, voy a presentar sobre modelos de migración climática para proyectar el impacto de peligros ambientales sobre la movilidad de la población. On the population mobility, and I will do this uh, based on two reports uh, that we have um, issued in the past few years. So one is the Groundswell One from the World Bank, and the other one is a report on uh, climate migration and cities in Latin America, in Central America, prepared for the Mayo immigration and some comments and recommendations. And I would like to highlight that this is uh, teamwork, obviously, and has been directed uh, primarily by Alex uh, de Sherbinin and also other collaborators. Beginning with the uh, groundswell, this is an approach based on scenarios uh, to model uh, domestic uh, climate migration. And this is work done collabor collaboratively between the World Bank, Columbia University, uh, the City University of New York, and the Potsdam Institute uh, for Climate Impact Research. And what the report does is to uh, think about uh, impact in the future, slow evolving impacts are related to global climate change, uh, such as uh, the change in the availability of water and uh, agricultural productivity, and also the mean uh, increase in the level in the sea levels and how these changes can have an impact in the future upon the population of a country and uh, by extension, uh, 
an impact on domestic uh, migration and therefore the focus is on climate on long ter longer term climate change uh, and uh, and migration and mobility also in the long term but we're not talking here on the, in the short term in either case this approach uh, deals with two scenarios a reference scenario which is called a pessimistic scenario with high levels of greenhouse effect uh, gases uh, and uh, with uh, development problems and uh, two alternative scenarios, one with a more inclusive development and one in involving a development uh, with a greater control of emissions. And what the model does is to integrate uh, data from different sources in a raster uh, with a resolution of 14 kilometers. Uh, the data sources include a few global future scenarios uh, the shared uh, socio-economic uh, histories, uh, SSPs, and uh, the uh, trajectory of representative uh, concentrations, RCPs, as its acronym uh, states in English. And this combination uh, is something that you can see on the table, and we basically have three, the three scenarios we mentioned beforehand. This was used uh, for a gravitational migration model, uh, and we added on top of that uh, local characteristics, uh, including uh, the impacts of uh, climate change. Uh, an innovation that the model has is that uh, climate change is, are introduced uh, not based on uh, modifications in rainfall, temperature, and so on, but rather on the impact of these modifications and changes upon water resources and upon the performance of uh, selected uh, crops, and therefore use the impact of not so much the modification of uh, parameters. As uh, mentioned, uh, we use a gravitational modified migration model. And we use something that is called uh, the notion of uh, potential population. This is a mega measurement of uh, um, population weighted in terms of distance and represents uh, the relative accessibility to that specific uh, point uh, that could be translated into how attractive that point is uh, based uh, uh, based on uh, the number of population that it has. Uh, we have a spatial selection. Uh, the agglomeration of the population and after that environmental change as uh, a modification to the different uh, assets that those uh, cities have uh, the slide shows other technical elements that you if you're interested you may review in uh, the report uh, that is uh, that was mentioned so now these are the general results based on the application of this model for Latin America. And uh, this is a result of scenarios uh, for 2050 and also for the three different uh, scenarios. And then on the numbers that we see here, we see that there's very 10.6 million in the case of a pessimistic scenario to 5.8 million uh, for a more, uh, 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 a more climate-friendly scenario. Also bearing in mind the changes or variations in terms of results, this could actually reach a total of 17.1 million or all the way down to 2.2 million. So in addition to the fact that reducing emissions is important, because that is actually what the more climate friendly scenario represents, we also need to bear in mind that the more inclusive development scenario also refers to significant uh, differences when compared to the pessimistic scenario. So the changes are important. The differences are important. Here, I'm showing another example of the select results for Paraguay. We are looking at the localization of critical points or hotspots of immigration and migration triggered by climate change. And we can see that 
that these hot spots are key areas. And in terms of this, the, the, the trend is shown up until 2050 as well in the southeastern part. And then the central part, it's a north-south route. And this, these results for Paraguay also include a series of maps that you can see on the screen as well. Now, to the left of the screen, we can see information showing the various uh, projections and how they evolve from 2020 to 2050. And uh, this information refers to climate migrants, climate migrant figures for each scenario and the various differences from one scenario to the next. Now, let me refer to climate migration and cities in Central America. Here we have a modified version of the groundswell model used with greater resolution and the combination of the three SSPs and three RCPs uh, with five scenarios. It also adds the use of water resources and adds information with regard to urban centers. And this, uh, the results have also been, our uh, aggregate results for urban centers identified using the degree of representation for the Joint Research Center. Now here we can see that this is climate migration related to the dense urban centers on the left and less dense centers, low density centers on the right. We can see that lower emissions correspond to lower migration rates, and these are in the regional urban centers. And also the rest of the categories show lower emissions levels as well. When we apply this to the various territories, you can also see spatial distribution of the changes. And what the maps are showing are the differences in population when you compare future scenarios showing or not showing the impact of climate change on migration for Mexico City and Guatemala City. Again, you can see differences depending on the scenario that you are studying. Now, I would like to quickly refer to the various attributes and limitations and positive aspects of these models. Now, by design, these models include uh, adaptation measures, such as improved varieties, irrigation, etc. And some of the limitations include uh, the fact that the models may be considered deterministic and also they tend to oversimplify risk. But in terms of positive aspects, these models are based on impacts on relevant areas instead of or as well as climate variables. And they are flexible in terms of scale and data inputs, as one can see in the model that was indicated for Mexico and Central America regarding urbanization. And finally, it's important to clearly understand that in no case the climate factors will be uh, the predominant determinants of human mobility and that climate migration, internal climate migration, actually could be, uh, maybe a reality, but it doesn't have to be a crisis as, soon, as long as you have an, an appropriate uh, climate change adaptation strategy. Uh, that uh, is also backed by appropriate development policies and specific investments. Also, it's important to understand migration as the population, wh why the population does not want to migrate. Now you can see that uh, the cities of the region need to be better prepared to receive more and new migrants. And we are actually working on developing better models that can uh, be more explicit and subjective so that the top-down approach can also include an interpretation of socio-cultural context. And then another key attribute is the intersectoral nature of all of this. 
and uh, then you can apply um, the potential impacts of climate change to the population distribution. For this very impressive presentation of you know, what, what can be done uh, with modeling and, and some of the data, but also what are some of the limitations uh, of this. Um, I would now like to pass the floor uh, to Mr. Dwayne Dick from uh, the National Statistics Office of the Commonwealth of Dominica. He's um, a statistician, has been for more than 15 years, um, is uh, working on a lot of different topics, as many of you, uh, I assume, in the National Statistical Offices, from demographics uh, to national surveys, and is the deputy census officer. So uh, very interesting profile. And he'll talk to us about um, an example from the Caribbean. Uh, that's very recent. Uh, Dwayne, please, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as, as Suzanne indicated, my name is Dwayne Dick. I'm from the Central Statistics Office. Um, I'm here to speak about the, the report on the uh, migration environment, um, disaster and climate data, sorry, in Eastern Caribbean. Thanks. Um, control. Excuse me. Some of the controls. Next slide, please. Yes, so the, this report was done um, by Diego um, Andrilla um, and the team from the, from the IOM. Uh, it was funded by the Federal um, Republic of Germany. Now, these islands, there were six islands in the Caribbean, there were um, in the Eastern Caribbean, sorry. Oh, okay, thank you. Six islands in the Eastern Caribbean were, um, were studied, Antigua, St. Kitts, Dominica, St. Lucia, uh, St. Vincent, and Grenada. And based on the findings, the, sorry, um, at, the C, at the central statistics offices, this is what the report, um, yes, at the CSOs, sorry, based on the findings, the data collection, um, on environmental impacts on the island and national statistics offices, right? For example, in Grenada, in the experience in terms of, um, are we using the correct one? Okay. The available, the available statistics on demographic data, that is what we at the CSO, we, but we do not calculate, we do not um, at the CSOs um, calculate information on um, migration data. It was very simple, just basic statistics. Okay, um, Dominica, St. Vincent and Grenada, and um, the Grenadians generate indicators on housing, right? And human settlements, right? And some general aspects of migration are gathered at it as part of the national censuses, but do not include data on climate and disaster related mobility. Right. Based on the data, oh, sorry, the, in Grenada, in the examples of data that was um, collected, sorry, in Grenada, the core welfare indicator uh, calculated, I mean, sorry, collected information on Hurricane Ivan in 2004 in terms of the displacement of the citizens. St. Kitts and Nevis, the, quest, the severe living condition, it collected the question and query, the reasons for returning to the country, which took the environment, took into consideration the environmental factors. In Dominica, the survey of living condition, uh, it included the environmental factors, the options presented as reasons for returning on the island, and so on. Identified data gaps. All six countries compile present. Um, statistics, however, I mean, we, we, we compile statistics, sorry, however, um, the data collected tend not to consider climate, as I said, in, uh, indicated earlier, environmental change and disaster dimensions of human mobility. All census questionnaires, they collect, uh, for the last censuses, right, they collect some information that is the um, international 
or internal migration, but not related to climate, climate um, change or environmental factors. And right, the lack of statistics, well, right? Sorry. Okay. So based on the recommendations that the that was um, brought before us, we seek to promote the statistics, the report, sorry, recommended that we promote the inclusion, sorry, of statistics on indicators on climate change and disasters in the cluster um, dealing with environment. We promote the, um, the collection of the disaggregated data on human mobility in a household surveys, the revision of forms, um, um, the revision of immigration forms. One of the things that we have been, that is very difficult for us at the, uh, the small island states, the modification of the immigration forms. Um, the, it takes, it, it's, it's quite expensive to, 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 uh, to change that form from the, from the um, immigration department. Um, that is one of the problems we're having, um, but that was one of the recommendations. Then we collect data on persons who are departing, who are departing, sorry, or emig emigrating due to environmental disaster place, um, displacement and establish or develop official rep um, repository on um, human mobility. Right. Now, based on the recommendations, the CSO, for example, in Dominica, and I think the core questionnaire for the Eastern Caribbean, or sorry, the CARICOM core questionnaire, we took into consideration for the recommendations and right now, like we are on the field doing the census and it collects a lot of information. Um, it collects information on mobility, um, internal migration, which is the traditional data we have been collected. Emigration, Dominica experienced three major shocks in the past decade, Hurricane Maria, um, a tropical storm um, Erica, and like everyone else, the COVID experience. So the, the, the census takes into consideration that information. The, the immigration, because we had, a, we had mass exodus during that time and the information, a lot of information was, was um, missed. So households will be questioned, households are being questioned on the persons who left their, 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 ex, their gender, um, the age, the sex, the, well, sorry, the um, education level, the occupation um, status, the reasons for their departure, be it, be it environmental reasons or, um, and, it, and another thing that guided us into developing that instrument was the SDGs. We try our best to collect base, base data and the census will provide that type of information for us. The other, the other um, immigration data, we, we are collecting information on persons who are here and who are in Dominica, sorry, and have returned or have returned, sorry, for environmental reasons. For, um, and not just environmental, for example, the, the pandemic, persons who return based on all these other factors, right? Okay. Yes, and the at the CSO, we, I mean, small the small island development states, we are trying our best to use the the geospatial data, and overlaying all the 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 geospatial information, the migration data on on hazard um hazard prone areas, right, and that is using the administrative maps, etc. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dwayne, for this really interesting example of how it's important to use, uh, you know, existing census uh, forms and surveys to integrate uh, the environment and climate aspects there, but at the same time also including human mobility aspects in, in you know, 
data collection tools on disaster impacts. And I found it really interesting, the example you mentioned about uh, modifying immigration forms, uh, what happens in the Caribbean when there's a disaster and people are displaced, obviously, you know, for them being island uh, states, um, people go to another island and cross an international border, but often that wasn't accounted for because the immigration reasons didn't don't really list uh, environmental or climate or disaster reasons. So there are tools available um, and with a bit of tweaks. I mean, you you, you mentioned the challenge, you know, the, the funding and so on, um, but there is some potential there. So we wanted to bring uh, this up. And it's also very interesting that you mentioned, you know, working with other uh, government um, entities uh, beyond national statistical offices uh, as migration as a very cross-cutting topic. And with that, I would like to lead uh, over to uh, the representative of Ecuador, um, Paula Echeverria, um, who is a, um, an environmental engineer. She has a master in oceanography um, and is representing the National Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology. And she's a specialist in forecasting and early warning. And she's going to talk about how uh, these kinds of uh, satellite images, Earth observations can help us uh, to actually, in, you know, prevent um, and reduce the risk of disaster displacement. Uh, Paula, the floor is yours. Buenas tardes con todos. Eh, bueno, primero, muchas gracias. Y qué gusto estar aquí compartiendo este espacio con ustedes. A pleasure to be sharing this uh, space uh, with you. I'll talk a little bit about the use of geospatial information at the National Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology of Ecuador, using the platform GeoGlose uh, to report on disasters and the potential potential usage of these tools in order to warn the population in uh, risk of being displaced. INAMI is uh, the institute or the entity uh, that is in charge of uh, providing timely warning to the population and uh, to the entities uh, that uh, conduct uh, risk management in Ecuador about the possible occurrence of adverse uh, effects, uh, strong rainfall, high temperatures, and so on. For this purpose, we have several tools, and one of these is the GeoGlose, where GeoGlose is a platform that contains, well, it's a an open source uh, um, uh, program that has uh, forecasts for hydrological and meteorological forecasts, and we can observe hydrometeor historical uh, hydrometeorological data for Ecuador and hydrological models, also satellite uh, data and also radar data. This platform contains 11 applications in all. Five have been uh, uh, tailored uh, for Ecuador with uh, the historical information that we have available. I would like to talk to you about the applications that are most commonly used by us uh, for uh, meteorological and hydrological forecasting. We have a, an application that is useful for the exploration, viewing, and the download of hydrological stations. So we have three applications, hydrological applications, for hydrological forecasts of both uh, uh, volume and uh, level of water, and a hydrological application that has also been tailored uh, for Ecuador and that contains uh, satellite data for uh, climatic and weather forecasts. And other applications involving data from uh, satellite sensors and other global models. As I said, uh, we are the entity that uh, generates uh, timely warnings uh, for decision making in the face of uh, the possible occurrence of uh, a disaster. The applications that are most commonly used in hydrology are these uh, three, HydroViewer, Historical Validation Tool, and the National Water Level Forecast. These uh, three applications, uh, or the interf their interface is very similar, but they do have certain differences. For example, in the first one, in the HydroViewer, we are able to obtain a forecast of uh, flows of all rivers at a national level for 15 days. And we also have a section to analyze whether there are uh, warnings uh, uh, warnings, uh, flood warnings uh, that could uh, be up to where the probability of that happening is up to 50 years. And secondly, we have the historical validation tool. There we can have a forecast of uh, river flows where we have a, an 
Kami station, in other words, the rivers that we monitor in our national network and in the national water network forecast that we can likewise uh, uh, conduct a forecast of uh, water levels in all the rivers that we have monitored, uh, that we monitor via our stations. The interface is very similar, and so this is basically what you are able to view in the application. So once we select uh, the point or the station in the river, uh, that we want to study. The first thing that is shown to us is the basic information of that point, uh, latitude, longitude, uh, elevation, the province, and so on. And in terms of the information that we're able to view on the left-hand side, on the left-hand side image, you have a hydrogram uh, that uh, shows uh, historical flows and uh, also a, a historical simulation of this data and the simulation with a corrected uh, bias. On uh, the right-hand side, you can see the forecast of a flow for a 15-day period with variations between top and minimum levels that have been forecasted and also a, an average of forecasted flow for 15 days and a high-resolution flow forecasted for a 10-day period. Uh, this has been done based on uh, 50, uh, 52 um assemblies for uh, for two five ten uh, 15 20 and 25 years and you can see the potential of these applications well first of all it uh, provides uh, tools uh, for simulation corrections and for the viewing of uh, warnings about uh, levels and uh, flows so you can also download uh, data of these simulations to conduct uh, subsequent uh, studies you can gain access uh, to the metrics of the simulation in order to know the performance uh, of these models and these results uh, may be applied in other strategic sector, sectors uh, such as uh, hydropower risk and uh, uh, drainage risk management uh, the control of water concessions and others and uh, they are also adequate uh, they, that is also adequate information for uh, research uh, since we also warn about uh, meteorological conditions and we conduct uh, weather and, and, clim and climate uh, forecasts. We use this application, which enables the exploration and download of spatial data from different uh, uh, predetermined uh, satellite libraries, such as CHIRPS, uh, CHIRTS, and GFS. And that has been tailored uh, for NINAMI as well. And we have included uh, data uh, for meteorological forecast of the numerical uh, model uh, WRF, which has a spatial scale of uh, uh, three kilometers and we can gain access to 18 variables and other applications that are also interesting in this uh, sphere is uh, the climate uh, trench which enables us to well it it, it can gain access to four uh, satellite uh, programs the uh, chips uh, chips and two others and uh, four meteorological variables uh, drainage temperature uh, soil temperature and evapotranspiration and this has a registry of uh, the past uh, 30 years in, of all these uh, four variables so with these products and one can compare a specific uh, period of interest and a special variable of interest and thus assess what has happened in previous years or what its behavior has looked like we are also we also have another application which is uh, the water mapping app which is useful in order to view historical um, floods based on uh, sentinel images so what this application does is that it identifies where points uh, for the accumulation of water in these images and it also enables us uh, to assess uh, the impact of these uh, that these floods have had upon the population and so on as I said, this uh, GeoGlosser tool has been tailored uh, for INAMI, and uh, we can also provide certain levels of access uh, to other institutions uh, that are in the field of research, hydroelectricity, uh, irrigation and agriculture, management of risks, uh, infrastructure, design of infrastructure, the management of um, uh, water resources and climate change. And within this platform, you also find technical and uh, user manuals uh, so that uh, interested uh, people may resort to them and an example of this is uh, for example what uh, has happened uh, with the autonomous decentralized government of the Imbaguda province located in the inter andean region of ecuador as you can see in the video between the 15th and 17th of may 2017 uh, there was uh, a large increase in the flow 
which led to floods and, and left more than 100 hectares impacted by that flow. Five houses destroyed and 50 damnified uh, persons. Now, at that time, we didn't have the GeoGlose platform in place, but now we are able to analyze uh, with a historical uh, records so that this type of event have been registered. For example, we can see an image on the bottom part that there was an accumulation of water since in the previous uh, in the days prior to 15th of May and between the 15th and 17th of May there was a peak in terms of the flow. That means uh, that these applications are able to help us warn the population in a timely manner, uh, thus uh, preventing disasters. Uh, Imbagura has. Uh, included this platform in its uh, comprehensive uh, risk management uh, uh, plan to prevent uh, losses. Another example is what happens in River Indag, where we have uh, human settlements very close to uh, the river sides. And in the case of the overflow of these uh, rivers, uh, uh, catastrophes may occur. The Laving Gavora is also implementing these uh, forecasting uh, tools uh, to be able to have uh, early warning if uh, there is a flood and uh, in order to adequately warn the population. That would be all. Thank you. Interesting presentation on how satellite images can be used uh, for forecasts um, like water levels floods, and be integrated in disaster reduction plans. That's a nice a uh, segue into the next uh, intervention by um, Luis Donias, who is the coordinator of the Intersectoral Coordination Unit and Foreign Affairs Liaison at Chile's National Disaster Prevention and Response Service, uh, and, uh, you know, as an acronym. And he is, has the role of advisor of humanitarian affairs, he's a human rights uh, focal point and coordinator of vulnerability disasters and climate change issues for Chile's national platform for disaster risk reduction. And he's going to speak to us about a very concrete example of um, not the Dominican Republic, but Chile, <laughs> and uh, about how the national guidelines on disaster displacement can be built and how uh, cooperation among different entities. Um, can be done. This is not the correct presentation. Yeah. Maybe you can say a few words uh, of yeah. opening while we're figuring out uh, where your presentation is. Right. Sure, thanks, Susan. Um, while we wait for the correct presentation to emerge there, um, just not to make a mess with our kind interpreters, uh, I'm going to conduct my presentation in Spanish. I'm going to conduct in Spanish, but of course, I'll be more than happy to answer to your questions in English if they should arise. So, uh, are we ready? No? Well, let's start then. Uh, basically, the experience of Chile, in a bit of a way, answers. Um, oh, sorry. I'm going to so, since we're waiting for the presentation, I'm going to change to Spanish. Um, buenas tardes a todas y todos. Good afternoon, everyone. I have the pleasure of offering the Chilean experience around the mobilization and the establishment of an intersectorial space that, for the first time in our history, has dealt with the issue of human mobility within the context of climate change and disasters. A fundamental element in order to review this step by step and to understand how we have reached uh, today's situation is that it responds to the so what question what is it, how is it that we can uh, make all these elements and progress that we're achieving in terms of information is reflected in public policy. Our starting point of this was developing our national policy for disaster reduction and the 2030-2030 plan. And there was a specific action, which was to identify the impact of climate change on human mobility. So as a result of that work, we published an intersectoral document in keeping with the international guidelines that would have been ratified by Chile. Now, this was also the result of international consensus, the development agendas, specifically the SDG 2030 agenda, as well as the Paris Agreement and uh, the Sendai 
framework for disaster risk reduction. Now on that, that backdrop, and in order to move forward this initiative, we created a human mobility climate change disaster panel back in 2020. And along the way, we have also received support from some international organizations that have been, I guess one could say, quite stimulating uh, at key points in time, specifically I'm referring to the platform for disaster-related displa displacement. This body was the key collaborator for drawing up national guidelines to this matter. And as a result of these efforts, this intersectoral endeavor, that is, we have set up a series of groups with a variety of different representations and offices, and uh, four key actors are involved. Of course, the National Disaster Prevention Office, the former ONEMI, now it's called Sena Press, and the Climate Change Division of the Ministry of the Environment, the Deputy Office of Disasters of the Foreign Affairs Office, and, and others. We also, so this is the core group, and then we have other sectors involved, for example, the production related ministries and the National Statistics Office as well. And of course, that those divisions are key. So there's that, and then we have also involved academia. And this has been quite productive, in fact, for drawing up a perspective and a vision regarding the path forward. Now, our national guidelines involve a review of the uh, key national services involved and agencies. Oh, wonderful. Presentation has been uploaded. Now, here we have the various sources that we use, international uh, commitments related to the 2030 agenda, uh, climate change documents, Paris Agreement, etc. other similar documents. And in the end, this is the overall content of our national guidelines. We have a great deal of evidence resulting from uh, international uh, research and other bodies. Now that's where a great deal of the uh, reference material comes from, but we have also found that our national sources have been quite fruitful. Now, basically we have defined three key challenges. Number one, well, this is, by the way, was a proactive effort. Chile has a forward-looking perspective, and we are working on preventing some issues. And uh, as a result, the first challenge was that we realized we did not have specific data related to human mobility. Well, not necessarily related to human mobility, but how climate change and disasters have an impact on that. We do not have data yet that allow us to be more specific and describe this phenomenon with specificity. Also, we do not have information exchange mechanisms related to uh, disaster-related displacement or climate change migration. There are also a variety of disparities regarding methodology. That's another issue that we have discovered and we need to go beyond a intersectoral or cross-sectoral approach. And then the second challenge is that we need to complete the national subnational interface. So the data and the way the issue is ma managed is one thing, but the shocks occur locally. So we need to address this interface to collect data. That's something that is to be addressed in the future. Challenge three is to consolidate further intersectoral actions. So we have come up with a list of enablers. 
to further study the phenomenon and to come up with solutions as well, given the lack of consolidated data or public policy. First of all, we have the intersectoral spaces or opportunities. Now, we have been quite fortunate that we have a national platform for disaster risk reduction, and this allowed us to pull together all the key players in one place and have enough players to uh, have a consolidated approach. And then we have public agencies that address this triad, disciplinary triad. For example, the Disaster Risk Reduction Agency, the Ministry of the Environment, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the National Migration Service. So human mobility, climate change adaptation, and disaster risk management. Also, we know that the uh, actors involved, the agencies are quite mature. Therefore, we were able to identify other key stakeholders, academia, for example, and we also received support by the PDD when necessary. So here we have some information with regard to the path forward. Planning for knowledge, that's key. With regard to defining national public policy and also in order to ensure that we have momentum for international cooperation, we need to define the research agenda for data purposes. We need to characterize the situation. Secondly, we need to go local, go back to the local realm. In Chile, we are consolidating, uh, making process on consolidating the information regarding uh, municipal level displacement. Now there's a challenge to find intermediate uh, scope tools as well. And at least this is on our agenda. And of course, we are looking into the opportunity of expanding this collaborative effort to academia, regional, university, academia. And then we have also collaborated closely with the IDMC and we aim to expand this partnership uh, beyond and include the PDD and others. We also realize that it's very helpful to use proven arrangements. For example, we have the disaster risk reduction platform in place, and that was key for bringing the key players to the table. Also, it's important to look forward, to look beyond the horizon. And in Chile, for example, we have the South American Conference for Migration, which has been helpful. And then also we have come up with multi-dimensional information opportunities, creating awareness. For example, here we have representatives from a variety of different sectors and different territorial levels. And if we do that, we can combine perspectives and we can make sure that each stake player uh, understands its role. Key conclusions. First of all, in, if we are going to start from zero, having a forward, to have a forward looking policy. It's important to define what your national level enablers are and manage these. And secondly, you need to come up with an intersectoral ecosystem, including the migration related bodies, disaster risk reduction, stakeholders, climate change adaptation, border control management, and statistics. That was very important for Chile. In Chile, the NSO has played a key role. And then thirdly, it's important to act locally to manage the phenomenon and the data. It's very important to make sure you have community level awareness and to work with bottom up dynamics. Our colleague from Dominica talked about this as well and collecting data specifically during migratory shocks and disasters takes place primarily in border regions. And so every stakeholder needs to know who to go to and what needs to be done to gather data. Those are vital opportunities and very beneficial down the line with regard to following up on the phenomenon. And also, fourthly, it's important to work across borders uh, to make sure that we cooperate in order to close the climate-related mobility 
data gap. There's a lot more to do going forward. So thank you for listening and I am available for your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Louise, I'll ask the panelists um, each a question, but do get ready here in the room. If you have any questions, I'll ask you open up. And, and thanks for that really interesting presentation on how you mapped you know, the different actors, enablers, different sources and frameworks at the national, international and local level. So we're starting going backwards starting with you, Louise. Um, you mentioned this national roundtable or intersectoral roundtable um, that gathers experts from multiple uh, government agencies to discuss climate and mobility issues. And what is the role of the national statistical office and um, other you know, data providers in this approach? We heard this morning, uh, just also for your information, the director of the National Statistical Office of uh, Chile, who was on the opening uh, panel, mentioned they also have an intersectoral uh, working group. So how, how does that work together? OK, thank you, Susanna. Um, I would say that, basically, the chance we have to have these different participants uh, and, and such a, a representation there sort of covers different roles. Um, the, the data, uh, first of all, we need to identify where to get it from. And, and in this case, I would say the sectoral representatives have been paramount in terms of getting to know what are the chances, what are the instruments that actually we can take hands of, uh, just for starters. Um, for example, the agricultural sector and the agricultural ministry does have a sort of a database, an important one, in terms of what are the uh, damage and losses. And of course, mobility has been uh, produced and generated because of the uh, hydrological deficit in the north of the country. So we have there uh, a study in terms of the effects of uh, different economical activities. We have discovered that in terms of how this phenomena unfolds, uh, first, and, and the, 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 the first indicator, we are having um, um, sort of a, a shock point at a certain point is when people start moving further or changing uh, activities. For example, in Chile, it's, it's quite usual that people abandoning agricultural sectors actually go for mining sectors. So having this sort of first approach in terms of economic activities and uh, loss and damages actually give us hints on where to look for. Um, it's also been happening with the fishery industry, particularly the small and medium fishery. Mm -hmm. We there have been even sort of with our colleagues from the uh, development ministry, uh, we have been able to uh, identify programs that actually are, are calling for transformation and adaptation for certain communities that have been involved for generations instead of just um, little uh, operations and of fishing and small sort of very traditional, you know, conclaves there that are actually dedicated for generations to that activity are transforming into tourism, for example. Mm -hmm. So having those hints, the having the National Statistic, Statistic Institute that actually is helping us develop or identify intermediate instruments. Mm -hmm. Our, of course, our goal is to uh, not only set sort of a framework of tasks, for example, for migration authorities or for adaptation plans, but to actually gather the data that enable us at a certain point to make the right questions in the national uh, population housing uh, census. Mm -hmm. But that's a long, long, long way to go. Uh, first of all, we have first uh, reached an, ag an agreement of description and gener the general um, sort of uh, conceptualization of the phenomena. Now we're going for the data or characterization of the phenomena. We are um, right now we're uh, going through uh, a consultant experience that is actually trying to gather the first evidence uh, on the ground uh, in terms of uh, what are the expellers, sort of the factors that motivate mobility, and what's happening and what's going on in terms of the uh, management of risk to those places where the people are actually getting to. So that's going to be a first uh, approach to actually refining the characterization of the phenomena here in Chile. And of course, the National Statistics Institute is actually accompanying this process. It's going to be, of course, qualitative in the beginning. But our hope is that in the end, 
it enables us to uh, reach opportunities and to identify um, quantitative data breaches to start on. We do have the evidence, having all the people at the table actually facilitates a lot and it and goes a long way in terms of having all the elements present, uh, but yet sort of our final advisor in this topic is of course mm, the National Statistic Office, but it also it's a great enabler to have all information providers at the same table. That's why I was so adamant about the importance of trying to ensure that when you're building, uh, particularly in this, in this topic, when you're building uh, policy from scratch, to have all the uh, stakeholders, particularly uh, the state stakeholders, in place. So that would be that. Thank you. Thanks a lot for sharing this really interesting example of um, bringing everyone, you know, different entities of the government together in a whole of government approach and in a very concrete, a good practice that others can get inspired from. And speaking of national statistical offices, um, Dwayne, uh, you know, we've noted during this session and others that um, uh, information on climate and mobility comes from different uh, sources and what do you see as the role of NSOs um, in compiling different data uh, and informing policy development? Thanks for the question. The um, central statistics offices um, should play a key role in the compilation of, of migration data. Um, one of the examples um, in Dominica, what we experienced was, I can only speak to the experience, that is the, the, the Hurricane Maria, where you had a massive exodus and there was no record the persons, little records, sorry, of persons left. So the CSO took it upon itself to, des to design a questionnaire and placed it on tablets and, and kept it away, I mean, reserved, sorry, reserved the tablets for an event, an event something like that happens. So we'll be training, we, we, because we took the, the pause on that, the, we'll be training the, um, enumerators and persons from different parts of the island to receive those tablets prior to a shock. You know, I mean, it's a hurricane, so we will have those things. So at least we'll be able to capture some information on the persons who are actually living. Now the CSO should also be a, the central, um, the, the central um, representative, repository, sorry, right? And the other, the other role the, the CSO should play I believe is the modernization of the, the cards, which I said earlier is kind of pricey to, to, to change, but using technology, we could use the, um, like everybody else, the mobile phones to capture that information and we can tweak the questionnaire to determine to, to suit the event. In the event we have, for example, the pandemic, persons who are coming in or persons who are leaving, we should be able to, administer questionnaires um, based on on the type of shop. Unlike the, the sort of static questionnaire, that is the, um, the ED cards from the migration, we could amend, we can create a more dynamic um, questionnaire. Um, yeah, but the CSO is, should take the leading role in, in, in compiling all the data um, for migration and guide the other departments. Okay. Thank you very much for that very interesting example of preparedness and how you can you know, support um, this data collection then the next time. And also how some of the challenges faced can make us more innovative in trying to find other ways you know, and, um, nowadays with phones, tablets, uh, and so on. Uh, maybe coming uh, to Paula, how can a country like Ecuador uh, benefit from using Earth observation or, or satellite uh, images in advancing disaster, disaster risk reduction for potentially affected uh, populations? And do you see some concrete opportunities around land planning, for instance? Um, okay. Uh, eh, bueno, para un país como 
a country such as Ecuador, it's very difficult to obtain financing to maintain a, an observation network. In other words, in many places, uh, we do not uh, cover the whole national territory and uh, we don't have um, surface data. In these cases, what is very useful is satellite information because we can uh, reach these uh, places, uh, undertake a correct uh, monitoring of those territories and uh, inform the population if something is going to happen uh, so, so that actions may be taken on the ground. One of the advantages of satellite information is that it is uh, its resolution is increasingly better and the greater the resolution of these images or of this information, uh, we are able to um, obtain better products, for example, global metal models that enable us uh, to have uh, more reliable forecasts. In other words, we can improve uh, the warnings that are issued uh, to the national risk management uh, system, for example. Um, a further use that we can make of satellite information is to compare or determine the areas uh, that are prone to disasters, uh, to landslides, uh, uh, drought areas, flood areas, and all this can help uh, those in charge of territorial planning uh, to prevent uh, human settlements from being established in those areas and thus prevent uh, disasters. A further example, in coastal areas, for example, we can uh, monitor satellite uh, data. Uh, we can relate this with uh, the um, data obtained from ocean uh, buoys and know in advance uh, whether what is being generated is a large-scale uh, climatic uh, phenomenon such as the El Nino phenomenon, which has a tremendous impact on the coastline of uh, the region. And if, uh, based on satellite information, we're able to see that there that matches atmospheric conditions, so we are then able to take uh, steps uh, to prevent the disasters uh, among the population. We can also determine areas uh, where there is no availability of water resources, uh, dry areas, uh, based on the type, composition, uh, and um, humidity or use of the soil, and uh, where there is absolutely no possibility of having uh, productive uh, means in place and so on. So those would be unsuitable um, areas for human settlement and not only in Ecuador but in the region as a whole. With this type of information we are able to assess atmospheric and ocean conditions when it comes to the occurrence of cyclones, hurricanes, for example in the Caribbean area which is um, very prone to suffering from this type of phenomena and thus we can prevent uh, major impacts before they occur. <laughs> Not talking to myself. Um, if uh, you were describing uh, the modeling, uh, which is really cutting edge um, and has been very influential in, in our thinking uh, about the potential future of climate mobilities um, and is being applied in multiple contexts, uh, what are the differences um, in different settings, such as maybe landlocked countries um, or small island developing states in Latin America? Caribbean and how does that influence the findings? And then maybe another question um, I was interested in, in, you mentioned you looked at distance and one challenge we have faced when doing a comparative, a comparative study on studying the impact of human mobility on adaptation to environmental changes was the distance. So as of when you know, do you consider someone to be displaced? Is the person, you know, can the person be displaced within the same city, for instance, or does the person need to uh, cross, you know, an administrative boundary. Um, so if you have any views on that, uh, Susana, please. The two questions are tremendously important when one is working with uh, models, and as I already mentioned, uh, the problems are not deterministic in nature, but uh, available. 
and as occurred with other cases of models so the data that one works with are fundamental and therefore the biggest difference that we have found between different places is uh, the availability of basic information this uh, basic information refers uh, not only to the information obtained from cli climate models which is important because there are different levels of uncertainties and different levels in different places and that has a tremendous impact on uh, the levels of uh, how reliable um, future projections may be, but also basic demographic information, basic socioeconomic information that is also included in the models. An important element for us, and which is closely related uh, to small uh, island uh, developing states, especially in the Caribbean, is that the initial model had a resolution of 14 kilometers, which means uh, that each one of the cells uh, that were used was 14 by 14 kilometers, uh, uh, which is a very coarse type of uh, um, um, scale for island states. The model used for Central America and for Mexico and for cities changed that because for cities it's also very big and used a model of one by one kilometers. But uh, for small uh, island developing states, uh, that uh, scale may be even uh, too large and thus in the next uh, six months, possibly, we will begin with a new um, version of the model focusing specifically on, uh, on the Caribbean islands with another way, a different approach using models, but somewhat different models, considering specific circumstances in the, the Caribbean islands also have other climate uh, risks that should be incorporated and that should not necessarily impact um, uh, agriculture and livestock uh, activities. Uh, so each place has its own specificities that need to be taken into consideration when it comes to modeling. And uh, this uh, specifically includes uh, confidence intervals uh, of uh, the final results. So what has happened is that when there is much uncertainty with initial models, the, the final model, that chart that was shown for Paraguay, for example, the central line and the confidence intervals are so wide ranging that the model ranges from zero to five million, for example. And so all that forms part of the assessment of models and of the final results. In terms of uh, distance, uh, well, that uh, uh, question often came to mind because at the end of the day, since we're working with rasters, uh, with grids, are uh, are beginning an endpoint ourselves and therefore when we change from a resolution of 14 to one kilometer we had to adjust the way in which we said well when is a person uh, truly moving when they go beyond a cell which is one by one kilometer or whether we have to use an additional definition because uh, uh, that may not be very significant. Uh, this is an artifact of the model, so to speak, if we use it in such a fashion. And when we work with cities, we began by experimenting with an intermediate measurement of uh, seven kilometers. However, it's important, as you say, especially when it comes to, to domestic uh, measurements, whether we're going to be um, dealing with uh, cities, districts, or municipalities, and in other areas, if we're going to talk about uh, international migration, for example, since we're working there with uh, maps, whether we're, if we're dealing with transporter issues uh, close to, uh, to international borders, or whether we're going to talk about the influence, uh, for example, of traveling from one specific country to another city, uh, another specific city. And this, of course, requires specific data, as was already mentioned. Thank you. I would like to open the floor if there's any questions here in the room. Yes, please, Coco. Thanks so much. This has been really interesting to listen in. And I'd be curious from the panel, if you had reflections, the human needs that you are helping to uncover with the statistics and data efforts, how could that inform efforts to finance action that would address those needs? Would it be a linear change, just more finance doing the same things? Would the data that you're supplying uh, provide some insights about changes in path in modalities of finance and maybe actually the things that might be done differently? 
and there are probably a bunch of things in, in between. But so the question is, you're tracking some changes in human needs. The climate is changing. That's a huge variable. And you're seeing some changes in human behavior through mobility data. What does that imply for what it takes to address those, those needs? Thanks. Thank you, Coco. Um, I can take one or two more questions. Uh, yes, please. Thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Elvino Nyantumbo from Mozambique National Institute of Statistics. In my opinion, when we want uh, to compare data, it is necessary to use the same spatial measure. If uh, the countries uh, in question have uh, your reference the data, they can use grid to make realistic comparisons. I wanted to hear uh, your comments about my opinion. Thank you for that question. And I had one last question from the floor, please. Sí, muchas gracias. Mi nombre es Miguel Corleto. Vengo de la Comisión Centroamericana de Estadística y tenía una pregunta bastante concreta, eh, particularmente en los casos de Ecuador y Chile. Eh, quisiera saber si en materia de reducción de riesgo de desastres, si no se ha evaluado la posibilidad de utilizar la cartografía digital del censo de población y vivienda, particularmente a nivel de segmento, ¿verdad? que me permite identificar en áreas trozos de territorio pequeñísimos eh, sobre las características de la población. Eh, esto con el propósito de evaluar el impacto que podrían tener los desastres naturales. Por ejemplo, se puede superponer la capa de información satelital de sequía, de inundaciones, terremotos, sobre la capa de población del censo de población y vivienda y tener pues estimados de qué impactos en términos de población habría. Este, por ejemplo, este, podemos saber el impacto potencial de desplazamiento de población que puede haber ante un desastre natural. Podemos también planificar la atención del desastre en términos de prestación de servicios de salud, de emergencia, etc. Eso eh, quisiera pues, saber si, si se ha desarrollado en algunos países, digamos, creo que no se explota, eh, no quiero decir que sea el caso de Ecuador y Chile, sino que, pero eh, al menos en la región, en el SICA, en el Sistema de Integración Centroamericana, pues creo que tenemos un eh, espacio para poder aprovechar la cartografía digital de vivienda con información satelital y poder pues prever eh, estimaciones de desplazamientos de población. Gracias. Thank you very much. Um, and we actually got some questions beforehand from those who are joining online. One is from um, Mr. Tarkbar from the Federal University of Kusau of Nigeria. And he's asking what the UN is doing to ensure that countries especially in Africa, have put in place laws and policies on environmentally induced displacement and what are measures towards mapping these laws with the aim of strengthening them and ensuring their work. And then there's another question from um, Mr. Mohamed, who's a statistician at the Migration Data Unit of Kapmas of Egypt. Um, and he's asking if there's any statistical survey measures um, Sorry, that if there's any statistical surveys that measure the impacts of climate change on migration, I think we already heard a bit um, in the session. So maybe I'll start with Susanna um, online. If you maybe want to get back to one of the questions, maybe from the uh, representative of the NSO of Mozambique on comparability and using the same spatial measure. Yeah, I wanted to be sure that I understood the question. The question is about using gridded data as a way of integrating data coming from many different sources. Is that correct? Okay. So would you like to clear, was that the question? So your question? <laughs> Did you understand the question correctly? Sorry. Yes, you did. Okay, uh, so yes, and actually that's the reason why we are using the, the, the 
in our in our model is is using gridded data. So the socioeconomic data, the population data is gridded, and the um, climate data, the impacts of climate change are also gridded data. So we are using that raster environment as a way of integrated data coming from many different sources. Um, and that's one of the intermediate is, is steps. Deciding in the size of the grid is also part of the decision making in order to make the model and not trivial because a lot of what you can see and particularly for the question before about mobility has to do with that. But yeah, we are using grid data for that. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, maybe Paula, would you like to answer any of the questions raised? Eh, sí, bueno, con respecto a la, a la pregunta de, del cruce de información, en el Ecuador es, sí se hace, se cruzan, por ejemplo, tenemos determinadas zonas donde, eh, bueno, determinadas las zonas por umbrales, por ejemplo, de eh, altas precipitaciones, nivel intermedio, nivel bajo, eso se cruza con información eh, de impacto, eh, de inundaciones o deslizamientos que ya... Eh, esa información tiene el Servicio Nacional de Gestión de Riesgos y Emergencias en el caso de Ecuador eh, y también se ha cruzado con eh, alguna, algún tipo de información poblacional. Sin embargo, en el Ecuador eh, desgraciadamente no tenemos información actualizada del censo, recién se está haciendo en el 2022, bueno, desde el 2022 hasta inicios del 2023, el, el último censo, y esa información sí te, deberá ser actualizada, pero sí, sí cruzamos información. De lo que tengo entendido, también ahora se están desarrollando o se pretende desarrollar algunos eh, proyectos eh, que relacionen los factores climáticos, meteorológicos, eh, con... Eh, con la migración, la movilidad humana. Eso se pretende hacer también en zonas de alta montaña y en zonas eh, costeras en el litoral del Ecuador. Thank you, Paula. Maybe Luis, if you can also, if you want that question, maybe the one on finance as well. I know you had some ideas. Um, quisiera responder a dos preguntas. Primero al colega también, ya que preguntó sobre el caso de Chile. En nuestro caso, sí, si tenemos ese tipo de cruces. Pero todavía en forma incipiente respecto de cómo se aplican estrictamente a, a, las, no, a las dinámicas de movilidad humana es más sencillo. Ahora, aquellas dinámicas particulares derivadas de los desastres y el cambio climático empieza a ponerse el tema un, po un poco más de, de, requirente de precisión. Tenemos, por supuesto, hay un instrumento que llevamos, nosotros lo llamamos el visor Chile preparado, en el cual tenemos mapeado por distintas amenazas prácticamente todo el territorio nacional. Tenemos además una metodología para identificar condiciones de vulnerabilidad en el territorio, pero lo que está en construcción, y eso viene a, parte de, a partir de nuestro nuevo ordenamiento legal, es que esa apreciación que ya tenemos respecto de los mapas de amenaza, esa apreciación que ya tenemos respecto de zonas de vulnerabilidad, poder generar ahora sí mapas de riesgo propiamente tal, con una metodología eh, unificada dentro de todos los organismos del Estado, y que además a partir de eso nos permitan llegar al mapa de impacto, es en ese punto donde vamos a poder efectivamente empezar ya a diferenciar eh, cuáles son las causalidades que están produciendo ahí, si hay causalidades mixtas, si, no, si es objeto de una política pública en lo particular o no. Por eso no, les hablaba de que en, en el caso de Chile estamos enfrentándolo de una manera prospectiva, precisamente adelantándonos a una variable que es creciente, que está siendo más ostensible, pero que cuando ya lleguemos ya a ese otro nivel, por decirlo así, a, a la tercera derivada, Vamos a requerir, como bien decía nuestra colega de la Universidad de Columbia, información particular y más específica para poder determinar una causalidad directa. Podemos tener una visión general respecto de hotspots y pretendemos llegar a eso, aspiramos a eso durante al menos en el curso del trabajo de la mesa durante los próximos años, pero sabemos que tenemos que ir quemando etapas de acuerdo a estas metodologías y al uso de estas herramientas. Que ahí vamos a llegar a puntos donde información más específica que nos permita precisar esa causalidad va a ser necesario. And for the other questions, for changes in human needs and what are detecting when we actually are looking for data and financing, and that's a great question, that's a sort of a tantrum and a dilemma, because uh, basically uh, what we watch when we're dealing with states' organization, governmental organization, are quite, uh, I would say, inertial, and they tend to be so. Um, 
the we hope and we aspire to actually get the practice of you know data based statistic based policy and um, but there are of course and, and in, in certain and such an uh, so a contingent topic particularly in in south america as migration itself actually trying to tell it apart in the case of climate migration from just um, uh, economically society politically induced migration is quite difficult mm -hmm. Uh, our hope and aim is to actually be able to do so on the basis of data, evidence, and statistics. Yet we do have the political component of all of these processes that actually are quite challenging. Mm -hmm. So will it be an enable? We hope so. Mm -hmm. Will it help us sort of unlock certain aspects of uh, uh, financial priorities from the government? Yes, we do. Can we actually ensure going to get there? We can ensure going to try, hmm? um, but of course, it, it's an effort that's, uh, of course, is worth carrying forward. And since we already have a mounted ecosystem of, of incumbent uh, institutions from society, from academia, from the government, uh, it certainly shares a, a quite a better probability of success than it did before. Hmm? And in terms of international you know, partnerships, well, we are sorting this purgatory of middle-income countries uh, that actually were not subjects of where well, there, there are resistances from governments to actually conduct particular or intermediate level studies and uh, data funding uh, because we're not subjects of corporations anymore. Mm -hmm. So we have found ourselves trying to uh, seek pathways for that, uh, facing, of course, natural inertia from governments and some limitations. Uh, and we hope that in the future, given the particular awareness that we are getting from uh, climate change adaptation efforts and the, the growing commitment from governments to actually take a hold on these issues as a, a, a sort of an ecosystem of problems, of troubles, that human mobility is taken into account, that the institution, institutionality we are building on actually is able to mobilize different sources of pressure, so to speak, in order to gain momentum uh, for specific finance. So I, I think at this point of our development, I, I, I would like to, to say it again, we are in a prospective approach here in Chile, but we hope this uh, consolidation of the effort actually may generate the momentum uh, for pressure for more financing in the future. Thank you, Luis. And maybe I'll take the questions that we got online uh, because i think it's also important when we talk about the environment and climate change uh, that it's great now that you know uh, we're all a lot more used to video conferencing and joining remotely and not everyone um having to travel so what is the UN doing um to support countries and, and mapping and and putting in place laws and policies IOM has an institutional strategy on migration uh, environment and climate change uh, that you know has this as a focus to support uh, countries since the question was about Africa, well, this panel is more about Latin America and the Caribbean, just to mention that um, IAM did provide support to the signature of the Kampala um, Ministerial Declaration on Migration and Environment and Climate Change. I think that was quite an important milestone um, and different national policies. Um, there's um, a report if you want to look into more details on IAM's contribution uh, and I am contributed to this report on human rights of IDPs, uh, their sectoral policies, such as disaster displacement planned uh, relocation. And there was also a mapping done here in the Americas in 2019. And now we're actually starting a new project next week um, where we're going to support uh, countries in Southern America and looking at the different data sources, uh, taking the example that Dwayne uh, presented for the Caribbean as a good practice and replicating that here uh, in the region. We very much look forward to working uh, with all of you. And in terms of the other question on are there any yeah statistical surveys that measure the impacts of climate change on migration, I think uh, Dwayne also um, touched upon that in, in his intervention. I don't know if you would like to make any final statement before we close the session. So, yes, the, my apologies, huh? my voice, the, this, the role of the CSO and the development of this, um, the, all the, the instruments and the, the dissemination. Um, for example, the, he asked a question about the use of vulnerability maps in the census. 
and the CSO in Dominica, um, because of our past experience or recent experience, there were the, um, vulnerability maps, administrative maps that were done for every, for at least the, I think the volcanoes, the hurricane, not hurricane, um, and the earthquakes based on the types of soil that is that was that was developed and the CSO basically they are just waiting for the census data to overlay that so we'll be able to at least produce some information on the number of persons who are at risk based um, on the type of um, environmental issue okay but all in all um, it was it was good <laughs> here today <laughs> and all of this thank you very much and maybe just to recap a few key points that came out of this very interesting session um, I found was the you know need to map the different actors, uh, the different sources, the different frameworks available at the different uh, levels, local, national, international, um, looking at uh, existing tools. Uh, we have some tools that, for instance, Susanna presented on modeling to, you know, be better prepared and not be you know just overwhelmed and just be reactive each time there is another uh, disaster there's other tools we've heard censuses uh, surveys immigration forms but also other um, disaster environmental climate change uh, forms that can be used um, you know every challenge also has a, a chance in it we saw there's some opportunities of also using uh, data sources like satellite images and uh, you know georeferencing um to yeah be you know have a better coverage in areas uh, in in countries that don't maybe have a, a field presence um really help disaster risk uh, reduction uh looking at a whole of government approach really this intersectoral uh, looking at other actors beyond uh, statistics offices, we heard about migration authorities, environment, climate change, disaster risk reduction actors. There's uh, a lot, um, you know, and this can can really help uh, to uh, yeah base the policy responses uh, on evidence, and also uh, looking at the role, of course, not to forget the role of the national statistical offices um, in mapping sources, supporting these. Uh, intersectoral or interministerial and you know approaches uh, but also in preparedness um, so there's a lot of potential um, and I would like to to thank everyone for being here in the room uh, and also online thank you for joining um, it may be very late in, in some parts of the world from where you may be joining and uh, with that I would like to thank the panelists and the interpreters I know we want to uh, stop on time many thanks uh, to you for making uh, you know all this intercultural communication possible thank you very much okay.